Aftermath by Peter Robinson Read by Simon Slater Prologue They locked her in the cage when she started to bleed. Tom was already there. He had been there for three days and had stopped crying now. He was still shivering, though. It was February. There was no heat in the cellar, and both of them were naked. There would be no food either, she knew, not for a long time. Not until she got so hungry that she felt as if she were being eaten from the inside. It wasn't the first time she'd been locked in the cage, but this time was different from the others. Before, it had always been because she'd done something wrong or hadn't done what they wanted her to do. This time it was different. It was because of what she had become and she was really scared. As soon as they had shut the door at the top of the stairs, the darkness wrapped itself around her like fur. She could feel it rubbing against her skin, the way a cat rubs against your legs. She began to shiver. More than anything, she hated the cage. More than the blows. More than the humiliations. But she wouldn't cry. She never cried. She didn't know how. The smell was terrible. They didn't have a toilet to go to, only the bucket in the corner, which they would only be allowed to empty when they were let out. And who knew when that would be? But worse even than the smell were the little scratching sounds that started when she had been locked up only a few minutes. Soon she knew it would come, the tickle of sharp little feet across her legs or her stomach, if she dare lie down. The first time, she had tried to keep moving and making noise all the time to keep them away. But in the end, she had become exhausted and fallen asleep, not caring how many there were or what they did. She could tell in the dark, by the way they moved and their weight, whether they were rats or mice. The rats were the worst. One had even bitten her once. She held Tom and tried to comfort him, making them both a little warmer. If truth be told, she could have done with some comforting herself, but there was nobody to comfort her. Mice scuttled across her feet. Occasionally she kicked out and heard one squeak as it hit the wall. She could hear music from upstairs, loud, with the bass making the bars of the cage rattle. She closed her eyes and tried to find a beautiful retreat deep inside her mind, a place where everything was warm and golden and the sea that washed up on the sands was deep blue, the water warm, and lovely as sunlight when she jumped in. But she couldn't find it. Couldn't find that sandy beach and blue sea, that garden full of bright flowers or that cool green forest in summer. When she closed her eyes, all she could find was darkness shot with red, distant mutterings, cries, and an appalling sense of dread. She drifted in and out of sleep, becoming oblivious to the mice and rats. She didn't know how long she'd been there before she heard noises upstairs. Different noises. The music had ended a long time ago, and everything was silent apart from the scratching and Tom's breathing. She thought she heard a car pull up outside. Voices. Another car. Then she heard someone walking across the floor upstairs. A curse. Suddenly all hell broke loose upstairs. It sounded as if someone's battering at the door with a tree trunk. Then came a crunching sound, followed by a loud bang as the front door caved in. Tom was awake now, whimpering in her arms. She heard shouting, and what sounded like dozens of pairs of feet running around upstairs. After what seemed like an eternity, she heard someone prize open the lock to the cellar door. A little light spilled in, but not much, and there wasn't a bulb down there. More voices. Then came the lances of bright torchlight, coming closer. So close they hurt her eyes, and she had to shield them with her hand. Then the beam held her, and a strange voice cried, Oh God! Oh my God! Chapter 1 
Maggie Forrest wasn't sleeping well. So it didn't surprise her when the voices woke her shortly before four o'clock one morning in early May. Even though she had made sure before she went to bed that all the windows in the house were shut fast. If it hadn't been the voices, it would have been something else, a car door slamming, as someone set off for an early shift. The first train rattling across the bridge, the neighbour's dog, old wood creaking somewhere in the house, the fridge clicking on and off, a pan or a glass shifting on the draining board. Or perhaps one of the noises of the night, the kind that made her wake in a cold sweat with a thudding heart and gasp for breath as if she were drowning, not sleeping. The man she called Mr. Bones clicking up and down the hill with his cane, the scratching at the front door, the tortured child screaming in the distance. Or a nightmare. She was just too jumpy these days, she told herself, trying to laugh it off. But there they were again, definitely voices, one loud and masculine. Maggie got out of bed and padded over to the window. The street called The Hill ran up the northern slope of the broad valley, and where Maggie lived, about halfway up, just above the railway bridge, the houses on the eastern side of the street stood atop a twenty-foot rise that sloped down to the pavement in a profusion of shrubs and small trees. Sometimes the undergrowth and foliage seemed so thick she could hardly find her way along the path to the pavement. Maggie's bedroom window looked over the houses on the western side of the hill and beyond a patchwork landscape of housing estates, arterial roads, warehouses, factory chimneys and fields stretching through Bradford and Halifax all the way to the Pennines. Some days, Maggie would sit for hours and look at the view, thinking about the odd chain of events that had brought her here. Now, though, in the pre-dawn light, the distant necklaces and clusters of amber street lights took on a ghostly aspect, as if the city weren't quite real yet. Maggie stood at her window and looked across the street. She could swear there was a hall light on directly opposite, in Lucy's house. And when she heard the voice again, she suddenly felt all her premonitions had been true. It was Terry's voice, and he was shouting at Lucy. She couldn't hear what he was saying. Then she heard a scream, the sound of glass breaking and a thud. Lucy. Maggie dragged herself out of her paralysis, and with trembling hands she picked up the bedside telephone and dialed 999. Probationary Police Constable Janet Taylor stood by her patrol car and watched the silver BMW burn, shielding her eyes from its glare standing upwind of the foul-smelling smoke. Her partner, P.C. Dennis Morrissey, stood beside her. One or two spectators were peeping out of their bedroom windows, but nobody else seemed very interested. Burning cars weren't exactly a novelty on this estate, even at four o'clock in the morning. Orange and red flames, with deep inner hues of blue and green, and occasional tentacles of violet, twisted into the darkness sending up pools of thick black smoke. Even upwind, Janet could smell the burning rubber and plastic. It was giving her a headache, and she knew her uniform and her hair would reek of it for days. The leading firefighter, Gary Cullen, walked over to join them. It was Dennis he spoke to, of course. He always did. They were mates. What do you think? Joy riders. Dennis nodded towards the car. We checked the number plate. Stolen from a nice middle-class residential street in Heaton Moor, Manchester, early this evening. Why here, then? Dunno. Could be a connection, a grudge or something. Someone giving a little demonstration of his feelings, drugs even. But that's for the lads upstairs to work out. They're the ones paid to have brains. We're done for now. Everything's safe. Under control. What if there's a body in the boot? Dennis laughed. It'll be well done by now, won't it? Hang on a minute, that's our radio, isn't it? Janet walked over to the car. I'll get it, she said over her shoulder. Control to 354, come in please, 354, over. Janet picked up the radio. 354 to control, over. 
Domestic dispute reported taking place at number 35, The Hill. Repeat, 35, The Hill. Can you respond? Over. Christ, thought Janet, a bloody domestic. No copper in her right mind like domestics, especially at this time in the morning. We'll do, she sighed, looking at her watch. ETA, three minutes. She called over to Dennis, who held up his hand and spoke a few more words to Gary Cullen before responding. They were both laughing when Dennis returned to the car. Tell him that joke, did you? Janet asked, settling behind the wheel. Which one's that? Dennis asked, all innocent. Janet started the car and sped to the main road. You know, the one about the blonde giving her first blow job. I don't know what you're talking about. Only I heard you telling it to that new PC back at the station. The lad who hasn't started shaving yet. You ought to give the poor lad a chance to make his own mind up about women, Den, instead of poisoning right off the bat. The centrifugal force almost threw them off the road, as Janet took the roundabout at the top of the hill too fast. Dennis grasped the dashboard and hung on for dear life. Jesus Christ, women drivers! It's only a joke. Have you got no sense of humour? Janet smiled to herself as she slowed and curb crawled down the hill, looking for number 35. Anyway, I'm getting sick of this, Dennis said. Sick of what? My driving? That too. Mostly, though. It's your constant bitching. It's got so a bloke can't say what's on his mind these days. Not if he's got a mind like a sewer. That's pollution. Anyway, it's changing times, then, and we have to change with them, or we'll end up like the dinosaurs. By the way, about that mole. What mole? You know, the one on your cheek, next to your nose, the one with all the hairs growing out of it. Dennis put his hand up to his cheek. What about it? I'd get it seen too quick if I were you. It looks cancerous to me. Ah, number 35, here we are. She pulled over to the right side of the road and came to halt a few yards past the house. It was a small detached residence, built of red brick and sandstone, between a plot of allotments and a row of shops. It wasn't much bigger than a cottage, with a slate roof, low-walled garden, and a modern garage attached at the right. At the moment, all was quiet. There's a light on in the hall, Janet said. Shall we have a deco? Still fingering his mole, Dennis sighed and muttered something she took to be a scent. Janet got out of the car first and walked up the path, aware of him dragging his feet behind her. The garden was overgrown, and she had to push twigs and shrubbery aside as she walked. A little adrenaline had leaked into her system, put her on super alert, as it always did with domestics. The reason most cops hated them was that you never knew what was going to happen. As likely as not, you'd pull the husband off the wife, and then the wife would take his side and start bashing you with a rolling pin. Janet paused by the door. All quiet, apart from Dennis's stertorous breathing behind her. It was too early yet for people to be going to work, and most of the late-night revellers had passed out by now. Somewhere in the distance the first birds began to chatter. Sparrows, most likely, Janet thought. Mice with wings. Seeing no doorbell, Janet knocked on the door. No response came from inside. She knocked harder. The hammering seemed to echo up and down the street. Still no response. Next, Janet went down on her knees and looked through the letterbox. She could just make out a figure sprawled on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. A woman's figure. That was probably cause enough for forced entry. Let's go in, she said. Dennis tried the handle, locked. Then, gesturing for Janet to stand out of the way, he charged the door with his shoulder. Poor technique, she thought. She'd have reared back and used her foot. But Dennis was a second-row rugby forward, she reminded herself, and his shoulders had been pushed up against so many arseholes in their time that they had to be strong. The door crashed open on first contact, and Dennis cannonballed into the hallway grabbing hold of the bottom of the banister to stop himself from tripping over the still figure that lay there. Janet was right behind him, but she had the advantage of walking in at a more dignified pace. 
She closed the door as best she could, knelt beside the woman on the floor and felt for a pulse, weak but steady. One side of her face was bathed in blood. My God, Janet muttered. Den, are you okay? Fine, take care of her. I'll have a look around. Denny's headed upstairs. For once, Janet didn't mind being told what to do. Nor did she mind that Dennis automatically assumed it was a woman's work to tend to the injured, while the man went in search of heroic glory. Well, she minded, but she felt a real concern for the victim here, so she didn't want to make an issue of it. Bastard, she thought. Whoever did this. It's okay, love, she said even though she suspected the woman couldn't hear her. We'll get you an ambulance. Just hold on. Most of the blood seemed to be coming from one deep cut, just above her left ear, Janet noticed, though there was also a little smeared around the nose and lips. Punches by the looks of it. There were also broken glass and daffodils scattered all around her, along with a damp patch on the carpet. Janet took her personal radio from her belt hook and called for an ambulance. She was lucky it worked on the hill. Personal UHF radios had much less range than the VHF models fitted in cars, and were notoriously subject to black spots of patchy reception. Dennis came downstairs, shaking his head. Buster's not hiding up there, he said. He handed Janet a blanket, pillow and towel, nodding to the woman. For her... Janet eased the pillow under the woman's head, covered her gently with the blanket, and applied the towel to the seeping wound on her temple. Well, I never, she thought, full of surprises, our den. Think he's done a runner? she asked. Dunno. I'll have a look in the back. You stay with her till the ambulance arrives. Before Janet could say anything, Dennis headed off towards the back of the house. He hadn't been gone more than a minute or so when she heard him call out, Janet, come here, and have a look at this. Hurry up, it could be important. Curious, Janet looked at the injured woman. The bleeding had stopped and there was nothing else she could do. Even so, she was reluctant to leave the poor woman alone. Come on, Dennis called again. Hurry up. Janet took one last look at the prone figure and walked towards the back of the house. The kitchen was in darkness. Down here. She couldn't see Dennis, but she knew that his voice came from downstairs. Through an open door to her right, three steps led down to a landing lit by a bare bulb. There was another door, most likely to the garage, she thought, and around the corner were the steps down to the cellar. Dennis was standing there near the bottom, in front of a third door. On it was pinned a poster of a naked woman. She lay back on a brass bed with her legs wide open, fingers tugging at the edges of her vagina, smiling down over her large breasts at the viewer, inviting, beckoning him inside. Dennis stood before it, grinning. Bastard, Janet hissed. Where's your sense of humour? It's not funny. What do you think it means? I don't know. Janet could see light under the door, faint and flickering as if from a faulty bulb. She also noticed the peculiar odour. What's that smell? she asked. How should I know? Rising damp? Drains? But it smelled like decay to Janet. Decay and sandalwood incense. She gave a little shudder. Shall we go in? She was whispering without knowing why. I think we'd better. Janet walked ahead of him, almost on tiptoe down the final few steps. The adrenaline was really pumping in her veins now. Slowly, she reached out and tried the door, locked. She moved aside, and Dennis used his foot this time. The lock splintered, and the door swung open. Dennis stood aside, bowed from the waist in a parody of gentlemanly curtsy, and said, Ladies first. With Dennis only inches behind her, Janet stepped into the cellar. She barely had time to register her first impressions of the small room, mirrors, dozens of lit candles surrounding a mattress on the floor, a girl on the mattress, naked and bound, something yellow around her neck, the terrible smell stronger, despite the incense, 
like blocked drains and rotten meat, crude charcoal drawings on the whitewashed walls, before it happened. He came from somewhere behind them, from one of the cellar's dark corners. Dennis turned to meet him, reaching for his baton, but he was too slow. The machete slashed first across his cheek, slicing it open from the eye to the lips. Before Dennis had time to put his hand up to staunch the blood or register the pain, the man slashed again, this time across the side of his throat. Dennis made a gurgling sound and went to his knees, eyes wide open. Warm blood gushed across Janet's face and sprayed onto the whitewashed walls in swirling abstract patterns. The hot stink of it made her gag. She had no time to think. You never did when it really happened. All she knew was that she couldn't do anything for Dennis, not yet. There was still the man with the knife to deal with. Hang on, Dennis, she pleaded silently. Hang on. The man still seemed intent on hacking at Dennis. Not finished yet. And that gave Janet enough time to slip out her side-handled baton. She had just managed to grip the handle, so that the baton ran protectively along the outside of her arm when he made his first lunge at her. He seemed shocked and surprised when his blade didn't sink into flesh and bone, but was instead deflected by the hard baton. That gave Janet the opening she needed. Bugger technique and training. She swung out and caught him on the temple. His eyes rolled back and he slumped against the wall. But he didn't go down. She moved in closer and cracked down on the wrist of his knife hand. She heard something break. He cried out and the machete fell to the floor. Janet kicked it away into a far corner. Then she took the fully extended bat on with both hands, swung, and caught him on the side of the head again. He tried to go after his machete, but she hit him again, as hard as she could on the back of his head, and then again on his cheek, and once more at the base of his skull. He reared up, still on his knees, spouting obscenities at her and she lashed out one more time, cracking his temple. He fell against the wall, where the back of his head left a long dark smear on the white watch as he slid down, and rested there, legs extended. Pink foam bubbled at the side of his mouth, then stopped. Janet hit him once more, a two-handed blow on the top of his skull. Then she took out her handcuffs and secured him to one of the pipes running along the bottom of the wall. He groaned and stirred, so she hit him again. When he fell silent, she went over to Dennis. He was still twitching, but the spurts of blood from his wound were getting weaker. Janet struggled to remember her first aid training. She made a compress from her handkerchief and pressed it tight against the severed artery, trying to nip the ends together. Next she tried to make the 10-9 call on her personal radio. Officer in urgent need of assistance, but it was no good. All she got was static, a black spot. Nothing to do now but sit and wait for the ambulance to arrive. She could hardly move, go outside, not with Dennis like this. She couldn't leave him. So Janet sat cross-legged and rested Dennis's head on her lap, cradling him and muttering nonsense in his ear. The ambulance would come soon, she told him. He would be fine, just wait and see. But it seemed that no matter how tightly she held the compress, blood leaked through to her uniform. She could feel its warmth on her fingers, her belly and thighs. Please, Dennis, she prayed. Please, hang on. Above Lucy's house, Maggie could see the crescent sliver of a new moon and the faint silver thread it drew around the old moon's darkness. The old moon in the new moon's arms. An ill omen. Sailors believe that the sight of it, especially through glass, presaged the storm and much loss of life. Maggie shivered. She wasn't superstitious, but there was something chilling about the sight, something that reached out and touched her from way back in time, when people paid more attention to cosmic events such as the cycles of the moon. She looked back at the house and saw the police car arrive, heard the woman officer knock and call out, then saw her male partner charge the door. After that, Maggie heard nothing for a while, perhaps five or ten minutes, 
until she fancied she heard a heart-rending keening wail from deep inside the bowels of the house. But it could have been her imagination. The sky was a lighter blue now, and the dawn chorus had struck up. Maybe it was a bird. But she knew that no bird sounded so desolate or godforsaken as that cry. Not even the loon on a lake or the curlew up on the moors. Maggie rubbed the back of her neck and kept watching. Seconds later, an ambulance pulled up. Then another police car, then paramedics. The ambulance attendants left the front door open, and Maggie could see them kneeling by someone in the hall, someone covered with a fawn blanket. They lifted the figure onto a wheeled stretcher and pushed her down the path to the ambulance, back doors open and waiting. It all happened so quickly that Maggie couldn't see clearly who it was, but she thought she glimpsed Lucy's jet-black hair spread out against the white pillow. So it was as she had thought. She gnawed at her thumbnail. Should she have done something sooner? She had certainly had her suspicions, but could she somehow have prevented this? What could she have done? Next to arrive looked like a plain-clothes police officer. He was soon followed by five or six men, who put on disposable white overalls before they went inside the house. Someone also put up white and blue tape across the front gate and blocked off a long stretch of the pavement, including the nearest bus stop and the entire side of the road number 35 stood on, reducing the hill to one lane of traffic in order to make room for police vehicles and ambulances. Maggie wondered what was going on. Surely they wouldn't go to all this trouble unless it was something really serious. Was Lucy dead? Had Terry finally killed her? Perhaps that was it. That would make them pay attention. As daylight grew, the scene became even stranger. More police cars arrived, and another ambulance. As the attendants wheeled a second stretcher out, the first morning bus went down the hill and obscured Maggie's view. She could see the passengers turn their heads, the ones on her side of the road standing up to get a look at what was happening, but she couldn't see who lay on the stretcher. Only that two policemen got in after it. Next, a hunched figure, shrouded in a blanket, stumbled down the path, supported on each side by uniformed policemen. At first Maggie had no idea who it was, a woman, she thought, from her general outline and the cut of her dark hair. Then she thought she glimpsed the dark blue uniform. The policewoman. Breath caught in her throat. What could have happened to change her so much so fast? By now, there was far more activity than Maggie had ever thought the scene of a domestic argument could engender. At least half a dozen police cars had arrived, some of them unmarked. A wiry man with close-cropped dark hair got out of a blue Renault and walked into the house as if he owned the place. Another man who went in looked like a doctor. At least he carried a black bag and had that self-important air about him. People up and down the hill were going to work now, driving their cars out of their garages or waiting for the bus at the temporary bus stop someone from the depot had put up. Little knots of them gathered by the house, watching, but the police came over and moved them on. Maggie looked at her watch. Half past six. She had been kneeling at the window for two and a half hours, yet she felt as if she had been watching a quick succession of events, as if it had been done by time-lapse photography. When she got to her feet, she heard her knees crack, and the broad loom carpet had made deep red crisscross marks on her skin. There was far less activity outside the house now, just the police guards and the detectives coming and going standing on the pavement to smoke, shake their heads and talk in low voices. The group of haphazardly parked cars outside Lucy's house were causing traffic backups. Weary and confused, Maggie threw on jeans and a T-shirt and went downstairs to make a cup of tea and some toast. As she filled the kettle, she noticed that her hand was shaking. They would want to talk to her, no doubt about that. And when they did, what would she tell them?
Chapter 2 Acting Detective Superintendent Alan Banks Acting, because his immediate boss, Detective Superintendent Gristhorpe, had shattered his ankle while working on his dry stone wall and would be off work for at least a couple of months. Signed the first officer's log at the gate, took a deep breath and walked into 35 the hill, shortly after six o'clock that morning. Householders Lucy Payne, aged 22, loans officer at the local Nat West up near the shopping precinct, and her husband, Terence Payne, aged 28, school teacher at Silver Hill Comprehensive. No kids, no criminal record. To all intents and purposes, an idyllic successful young couple, married just one year. All the lights were on in the house, and the sockers were already at work, dressed as Banks was, in the obligatory white sterile overalls, over shoes, gloves and hoods. They looked like some sort of phantom house-cleaning crew, Banks thought, dusting, vacuuming, scraping up samples, packaging, labelling. Banks paused a moment in the hall to get the feel of the place. It seemed an ordinary enough middle-class home. The ribbed coral pink wallpaper looked new. Carpeted stairs to the right led up to the bedrooms. If anything, the place smelled a bit too much of lemon air freshener. The only thing that seemed out of place was the rust-coloured stain on the cream hall carpet. Lucy Payne, currently under observation by both doctors and police in Leeds General Infirmary, just down the corridor from where her husband, Terence Payne, was fighting for his life. Banks hadn't a lot of sympathy to spare for him. P.C. Dennis Morrissey had lost his struggle for life far more quickly. And there was a dead girl in the cellar, too. Most of this information Banks had got from Detective Chief Inspector Ken Blackstone over his mobile on the way to Leeds, the rest from talking to the paramedics and the ambulance crew outside. The first phone call to his Gratley cottage, the one that woke him from the shallow, troubled and restless sleep that seemed to be his lot these days, had come shortly after half-past four, and he had showered, thrown on some clothes and jumped in his car. A CD of Zelenka trios had helped him keep calm on the way, and discouraged him from taking outrageous risks with his driving on the A1. All in all, the eighty-mile drive had taken him about an hour and a half, and if he hadn't had too many other things on his mind during the first part of his journey, he might have admired the coming of a beautiful May dawn over the Yorkshire Dales. Rare enough so far that spring. As it was, he saw little but the road ahead and barely even heard the music. By the time he got to the Leeds Ring Road, the Monday morning rush hour was already underway. Circumventing the blood stains and daffodils on the hall carpet, Banks walked to the back of the house. He noticed someone had been sick in the kitchen sink. One of the ambulance crew, said the socko, busy going through the drawers and cupboards. First time out, poor sod. We're lucky he made it back up here and didn't puke all over the scene. Christ, what did he have for breakfast? Looks like Thai red curry and chips to me. Banks took the stairs down to the cellar. On his way, he noted the door to the garage. Very handy if he wanted to bring someone into the house without being seen. Someone you had abducted, perhaps drugged or knocked unconscious. Banks opened the door and had a quick glance at the car. It was a dark four-door Vectra with an S registration. The last three letters were NGV, not local. He made a note to have someone run it through the DVLA at Swansea. He could hear voices down in the cellar, see cameras flashing. That would be Luke Selkirk, their hotshot crime scene photographer, fresh from his army-sponsored training course up at Catterick Camp, where he had been learning how to photograph scenes of terrorist bombings. Not that his special skill would be needed today, but it was good to know you were working with a highly trained professional, one of the best. The stone steps were worn in places. The walls were whitewashed brick. Someone had put more white and blue tape across the open door at the bottom. An inner crime scene. 
Nobody would get beyond that until Banks, Luke, the Doctor and the Sockers had done their jobs. Banks paused at the threshold and sniffed. The smell was bad. Decomposition, mould, incense, and the sweet metallic whiff of fresh blood. He ducked under the tape and walked inside, and the horror of the scene hit him with such force that he staggered back a couple of inches. It wasn't that he hadn't seen worse. He had. Much worse. The disemboweled Soho prostitute, Dawn Wadden, a decapitated petty thief called William Grant, the half-eaten body parts of a young barmaid called Colleen Dickens, bodies shredded by shotgun blasts and slit open by knives. He remembered all their names. But that wasn't the point he had come to learn over the years. It wasn't a matter of blood and guts, of intestines poking out of the stomach, of missing limbs or of deep gashes flapping open in an obscene parody of mouths. That wasn't what really got you when it came right down to it. That was just the outward aspect. You could, if you tried hard, convince yourself that a crime scene like this one was a movie set or a theatre during rehearsals, and that the bodies were merely props, the blood fake. No, what got to him most of all was the pity of it all. The deep empathy he had come to feel with the victims of crimes he investigated. And he hadn't become more callous, more inured to it all over the years as many did, as he had once thought he would. Each new one was like a raw wound reopening, especially something like this. He could keep it all in check, keep the bile down in his rumbling gut and do his job. But it ate away at him from the inside like acid and kept him awake at night. Pain and fear and despair permeated these walls, like the factory grind that had crusted the old city buildings. Only this kind of horror couldn't be sandblasted away. Seven people in the cramped cellar, five of them alive and two dead. This was going to be a logistical and forensic nightmare. Someone had turned an overhead light on, just a bare bulb, but candles still flickered all over the place. From the doorway, Banks could see the doctor bent over the pale body on the mattress. A girl. The only outward signs of violence were a few cuts and bruises, a bloody nose, and a length of yellow plastic clothesline around her neck. She lay spread-eagled on the soiled mattress, her hands tied with the same yellow plastic line to metal pegs set in the concrete floor. Blood from P.C. Morris's severed artery had sprayed across her ankles and shins. Some flies had managed to get in the cellar, and three of them were buzzing around the blood clotted under her nose. There seemed to be some sort of rash or blistering around her mouth. Her face was pale and bluish in death, the rest of her body white under the bulb's glare. What made it all so much worse? were the large mirrors on the ceiling and two of the walls that multiplied the scene like a funfair trick. Who turned the overhead light on? Banks asked. Ambulance men, said Luke Selkirk. They were first on the scene after PC's Taylor and Morrissey. Okay. We'll leave it on for the time being, get a better idea of what we're dealing with. But I want the original scene photographed too, later. Just the candlelight. Luke nodded. By the way, this is Faye McTavish, my new assistant. Faye was a slight, pale, waif-like woman, early twenties perhaps, a stud through her nostril, and almost no hips at all. The heavy old pentax she had slung around her neck looked too big for her to hold steady, but she managed it well enough. Pleased to meet you, Faye, said Banks, shaking hands. Only wish it could be in better circumstances. Me too. Banks turned to the body on the mattress. He knew who she was. Kimberly Myers, aged fifteen, missing since Friday night, when she had failed to return from a school dance only a quarter of a mile from her home. She had been a pretty girl, with the characteristic long blonde hair and slim athletic figure of all the victims. Now her dead eyes stared up at the mirror on the ceiling, as if looking for answers to her suffering. 
Dried semen glistened on her pubic hair, and blood. Semen and blood, the old, old story. Why was it always the pretty young girls these monsters took? Banks asked himself for the hundredth time. Oh, he knew all the pat answers. He knew that women and children made easier victims, because they were physically weaker, more easily cowed and subdued by male strength, just as he knew that prostitutes and runaways made easier victims too, because they were less likely to be missed than someone from a nice home, like Kimberly. But it was much more than that. There was always a deep, dark sexual aspect to these sorts of things. And to be the right kind of object for whoever had done this, the victim needed not only to be weaker, but needed breasts and a vagina too, available for her tormentor's pleasure and ultimate desecration. And perhaps some aura of youth and innocence. It was the spoliation of innocence. Men killed other men for many reasons, by the thousands in wartime, but in crimes like this, the victim always had to be a woman. The first officer on the scene had had the foresight to mark out a narrow pathway on the floor with tape, so that people wouldn't walk all over the place and destroy evidence. But after what had happened with P.C. Morrissey and Taylor, it was probably too late for that anyway. P.C. Dennis Morrissey lay curled on his side in a pool of blood on the concrete floor. His blood had also sprayed over part of the wall and one of the mirrors, rivalling in its pattern anything Jackson Pollock had ever painted. The rest of the whitewashed walls were covered with either pornographic images ripped from magazines or childish obscene stick figures of men with enormous phalluses, like the Cairn Giant drawn in coloured chalk. Mixed in with these were a number of crudely drawn occult symbols and grinning skulls. There was another pool of blood by the wall next to the door, and a long dark smear on the whitewash. Terence Payne. Luke Selkirk's camera flashed and snapped Banks out of his trance-like state. Faye was wielding her camcorder now. The other man in the room turned and spoke for the first time. Detective Chief Inspector Ken Blackstone of the West Yorkshire Police, looking immaculate as ever, even in his protective clothing. Grey hair curled over his ears, and his wire-rimmed glasses magnified his sharp eyes. Alan, he said in a voice like a sigh. Like a fucking abattoir, isn't it? A fine start to the week. When did you get here? 4.44. Blackstone lived out Lawnswood Way, and it wouldn't have taken him more than half an hour to get to the hill, if that. Banks, heading the North Yorkshire team, was glad that Blackstone was running West Yorkshire's part of their joint operation, dubbed the Chameleon Squad, because the killer thus far had managed to adapt, blend into the night, and go unnoticed. Often, working together involved ego problems and incompatible personalities. But Banks and Blackstone had known each other for eight or nine years and had always worked well together. They got on socially, too, with a mutual fondness for pubs, Indian food, and female jazz singers. Have you talked to the paramedics? Banks asked. Yes, said Blackstone. They say they checked the girl for signs of life and found none. So they left her undisturbed. P.C. Morrissey was dead, too. Terence Payne was handcuffed to the pipe over there. His head was badly beaten, but he was still breathing, so they carted him off to Hospital Sharpish. There's been some contamination of the scene, mostly to the position of Morris's body. But it's minimal, given the unusual circumstances. Trouble is, Ken, we've got two crime scenes overlapping here. Maybe three, if you count what happened to Payne. He paused. Four if you count Lucy Payne upstairs. That'll cause problems. Where's Stefan? Detective Sergeant Stefan Novak was their crime scene coordinator, new to the Western Division HQ in Eastvale, and brought into the team by Banks, who had been quickly impressed by his abilities. Banks didn't envy Stefan his job right now. Around somewhere, said Blackstone. 
Last time I saw him, he was heading upstairs. Anything more you can tell me, Ken? Not much, really. That'll have to wait until we can talk to P.C. Taylor in more detail. When might that be? Later today. The paramedics took her off. She's being treated for shock. I'm not bloody surprised. Have they... Yes. They've bagged her clothes and the police surgeon's been to the hospital to do the necessary. Which meant taking fingernail scrapings and swabs from her hands, among other things. One thing it was easy to forget, and a thing everyone might want to forget, was that, for the moment, probationary PC Janet Taylor wasn't a hero. She was a suspect in a case of excessive use of force. Very nasty indeed. How does it look to you, Ken? Banks asked. Gut feeling? As if they surprised Payne down here, cornered him. He came at them fast and somehow struck P.C. Morrissey with that there. He pointed to a blood-stained machete on the floor by the wall. You can see Morrissey's been slashed two or three times. P.C. Taylor must have had time enough to get her baton out and use it on Payne. She did the right thing, Alan. He must have been coming at her like a bloody maniac. She had to defend herself. Self-defence. Not for us to decide, said Banks. What's the damage to pain? Fractured skull. Multiple fractures. Shame. Still, if he dies, it might save the courts a bit of money. And a lot of grief in the long run. What about his wife? Way it looks is he hit her with a vase on the stairs and she fell down them. Mild concussion, a bit of bruising. Other than that, there's no serious damage. She's lucky it wasn't heavy crystal or she might have been in the same boat as her husband. Anyway, she's still out and they're keeping an eye on her. But she'll be fine. D.C. Hodgkins is at the hospital now. Banks looked around the room again, with its flickering candles, mirrors and obscene cartoons. He noticed shards of glass on the mattress near the body and realised when he saw his own image in one of them that they were from a broken mirror. Seven years' bad luck. Hendrix's roomful of mirrors would never sound quite the same again. The doctor looked up from his examination for the first time since Banks had entered the cellar, got up off his knees and walked over to them. Dr Ian Mackenzie, home office pathologist, he said holding his hand out to Banks, who shook it. Dr. Mackenzie was a heavily built man, with a full head of brown hair, parted and combed, a fleshy nose and a gap between his upper front teeth. Always a sign of luck, that, Banks remembered his mother once telling him. Maybe it would counteract the broken mirror. What can you tell us? Banks asked. The presence of petechial hemorrhages, bruising of the throat, and cyanosis all indicate death by strangulation. Most likely ligature strangulation by that yellow clothesline around her throat. But I won't be able to tell you for certain until after the post-mortem. Any evidence of sexual activity? Some vaginal and anal tearing, what looks like semen stains. But you can see that for yourself. Again, I'll be able to tell you more later. Time of death? Recent. Very recent. There's hardly any hypostasis yet. Rigor hasn't started, and she's still warm. How long? Two or three hours, at an estimate. Banks looked at his watch. Some time after three, then. Not long before the domestic dispute that drove the woman over the road to dial 999. Banks cursed. If the call had come in just a short while earlier maybe only minutes or an hour, then they might have saved Kimberly. On the other hand, the timing was interesting for the questions it raised about the reasons for the dispute. What about that rash around her mouth? Chloroform? At a guess, probably used in abducting her, maybe even for keeping her sedated, though there are much more pleasant ways. Banks glanced at Kimberly's body. I don't think our man was overly concerned about being pleasant, do you, Doctor? Is chloroform easily available? Pretty much. It's used as a solvent. 
but it's not the cause of death. I wouldn't say so, no. Can't be absolutely certain until after post-mortem, of course. But if it is the cause, we'd expect to find more severe blistering in the esophagus. And there would also be noticeable liver damage. When can you get to her? Barring a motorway pile-up, I should be able to schedule a post-mortems to start this afternoon, Dr. Mackenzie said. We're pretty busy as it is, but, uh, well, there are priorities. He looked at Kimberly, then at P.C. Morrissey. He died of blood loss by the looks of it. Severed both his carotid artery and jugular vein. Very nasty, but quick. Apparently his partner did what she could, but it was too late. Tell her she shouldn't blame herself. Hadn't a chance. Thanks, Doctor, said Banks. Appreciate it. If you could do the PM on Kimberley first, of course. Dr. Mackenzie left to make arrangements, and Luke Selkirk and Faye McTavish continued to take photographs and video. Banks and Blackstone stood in silence, taking in the scene. There wasn't much more to see but what there was wouldn't vanish quickly from their memories. Where does that door over there lead to? Banks pointed to a door in the wall beside the mattress. Don't know, said Blackstone. You haven't had a chance to look yet. Let's have a butcher's then. Banks walked over and tried the handle. It wasn't locked. Slowly he opened the heavy wooden door to another smaller room, this one with a dirt floor. The smell was much worse in there. He felt for a light switch, but couldn't locate one. He sent Blackstone to get a torch, and tried to make out what he could in the overspill of light from the main cellar. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness in the room, Banks thought he could see little clumps of mushrooms growing here and there from the earth. Then he realised. Oh, Christ, he said slumping back against the wall. The nearest clump wasn't mushrooms at all. It was a cluster of human toes poking through the dirt. After a quick breakfast and an interview with two police detectives about her 999 call, Maggie felt the urge to go for a walk. There wasn't much chance of getting any work done for a while anyway, what with all the excitement over the road though she knew she would try later. Right now she was restless and needed to blow the cobwebs out. The detectives had stuck mostly to factual questions, and she hadn't told them anything about Lucy. But she sensed that one of them, at least, didn't seem satisfied with her answers. They would be back. She still didn't know what the hell was going on. The policeman who talked to her had given away nothing, of course, had not even told her how Lucy was, and the local news on the radio was hardly illuminating either. All they could say at this stage was that a member of the public and a police officer had been injured earlier that morning, and that took second place to the ongoing story about the local girl Kimberly Myers. As she walked down her front steps past the fuchsias, which would soon be flowering and drooping their heavy purple-pink bells over the path, Maggie saw the activity at number 35 was increasing, and neighbours were stood in little groups on the pavement, which had now been roped off from the road. Several men wearing white overalls and carrying shovels, sieves and buckets got out of a van and hurried down the garden path. Oh, look, called out one of the neighbours. He's got his bucket and spade, must be off to Blackpool. Nobody laughed. Like Maggie, Everyone was coming to realise that something very nasty indeed had happened at 35 the hill. About ten yards away, across from the narrow walled lane that separated it from number 35, was a row of shops, pizza takeaway, hairdresser, mini-mart, newsagents, fish and chips, and several uniformed officers stood arguing with the shopkeepers. They probably wanted to open up, Maggie guessed. Plain clothes police officers sat on the front wall, talking and smoking. Radios crackled. The area had fast begun to resemble the site of a natural disaster, as if a train had crashed or an earthquake had struck. Maggie remembered seeing the aftermath of the 1994 earthquake in Los Angeles, 
when she went there once with Bill before they were married. A flattened apartment building. Three stories reduced in seconds to two. Fissures in the roads. Part of the freeway collapsed. Though there was no visible damage here, it felt the same. Had the same shell-shocked aura. Even though they didn't know what had happened yet, people were stunned, were counting the cost. There was a pall of apprehension over the community, and a deep sense of terror at what destructive power the hand of God might have unleashed. They knew that something momentous had occurred on their doorsteps. Already, Maggie sensed, life in the neighborhood would never be the same again. Maggie turned left and walked down the hill, under the railway bridge. At the bottom was a small artificial pond, in the midst of the housing estates and business parks. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. At least she could sit on a bench by the water and feed the ducks, watch the people walking their dogs. It was safe, too. An important consideration in this part of the city were old, large houses, such as the one Maggie was staying in, rubbed shoulders with the newer, rougher council estates. Burglary was rife, and murder not unknown. But down by the pond, the double-deckers ran by on the main road just a few yards away, and enough ordinary people came to walk their dogs that Maggie never felt isolated or threatened. Attacks occurred in broad daylight, she knew, but she still felt close enough to safety down there. It was a warm, pleasant morning. The sun was out, but the brisk breeze made a light jacket necessary. Occasionally, a high cloud drifted over the sun, blocking the light for a second or two and casting shadows on the water's surface. There was something very soothing about feeding ducks, Maggie thought. Almost trance-like. Not for the ducks, of course, who seemed to have no concept of what sharing meant. You toss the bread, they scooted towards it, quacked and fought. As Maggie crumbled the stale bread between her fingers and tossed it onto the water, she recalled her first meeting with Lucy Payne just a couple of months ago. She had been in town shopping for art supplies that day. A remarkably warm day for March. Then she had been to Borders on Brigitte to buy some books, and afterwards she found herself wandering through the Victoria Quarter, down towards Kirkgate Market, when she bumped into Lucy, coming the other way. They had seen one another before in the street and at the local shops, and they had always said hello. Partly through inclination and partly through her shyness, getting out and meeting people never having been one of her strong points, Maggie had no friends in her new world, apart from Claire Toth, her neighbour's schoolgirl daughter, who seemed to have adopted her. Lucy Payne, she soon found out, was a kindred spirit. Perhaps because they were both out of their natural habitat, like compatriots meeting in a foreign land, they stopped and spoke to one another. Lucy said it was her day off work and she was doing a bit of shopping. Maggie suggested a cup of tea or coffee at the Harvey Nichols Outdoor Café, and Lucy said she'd love to. So they sat, rested their feet and their parcels on the ground. Lucy noticed the names on the bags Maggie was carrying, including Harvey Nichols, and said something about not having the nerve to go inside such a posh place. Her own packages, it soon became clear, were from British home stores and C&A. Maggie had come across this reluctance in northern people before, had heard all the stories about how you'd never get the typical Leeds Anorak and flat cap crowd into an upmarket store like Harvey Nichols but it still surprised her to hear Lucy admit to this. This was because Maggie thought Lucy was such a strikingly attractive and elegant woman, with her glossy black raven's wing hair tumbling down to the small of her back, and the kind of figure men buy magazines to look at pictures of. Lucy was tall and full-breasted, with a waist that curved in and hips that curved out in the right proportion, and the simple yellow dress she was wearing under a light jacket that day emphasised her figure without broadcasting it out loud, and it also drew attention to her shapely legs. She didn't wear much makeup. She didn't need to. Her pale complexion was smooth as a reflection in a mirror. Her black eyebrows arched, cheekbones high in her oval face. 
Her eyes were black, with flint-like chips scattered around inside them that caught the light like quartz crystals as she looked around. The waiter came over, and Maggie asked Lucy if she would like a cappuccino. Lucy said she'd never had one before, and wasn't quite sure what it was, but she would give it a try. Maggie asked for two cappuccinos. When Lucy took her first sip, she got froth on her lips, which she dabbed at with a serviette. You can't take me anywhere, she laughed. Don't be silly, said Maggie. No, I mean it. That's what Terry always says. She was very soft-spoken, the way Maggie had been for a while after she had left Bill. Maggie was just about to say that Terry was a fool, but she held her tongue. Insulting Lucy's husband on their first meeting wouldn't be very polite at all. What do you think of the cappuccino? she asked. It's very nice. Lucy took another sip. Where are you from? she asked. I'm not being too nosy, am I? It's just that your accent... Not at all, no. I'm from Toronto, Canada. No wonder you're so sophisticated. I've never been any further than the Lake District. Maggie laughed. Toronto. Sophisticated. See, said Lucy, pouting a little, you're laughing at me already. No, no, I'm not, Maggie said. Honestly, I'm not. It's just that, well, I suppose it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? What do you mean? If I were to tell a New Yorker that Toronto is sophisticated, she'd laugh in my face. The best thing they can say about the place is that it's clean and safe. Well, that's something to be proud of, isn't it? Leeds is neither. It doesn't seem so bad to me. Why did he leave? I mean, why did you come here? Maggie frowned and fumbled for a cigarette. She still cursed herself for a fool for starting smoking at thirty, when she had managed to avoid the evil weed her whole life. Of course, she could blame it on the stress, though in the end it had only contributed more to that stress. She remembered the first time Bill had smelled smoke on her breath. That quick as a flash change from concerned husband to monster face, as she had called it. But smoking wasn't that bad. Even her shrink said it wasn't such a terrible idea to have the occasional cigarette as a crutch for the time being. She could always stop later, when she felt better able to cope again. So, why did he come here? Lucy persisted. I don't mean to be nosy, but I'm interested. Was it a new job? Not exactly. What I do, I can do anywhere. What is it? I'm a graphic artist. I illustrate books, mostly children's books. At the moment, I'm working on a new edition of Grimm's Fairy Tales. Oh, that sounds fascinating, said Lucy. I was terrible at art in school. I can't even draw a matchstick figure. She laughed and put her hand over her mouth. So, why are you here? Maggie struggled with herself for a moment, stalling. Then a strange thing happened to her. A sense of inner chains and straps loosening, giving her space and a feeling of floating. Sitting there in the Victoria Quarter, smoking and drinking cappuccino with Lucy, she felt an immediate and unheralded surge of affection for this young woman she hardly knew. She wanted the two of them to be friends, could see them talking about their problems just like this, giving each other sympathy and advice, just as she had with Alicia back in Toronto, Lucy with her gaucheness, her naive charm, inspired a sort of emotional confidence in Maggie. This was someone, she felt, with whom she would be safe. More than that, though Maggie may have been the more sophisticated of the two, she sensed that they shared more than it appeared. The truth was difficult for her to admit to, but she felt the overwhelming need to tell someone other than her psychologist. And why not Lucy? What is it? Lucy said. You look so sad. Do I? Oh, nothing. Look, my husband and I, Maggie said, stumbling over the words as if her tongue were the size of a steak. I, um, uh, we, we split up. She felt her mouth drying up. 
Despite the loosened bonds, this was still far more difficult than she had thought it would be. She sipped some more coffee. Lucy frowned. I'm sorry, but why move so far away? Lots of people split up and they don't move countries unless he's... Oh, my God. She gave her cheek a little slap. Lucy, I think you've just put your foot in it again. Maggie couldn't help allowing herself a thin smile, even though Lucy had touched upon the painful truth. It's all right, she said. Yes, he was abusive. Yes, he hit me. You can say I'm running away. It's true. Certainly for a while I don't even want to be in the same country as him. The vehemence of her words when they came out surprised even Maggie herself. A strange look came into Lucy's eyes. Then she glanced around again, as if looking for someone. Only anonymous shoppers drifted up and down the arcade under the stained glass roof, packages in hand. Lucy touched Maggie's arm with her fingertips, and Maggie felt a little shiver run through her, almost like a reflex action to pull away. A moment ago, she had thought it would do her good to admit to someone, to share what happened with another woman, but now she wasn't so sure. She felt too naked, too raw. I'm sorry if it embarrasses you, Maggie said with a hard edge to her voice, but you did ask. Oh, no, said Lucy, grasping Maggie's wrist. Her grip was surprisingly strong, her hands cool. Please don't think that. I ask for it. I always do. It's my fault. But it doesn't embarrass me. It's just... I don't know what to say. I mean, you... You seem so bright, so in control. Yes, that's exactly what I thought. How could something like that happen to someone like me? Doesn't it only happen to other women, poor, less fortunate, uneducated, stupid women? How long? Lucy asked. I mean, how long did I let it go on before I left? Yes, two years. And don't ask me how I could let it go on for so long, either. I don't know. I'm still working on that one with a shrink. I see. Lucy paused, taking it all in. What made you leave him in the end? Maggie paused a moment, then went on. One day he just went too far, she said. He broke my jaw and two ribs, did some damage to my insides. It put me in hospital. While I was there, I filed assault charges. And you know what? As soon as I'd done it, I wanted to drop them. But the police wouldn't let me. What do you mean? I don't know what it's like over here, but in Canada, it's out of your hands if you bring assault charges. You can't just change your mind and drop them. Anyway, there was a restraining order against him. Nothing happened for a couple of weeks. Then he came round to the house with flowers, wanting to talk. What did you do? I kept the chain on. I wouldn't let him in. He was in one of his contract moods, pleading and wheedling, promising on his mother's grave. He'd done it before, and broken his promise, every time. Anyway, then he became threatening and abusive. He started hammering at the door and calling me names. I called the police. They arrested him. He came back again, stalking me. Then a friend suggested I move away for a while. The further the better. I knew about the house on the hill. Ruth and Charles Everett owned the place. Do you know them? Lucy shook her head. I've seen them around. Not for a while, though. No, you wouldn't have. Charles was offered a year's appointment at Columbia University in New York. Starting in January, Ruth went with him. How did he know them? Ruth and I are in the same line of work. It's a fairly small world. But why Leeds? Maggie smiled. Why not? First there was the house, just waiting for me, and my parents came from Yorkshire. I was born here, Rawdon, but we left when I was a little girl. Anyway, it seemed the ideal solution. So you're living across the road in that big house all alone, all alone. I thought I hadn't seen anyone else coming and going. To be honest, Lucy, you're pretty much the first person I've spoken to since I got here apart from my shrink and my agent, that is. 
It's not that people aren't friendly. I've just been, well, standoffish, I suppose, a bit distant. Lucy's hand still rested on Maggie's forearm, though she wasn't gripping at all now. That makes sense. After what you've been through. Did he follow you over here? I don't think so. I don't think he knows where I am. I've had a few late-night hang-up calls, but I honestly don't know if they're from him. I don't think they are. All my friends back there swore they wouldn't tell him where I was, and he doesn't know Ruth and Charles. He had little interest in my career. I doubt that he knows I'm in England, though I wouldn't put it past him to find out. Maggie needed to change the subject. She could hear the ringing in her ears, feel the arcade spinning and her jaw aching, the colored glass roof above her shifting like a kaleidoscope, her neck muscles stiffening, the way they always did when she thought about Bill for too long. Psychosomatic, the shrink said, as if that did her any good. She asked Lucy about herself. I don't really have any friends either, Lucy said. She stirred her spoon around the dregs of her cappuccino froth. I suppose I was always rather shy, even at school. I never know what to say to people. Then she laughed. I don't have much of a life either. Just work at the bank, home, taking care of Terry. We haven't been married a year yet. He doesn't like me to go out by myself. Even today, my day off, if he knew, that reminds me. She looked at her watch and seemed to become agitated. Thank you very much for the coffee, Maggie. I really have to go. I have to get the bus back before school comes out. Terry's the teacher, you see. Now it was Maggie's turn to grasp Lucy's arm and stop her from leaving so abruptly. What is it, Lucy? she asked. Lucy just looked away. Lucy? It's nothing. It's just what you were saying earlier. She lowered her voice and looked around the arcade before going on. I know what you mean, but I can't talk about it now. Terry hits you? No, not like, I mean... He's very strict. It's for my own good. She looked Maggie in the eye. You don't know me. I'm a wayward child. Terry has to discipline me. Wayward, Maggie thought. Discipline? What strange and alarming words to use. He has to keep you in check, control you. Yes. She stood up again. Look, I must go. It's been wonderful talking to you. I hope we can be friends. I do too, said Maggie. We really have to talk again. There's help, you know. Lucy flashed her a wan smile and hurried off towards Vicar Lane. After Lucy had gone... Maggie sat stunned, her hand shaking as she drained her cup. The milky foam was dry and cold against her lips. Lucy, a fellow victim. Maggie couldn't believe it. This strong, healthy, beautiful woman, a victim. Just like slight, weak, elfin Maggie. Surely it couldn't be possible. But hadn't she sensed something about Lucy? Some kinship? Something they had in common. That must be it. That was what she hadn't wanted to talk to the police about that morning. She knew that she might have to, depending on how serious things were. But she wanted to put off the moment for as long as she could. Thinking of Lucy, Maggie remembered the one thing she had learned about domestic abuse so far. It doesn't matter who you are. It can still happen to you. Alicia and all her other close friends back home had expressed their wonder at how such a bright, intelligent, successful, caring, educated woman like Maggie could fall victim to a wife-beater like Bill. She had seen the expressions on their faces, noticed their conversations hush and shift when she walked in the room. There must be something wrong with her, they were all saying. And that was what she had thought too, still thought to some extent. Because to all intents and purposes, Bill, too, was bright, intelligent, caring, educated, and successful. 
until he got his monster face on, that is. But only Maggie saw him like that. And it was odd, she thought, that nobody had thought to ask why an intelligent, wealthy, successful lawyer like Bill should feel the need to hit a woman almost a foot shorter and at least eighty pounds lighter than he was. Even when the police came that time he was hammering at her door, she could tell they were making excuses for him. He was driven out of his mind by his wife's unreasonable action in taking out a restraining order against him. He was just upset because his marriage had broken up and his wife wouldn't give him a chance to make it up. Excuses, excuses. Maggie was the only one who knew what he could be like. Every day she thanked God they had no kids. Which was what she was thinking about as she drifted back to the present, to feeding the ducks on the pond. Lucy was a fellow sufferer, and now Terry had put her in hospital. Maggie felt responsible, as if she should have done something. Lord knows she had tried. After Lucy's subsequent tale of physical and psychological abuse at the hands of her husband had unfolded during their many furtive meetings over coffee and biscuits, with Maggie sworn to absolute secrecy, she should have done something. But unlike most people, Maggie knew exactly what it was like. She knew Lucy's position, knew that the best she could do was try to persuade her to seek professional help, to leave Terry, which she did try to do. But Lucy wouldn't leave him. She said she had nowhere to go, and no one to go to. A common enough excuse, and it made perfect sense. Where do you go when you walk out on your life? Maggie had been lucky she had the friends to rally around her and come up with at least a temporary solution. Most women in her position were not so fortunate. Lucy also said that her marriage was so new that she felt she had to give it a chance, give it some time. She couldn't just walk out on it. She wanted to work harder at it. Another common response from women in her position Maggie knew, but all she could do was point out that it wasn't going to get any better no matter what she did, that Terry wasn't going to change, and that it would come to her leaving sooner or later. So why not leave sooner, and spare herself the beatings? But no, Lucy wanted to stick it out a while longer, at least a little while. Terry was so nice afterwards, so good to her. He bought her presents, flowers, swore he would never do it again, that he would change. It made Maggie sick to hear all this, literally, as she once vomited the minute Lucy left the house. The same damn reasons and excuses she had given herself, and those few close friends who knew about her situation all along. But she listened. What else could she do? Lucy needed a friend, for better or for worse. Maggie was it. Now this. Maggie tossed the last crumbs of bread into the pond. She aimed for the scruffiest, littlest, ugliest duckling of them all. The one way at the back that hadn't been able to get at the feast so far. It made no difference. The bread landed only inches from his beak. But before he could get to it, the others had paddled over in a ferocious pack and snapped it right from under his mouth. Banks wanted to get a look at the whole interior of 35 the Hill before the Sockos started ripping it apart. He didn't know what it would tell him, but he needed to get the feel of it. Downstairs, in addition to the kitchen with its small dining area, there was only a living room, containing a three-piece suite, stereo system, television, video, and a small bookcase. Though the room was decorated with the same feminine touch as the hallway, frilly lace curtains, coral pink wallpaper, thick pile carpet, cream ceiling with ornate cornices, the videos in the cabinet under the TV set reflected masculine tastes, action films, tape after tape of The Simpsons, a collection of horror and science fiction films, including the whole Alien and Scream series, along with some true classics such as The Wicker Man, the original Cat People, Curse of the Demon, and a boxed set of David Cronenberg films. Banks poked around, 
but could find no pawn, nothing homemade. Maybe the Sockers would have better luck when they took the house apart. The CDs were an odd mix. There were some classical, mostly classic FM compilations, and the best of Mozart set. But there were also some rap, heavy metal, and country and western CDs too. Eclectic tastes. The books were also mixed. Beauty manuals, Reader's Digest condensed specials, needlecraft techniques, romances, occult and true crime of the more graphic variety, tabloid-style biographies of famous serial killers and mass murderers. The room showed one or two signs of untidiness. Yesterday's evening paper spread over the coffee table, a couple of videos left out of their boxes, but on the whole it was clean and neat. There were also a number of knick-knacks around the place, the sort of things that Banks's mother wouldn't have in the house because they made dusting more difficult. Porcelain figures of fairy tale characters and animals. In the dining area stood a large glass-fronted cabinet, filled with royal Dalton chinaware, probably a wedding present, Banks guessed. Upstairs were two bedrooms, the smaller one used as a home office, along with a toilet and bathroom. No shower, just sink and tub. Both toilet and bathroom were spotless. The porcelain shining bright, air heavy with the scent of lavender. Banks glanced around the plug holes, but saw only polished chrome, not a trace of blood or hair. Their computer expert, David Priest, sat in the office clacking away at the computer keys. A large filing cabinet stood in the corner. It would have to be emptied, its contents transferred to the exhibits room at Milgarth. Anything yet, Dave? Banks asked. Priest pushed his glasses back up his nose and turned. Nothing much. Just a few pornographic websites, bookmarked, chat rooms, that sort of thing. Nothing illegal yet, by the looks of it. Keep at it. Banks walked into the master bedroom. The colour scheme seemed to continue the ocean theme. But instead of coral, it was sea blue, azure, cobalt, cerulean. Annie Cabot would know the exact shade, her father being an artist. But to Banks, it was just blue, like the walls of his living room, though a shade or two darker. The queen size bed was covered by a fluffed up black duvet. The bedroom suite was assembled it yourself, blonde Scandinavian pine. Another television set stood on a stand at the bottom of the bed. The cabinet held a collection of soft core porn, if the labels were to be believed, but still nothing illegal or homemade, no kiddie stuff or animals. So the pains were into porn videos. So what? So were more than half the households in the country, Banks was willing to bet. But more than half the households in the country didn't go around abducting and killing young girls. Some lucky young D.C. was going to have to sit down and watch the lot from start to finish to verify that the contents matched the titles. Banks poked around in the wardrobe, suits, shirts, dresses, shoes, mostly women's. Nothing he wouldn't have expected. They would all have to be bagged by the Sockos and examined in minute detail. There were plenty of knick-knacks in the bedroom, too. Limoges cases. Musical jewellery boxes, lacquered, hand-painted boxes. The room took its musky rose and aniseed scent, Banks noticed, from a bowl of potpourri on the laundry hamper under the window. The bedroom faced the hill, and when Banks parted the lace curtains and looked out of the window, he could see the houses atop the rise over the street, half hidden by shrubs and trees. He could also see the activity below, on the street. He turned and looked around the room again, finding it somehow depressing in its absolute sterility. It could have been ordered from a colour supplement and assembled yesterday. The whole house, except for the cellar, of course, had that feel to it. Pretty, contemporary, the sort of place where the up-and-coming young middle-class couple about town should be living. So ordinary, but empty. With a sigh, he went back downstairs. 
Chapter 3 Kelly Diane Matthews went missing during the New Year's Eve party in Roundy Park, Leeds. She was seventeen years old, five feet three inches tall and weighed just seven stone. She lived in Allwoodley and attended Allerton High School. Kelly had two younger sisters, Ashley, aged nine, and Nicola, aged thirteen. The call to the local police station came in at 9.11am on the 1st of January. Mr. and Mrs. Matthews were worried that their daughter hadn't come home that night. They had been to a party themselves and hadn't arrived back until almost 3 a.m. They noticed that Kelly wasn't home yet, but weren't too worried because she was with friends, and they knew that these New Year parties were likely to go on until the wee hours. They also knew she had plenty of money for a taxi. They were both tired, and a little tipsy after their own party, they told the police, so they went straight to bed. When they awoke the following morning, and found that Kelly's bed had still not been slept in, they became worried. She had never done anything like this before. First they telephoned the parents of the two girlfriends she had gone with, reliable in their estimation. Both Kelly's friends, Alex Kirk and Jessica Bradley, had arrived home shortly after two in the morning. Then Adrian Matthews rang the police. P.C. Reardon, who took the call, picked up on the genuine concern in Mr. Matthews' voice and sent an officer around immediately. Kelly's parents said they last saw her around seven o'clock on the 31st of December, when she went to meet her friends. She was wearing blue jeans, white trainers, a thick cable-knit jumper, and a three-quarter length suede jacket. When questioned later, Kelly's friends said that the group had become separated during the fireworks display, but nobody was too concerned. After all, there were thousands of people about, buses were running late and taxis were touting for business. Adrian and Gillian Matthews weren't rich, but they were comfortably off. Adrian oversaw the computer systems of a large retail operation, and Gillian was assistant manager of a city centre building society. They owned a Georgian-style semi-detached house not far from Eckup Reservoir, in an area of the city closer to parks, golf courses, and the countryside than to factories, warehouses, and grim terraces of back-to-backs. According to her friends and teachers, Kelly was a bright, personable, responsible girl who got consistently high marks and was certain to land in the university of her choice, at the moment Cambridge, where she intended to read law. Kelly was also her school's champion sprinter. She had beautiful gold blonde hair, which she wore long, and she liked clothes, dancing, pop music and sports. She was also fond of classical music, and quite an accomplished pianist. It soon became clear to the investigating officer that Kelly Matthews was a most unlikely teenage runaway, and he instituted the search of the park. When, three days later, the search parties had found nothing, they called it off. In the meantime, police had also interviewed hundreds of revellers, some of whom said they thought they'd seen her with a man and others with a woman. Taxi drivers and bus drivers were also questioned to no avail. A week after Kelly disappeared, her shoulder bag was found in some bushes near the park. In it were her keys, a diary, cosmetics, a hairbrush, and a purse containing over thirty-five pounds and some loose change. Her diary yielded no clues. The last entry, on the 31st of December, was a brief list of New Year's resolutions. 1. Help Mum more around the house. 2. Practice piano every day. 3. Be nicer to my little sisters. Banks stripped off his protective clothing, leaned against his car out in the street and lit a cigarette. It was going to be a hot, sunny day, he could tell, only the occasional high clouds scudding across the blue sky on a light breeze. And he would be spending most of it indoors, either at the scene or at Milgarth. He ignored the people on the other side of the road who stopped to stare, and shut his ears to the honking horns and the snarl of cars up the hill, 
which had now been blocked off completely by the local traffic police. The press had arrived. Banks could see them straining at the barriers. Banks had known it would come to this eventually, or to something very much like this. From the very first moment he had agreed to head the North Yorkshire half of the two-county task force into the series of disappearances, five young women in all, three from West Yorkshire and two from North Yorkshire. The West Yorkshire Assistant Chief Constable, Crime, was in overall charge, but he was at county headquarters in Wakefield, so Banks and Blackstone rarely saw him. They reported directly to the head of CID, Area Commander Philip Hartnell, at Milgarth in Leeds, who was the official senior investigating officer, but who left them to get on with the job. The main incident room was also at Milgarth. Under Banks and Blackstone came several detective inspectors, a whole host of detective constables and sergeants, culled from both West and North County forces, skilled civilian employees, crime scene coordinator D.S. Stefan Novak, and, acting as consultant psychologist, Dr. Jenny Fuller, who had studied offender profiling in America, with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and didn't look a bit like Jodie Foster. Jenny had also studied with Paul Britton in Leicester, and was recognised as one of the rising stars in the relatively new field of psychology combined with the police work. Banks had worked with Jenny Fuller on his very first case in Eastvale, and they had become close friends, almost more, but something always seemed to get in their way. It was probably for the best, Banks told himself, though he often couldn't convince himself of that when he looked at her. Jenny had such lips as you rarely saw on anyone but a pouting French sex symbol. Her figure tapered and bulged in all the right places, and her clothes, usually expensive silky clothes, mostly in green and russet, just seemed to flow over her. It was that liquefaction of her clothes that the poet Herrick wrote about, the dirty old devil. Banks had come across Herrick in a poetry anthology he was working his way through, having felt a disturbing ignorance in such matters for years. Lines like Herrick's stuck with him, as did the one about sweet disorder in the dress, which made him think of D.S. Annie Cabot for some reason. Annie wasn't so obviously beautiful in the way Jenny was, not as voluptuous, not the kind to draw wolf whistles on the street but she had a deep, quiet sort of beauty that appealed very much to Banks. Unfortunately, because of his new and onerous responsibilities, he hadn't seen much of Annie lately, and had found himself, because of the case, spending more and more time with Jenny, realising that the old feelings, that odd and immediate spark between them, had never gone away. Nothing had happened as such, but it had been touch and go on occasion. Annie was also consumed with her work. She had found a detective inspector's position open in Western Division's Complaints and Discipline Department, and had taken it because it was the first opportunity that came up. It wasn't ideal, and it certainly didn't win her any popularity contests, but it was a necessary step in the ladder she had set out to climb, and Banks had encouraged her to go for it. D.C. Karen Hodgkins edged her little grey Nissan through the opening the police made in the barrier for her and broke off Banks' chain of thought. She got out and walked over. Karen had proved an energetic and ambitious worker throughout the whole investigation, and Banks fancied she would go far if she developed a flair for police politics. She reminded him a bit of Susan Gay, his old D.C., now a D.S. in Sirencester, but she had fewer sharp edges and seemed more sure of herself. What's the situation? Banks asked her. Not much change, sir. Lucy Payne's under sedation. The doctor says he won't be able to talk to her until tomorrow. Have Lucy and her husband been fingerprinted? Yes, sir. What about her clothes? Banks had suggested that they take the clothes Lucy Payne had been wearing for forensic examination. After all, she wouldn't be needing them in hospital. They should be at the lab by now, sir, 
Good. What was she wearing? Nighty and a dressing gown. What about Terence Payne? How's he doing? Hanging on. But they say that even if he does recover, he might be, you know, a vegetable. There might be serious brain damage. They found skull fragments stuck in his brain, it seems. Well, go on. The doctor's saying that it seems the PC who subdued him used a bit more than reasonable force. He was very angry. Was he indeed? Christ. Banks could see a court case looming if Payne survived with brain damage. Best let A.C. Hartnell worry about it. That was what ACs were put on this earth for, after all. How's PC Taylor coping? She's at home, sir. A friend's with her, female PC from Killingbeck. OK, Karen. I want you to act as hospital liaison for the time being. Any change in the status of the patients, either of them, and I want to know immediately. That's your responsibility, OK? Yes, sir. And we're going to need a family liaison officer. He gestured towards the house. Kimberly's parents need to be told before they hear it on the news. We also need to arrange for them to identify the body. I'll do it, sir. Good of you to offer, Karen. But you've got your hands full already, and it's a thankless task. Karen Hodgkins headed back to her car. If truth be told, Banks didn't think Karen had the right bedside manner for a family liaison officer. He could picture the scene. The parents' disbelief, their outpouring of grief, Karen's embarrassment and brusqueness. No. He would send roly-poly Jonesy. D.C. Jones might be a slob, but he had sympathy and concern leaking out of every pore. He should have been a vicar. One of the problems with drawing a team from such a wide radius, Banks thought, was that you could never get to know the individual officers well enough, which didn't help when it came to handing out assignments. You needed the right person for the right job in police work, and one wrong decision could screw up an investigation. Banks just wasn't used to running such a huge team, and the problems of coordination had given him more than one headache. In fact, the whole matter of responsibility was weighing very heavily on his mind. He didn't feel competent to deal with it all, to keep so many balls up in the air at once. He had already made more than one minor mistake, and mishandled a few situations with personnel, so much so that he was beginning to think his people skills were especially low. It was easier working with a small team, Annie, Winsome Jackman, Sergeant Hatchley, where he could keep track of every little detail in his mind. This was more like the kind of work he had done on the Met down in London. Only there, he had been a mere constable or sergeant, given the orders rather than giving them. Even as an inspector down there towards the end, he had never had to deal with this level of responsibility. Banks had just lit his second cigarette when another car came through the barrier, and Dr. Jenny Fuller jumped out, struggling with a briefcase and an overstuffed leather shoulder bag, hurrying as usual, as if she were late for an important meeting. Her tousled red mane cascaded over her shoulders, and her eyes were the green of grass after a summer shower. The freckles, Crow's feet and slightly crooked nose that she always complained ruined her looks, only made her appear more attractive and more human. Morning, Jenny, Banks greeted her. Stefan's waiting inside. You ready? What's that, Yorkshire foreplay? No, that's, are you awake? Jenny forced a smile. Glad to see you're on form, even at this ungodly hour. Banks looked at his watch. Jenny, I've been up since half past four. It's nearly eight now. My point exactly, she said. Ungodly. She looked towards the house. Apprehension flitted across her features. It's bad, isn't it? Very. Coming with me? No, I've seen enough. Besides, I'd better go and put A.C. Hartnell in the picture, or he'll have my guts for garters. Jenny took a deep breath and seemed to gird herself. Right, she said. 
Lay on, Macduff. I'm ready. And she walked in. Area Commander Philip Hartnell's office was, as befitted his rank, large. It was also quite bare. A.C. Hartnell didn't believe in making himself at home there. This, the place seemed to shout, is an office, and an office only. There was a carpet, of course. An area commander merited a carpet, one filing cabinet, a bookcase full of technical and procedural manuals, and on his desk, beside the virgin blotter, a sleek black laptop computer, and a single buff file folder. That was it. No family photographs, nothing but a map of the city on the wall, and a view of the open-air market and the bus station from his window, the tower of Leeds Parish Church poking up beyond the railway embankment. Alan, sit down, he greeted Banks. Tea, coffee? Banks ran his hand over his scalp. Wouldn't mind a black coffee if it's no trouble. Not at all. Hartnell phoned for coffee and leaned back in his chair. It squeaked when he moved. Must get this bloody thing oiled, he said. Hartnell was about ten years younger than Banks, which put him in his late thirties. He had benefited from the accelerated promotion scheme, which was meant to give bright young lads like him a chance at command before they became doddering old farts. Banks hadn't been on such a track. He had worked his way up the old way, the hard way, and like many others who had done so, he tended to be suspicious of the fast trackers, who had learned everything but the nitty-gritty down and dirty of policing. The odd thing was that Banks liked Phil Hartnell. He had an easy-going manner, was an intelligent and caring copper, and let the men under his command get on with their jobs. Banks had had regular meetings with him over the course of the chameleon investigation, and while Hartnell had made a few suggestions, some of them useful, he had never once tried to interfere and question Banks's judgment. In appearance, good-looking, tall, and with the tapered upper body of a casual weightlifter. Hartnell was also reputed to be a bit of a ladies' man, still unmarried, and tipped to remain that way for a while yet, thank you very much. Tell me what we're in for, he said to Banks. A shitstorm, if you ask me. Banks told him about what they had found so far in the cellar at number 35, the hill, and the condition of the three survivors. Hartnell listened, the tip of his finger touched to his lips. There's not much doubt he's our man, then. The chameleon? Not much. That's good, then. At least that's something we can congratulate ourselves on. We've got a serial killer off the street. It wasn't down to us. Just pure luck the Paynes happened to have a domestic disagreement and a neighbour heard and called the police. Hartnell stretched his arms out behind his head. A twinkle came to his grey-blue eyes. You know, Alan, the amount of shit we get poured on us when luck goes against us, or when we seem to be making no progress at all, no matter how many man-hours we put in, I'd say we're entitled to claim a victory this time and maybe even crow a little about it. It's all in the spin. If you say so. I do, Alan, I do. Their coffee arrived, and both took a moment to sip. It tasted wonderful to Banks, who hadn't got his usual three or four cups down his gullet that morning. But we do have a potentially serious problem, don't we? Hartnell went on. Banks nodded. P.C. Taylor. Indeed. He tapped the file folder. Probationary P.C. Janet Taylor. He looked away a moment, towards the window. I knew Dennis Morrissey, by the way. Not well, but I knew him. Solid sort of bloke. Seems he's been around for years. We'll miss him. What about P.C. Taylor? Can't say I know her. Have the proper procedures been followed? Yes. No statement yet? No. OK. Hartnell got up and stared out of the window for a few moments, his back to Banks. When he spoke again, he didn't turn round. You know as well as I do, Alan, that protocol demands the police complaints authority brings in an investigator from a neighbouring force to deal with a problem like this. There mustn't even be the slightest hint of a cover-up or special treatment. Naturally, I'd like nothing better than to deal with it myself. 
Dennis was one of ours, after all. As is P.C. Taylor. But it's not on the cards. He turned and walked back over to his chair. Can you imagine what a field day the press will have? Especially if Payne dies. Heroic P.C. brings down serial killer and ends up being charged with using excessive force. Even if it's excusable homicide, it's still the dog's breakfast as far as we're concerned. And what with the Hadley case before the court right now? True enough. Banks, like every other policeman, had had to deal more than once with the outrage of men and women who had seriously hurt or killed criminals in defence of their families and property, and then found themselves under arrest for assault, or worse, murder. At the moment... The country was waiting the jury's verdict on a farmer called John Hadley, who had used his shotgun on an unarmed 16-year-old burglar, killing the lad. Hadley lived on a remote farm in Devon, and his house had been broken into once before, just over a year ago, at which time he had been beaten as well as robbed. The young burglar had a record as long as your arm, but that didn't matter. What mattered most was that the pattern of shotgun pellets covered part of the side and the back, indicating that the boy had been turning to run away as the gun was fired. An unopened flick knife was found in his pocket. The case had been generating sensational headlines for a couple of weeks and would be with the jury in a matter of days. An investigation didn't mean that PC Janet Taylor would lose her job or go to jail. Fortunately, there were higher authorities, such as judges and chief constables, who had to make decisions on such matters as those. But there was no denying that it could have a negative effect on her police career. Well, it's my problem, said Hartnell, rubbing his forehead. But it's a decision that has to be made very quickly. Naturally, as I said, I'd like to keep it with us, but I can't do that. He paused and looked at Banks. On the other hand, P.C. Taylor is West Yorkshire, and it seems to me that North Yorkshire might reasonably be considered a neighbouring force. True, said Banks, beginning to get that sinking feeling. That would help keep it as close as we can, don't you think? I suppose so, said Banks. As a matter of fact, A.C.C. McLaughlin's an old friend of mine. It might be worthwhile, my having a word. How's your complaints and discipline department? Know anyone up there? Banks swallowed. It didn't matter what he said. If the matter went to Western Division's complaints and discipline, the burden would almost certainly land in Annie Cabot's lap. It was a small department. Annie was the only detective inspector, and Banks happened to know that her boss, Detective Superintendent Chambers, was a lazy sod with a particular dislike of female detectives making their way up the ranks. Annie was the new kid on the block, and she was also a woman. Not a hope of her getting out of this one. Banks could almost see the bastard rubbing his hands for glee when the order came down. Don't you think it might seem just a bit too close to home, he said. Maybe Greater Manchester or Lincolnshire would be better. Not at all, said Hartnell. This way we get to be seen to do the right thing while still keeping it pretty close to us. Surely you must know someone in the department. Someone who'll realise it's in his best interest to keep you informed. Detective Superintendent Chambers is in charge, said Banks. I'm sure he'll find someone suitable to assign. Hartnell smiled. Well, I'll have a word with Ron McLaughlin this morning. And we'll see where it gets us, shall we? Fine said Banks, thinking she'll kill me, she'll kill me, even though it wasn't his fault. Jenny Fuller noted with distaste the poster as she went through the cellar door, with D.S. Stefan Novak right behind her. Then she put her feelings aside and viewed it dispassionately as a piece of evidence, which it was. It marked the keeper of the portal to the dark underworld where Terence Payne could immerse himself in what he loved most in life. Domination, sexual power, murder. Once he had got beyond this obscene guardian, the rules that normally govern human behaviour no longer applied. 
Jenny and Stefan were alone in the cellar now, alone with the dead. She felt like a voyeur. She also felt like a fraud, as if nothing she could say or do would be of any use. She almost felt like holding Stefan's hand. Almost. Behind her, Stefan switched off the overhead light and made Jenny jump. Sorry, it wasn't on at first, he explained. One of the ambulance crew turned it on so they could see what they were dealing with, and it just got left on. Jenny's heartbeat returned to normal. She could smell incense, along with other odors she had no desire to dwell on. So this was his working environment. Hallowed, church-like. Several of the candles had burned down by now, and some of them were guttering out, but a dozen or more still flickered, multiplied into hundreds by the arrangement of mirrors. Without the overhead light, Jenny could hardly make out the dead policeman's body on the floor, which was probably a blessing, and the candlelight softened the impact of the girl's body, gave her skin such a reddish-gold hue that Jenny could have almost believed Kimberly alive, were it not for the preternatural stillness of her body and the way her eyes stared up into the overhead mirror. Nobody home. Mirrors. No matter where Jenny looked, she could see reflections of herself, Stefan, and the girl on the mattress, muted in the flickering candlelight. He likes to watch himself at work, she thought. Could that be the only way he feels real? Watching himself doing it. Where's the camcorder? she asked. Luke Selkirk's. No, I don't mean the police camera, I mean his. Payne's. We haven't found a camcorder, why? Look at the setup, Stefan. This is a man who likes to look at himself in action. It'd surprise me a great deal if he didn't keep some record of his actions, wouldn't it you? Now you come to mention it, yes, said Stefan. That sort of thing's par for the course in sex killings. Some sort of memento, a trophy. And usually also some sort of visual aid to help him relive the experience before the next one. We'll know more when the team's finished with the house. Jenny followed the phosphorescent tape that marked the path to the anteroom, where the bodies lay, still untouched, awaiting the Sockos. In the light of Stefan's torch, her glance took in the toes sticking through the earth, and what looked like a finger, perhaps a nose, a kneecap. His menagerie of death. Planted trophies. His garden. Stefan shifted beside her, and she realized she had been holding his arm, digging in hard with her nails. They went back into the candlelit cellar. As Jenny stood over Kimberly, noting the wounds, small cuts and scratch marks, she couldn't help herself and found she was weeping, silent tears damp against her cheek. She wiped her eyes with the back of one hand, hoping Stefan didn't notice. If he did, he was gentleman enough not to say anything. Suddenly she wanted to leave. It wasn't just the sight of Kimberly Myers on the mattress, or the smell of incense and blood, the images flickering in mirrors and candlelight, but the combination of all these elements made her feel claustrophobic and nauseated standing there observing this horror with Stefan. She didn't want to be here with him, or with any man, feeling the things she did. It felt obscene, and it was an obscenity performed by man upon woman. Trying to conceal her trembling, she touched Stefan's arm. I've seen enough down here for now, she said. Let's go. I'd like to have a look around the rest of the house. Stefan nodded and turned back to the stairs. Jenny had the damnedest sensation that he knew exactly what she was feeling. Bloody hell, she thought the sixth sense she could do without right now. Life was complicated enough with the usual five at work. She followed Stefan past the poster up the worn stone stairs. Annie, got much on right now? As a matter of fact, I'm wearing a mid-length navy blue skirt, red shoes and a white silk blouse. Do you want to know about my underwear? Don't tempt me.
I take it you're alone in the office. Or am I a little lonesome? Listen, Annie, I've got something to tell you. Warn you about, actually. Banks was sitting in his car outside the pain house talking on his mobile. The mortuary wagon had taken the bodies away, and Kimberly's stunned parents had identified her body. The Sockos had located two more bodies so far in the anteroom, both of them in so advanced a state of decomposition that it was impossible to make visual identification. Dental records would have to be checked. DNA sampled and checked against the parents. It would all take time. Another team was still combing through the house, boxing up papers, accounts, bills, receipts, snapshots, letters, anything and everything. Banks listened to the silence. After he had finished explaining the assignment he thought Annie would be getting in the near future, he had decided that the best way to deal with it was to try to put it in a positive light, convince Annie that she would be good for the job and that it was the right job for her. He didn't imagine he would have much success, but it was worth a try. He counted the beats. One, two, three, four. Then the explosion came. He's doing what? Is this some kind of sick joke, Alan? No joke. Because if it is, you can knock it off right now. It's not funny. It's no joke, Annie. I'm serious. And if you think about it for a minute, you'll see what a great idea it is. If I thought about it for the rest of my life, it still wouldn't seem like a great idea. How dare he? You know there's no way I can come out of this looking good. If I prove a case against her, then every cop and every member of the public hates my guts. If I don't prove a case, the press screams cover-up. No, they won't. Have you any idea what sort of monster Terence Payne is? They'll be whooping for joy that populist justice is served at last. Some of them, perhaps. But not the ones I read. Or you, for that matter. Annie, it's not going to bury you. It'll be in the hands of the CPS well before that stage. You're not judge, jury and executioner, you know. You're just a humble investigator trying to get the facts right. How can that harm you? Was it you who suggested me in the first place? Did you give Hartnell my name? Tell him I'd be the best one for the job? I can't believe you'd do this to me, Alan. I thought you liked me. I do. And I haven't done anything. A.C. Hartnell came up with it all by himself. And you and I both know what'll happen as soon as it gets into Detective Superintendent Chambers's hands. Well, at least we're agreed on that. You know, the fat bastard's been chomping at the bit all week because he hasn't been able to find anything really messy for me to do. For crying out loud, Alan, couldn't you do something? Like what? Suggest he hand it over to Lancashire or Derbyshire, anything. I tried, but his mind was made up. He knows A.C.C. McLaughlin. Besides, this way he thinks I can hold on to some degree of control over the investigation. Well, he can bloody well think again about that. Annie, you can do some good here. For yourself, for the public interest. Don't try appealing to my better nature. I haven't got one. Why are you resisting so strongly? Because it's a crap job and you know it. At least give me the courtesy of not trying to soft-soap me. Banks sighed. I'm only the advance warning. Don't kill the messenger. That's what messengers are for. You're saying I've no choice. There's always a choice. Yeah, the right one and the wrong one. Don't worry, I won't make a fuss. But you'd better be right about the consequences. Trust me, I'm right. And you'll respect me in the morning, sure. Look, about the morning, I'm going back to Gratley tonight. I'll be late, but maybe you could come over, or I could drop by your place on my way. What for, a quickie? Doesn't have to be that quick. Way I'm sleeping these days, it could take all night. No way. I need my beauty sleep. Remember, I've got to be up bright and early in the morning to drive to Leeds. Bye. Banks held the silent mobile to his ear for a few moments, then put it back in his pocket. Christ, he thought. You handled that one really well, Alan, didn't you? 
people skills. Chapter 4 Samantha Jane Foster, 18 years old, 5 foot 5 and 7 stone 3, was a first-year English student at the University of Bradford. Her parents lived in Leighton Buzzard, where Julian Foster was a chartered accountant, and Teresa Foster, a local GP. Samantha had one older brother, Alistair, unemployed, and a younger sister, Chloe, still at school. On the evening of the 26th of February, Samantha attended a poetry reading in a pub near the university campus and left alone for her bedsit at around 11.15pm. She lived just off Great Horton Road, about a quarter of a mile away. When she didn't turn up for her weekend job in the city centre Waterstones bookshop, one of her co-workers, Penelope Hall, became worried and called at the bedsit during her lunch break. Samantha was reliable, she later told the police, and if she wasn't going to come into work because of illness, she would always ring. This time she hadn't. Worried that Samantha might be seriously ill, Penelope managed to persuade the landlord to open the bedsit door. Nobody home. There was a very good chance that the Bradford police might not have taken Samantha Foster's disappearance seriously, at least not so quickly, had it not been for the shoulder bag that a conscientious student had found in the street and handed in after midnight the previous evening. It contained a poetry anthology called New Blood, a slim volume of poetry signed to Samantha, between whose silky thighs I would love to rest my head and give silver tongue, and dated by the poet Michael Stringer, who had read in the pub the previous evening a spiral notebook full of poetic jottings, observations, reflections on life and literature, including what looked to the desk officer like descriptions of hallucinogenic states and out-of-body experiences. A half-smoked packet of Benson and Hedges, a red packet of Rizzler cigarette papers, and a small plastic bag of marijuana, less than a quarter of an ounce. A green disposable cigarette lighter, three loose tampons, a set of keys, a personal CD player with a Tracy Chapman CD inside it, a little bag of cosmetics, and a purse containing £15 in cash and a credit card, student union card, shop receipts for books and CDs, and various other sundry items. Given the two occurrences, an abandoned shoulder bag and a missing girl, especially as the young D.C., who was given the assignment to remember that something similar had happened in Rounded Park, Leeds, on New Year's Eve. The inquiry began that very morning, with calls to Samantha's parents and close friends, none of whom had seen her or heard of any change in her plans or normal routine. For a brief time, Michael Stringer, the poet who had been reading his work at the pub, became a suspect, given the inscription he had written in his book of poems for her but a number of witnesses said he carried on drinking in the city centre and had to be helped back to his hotel at around 3.30 in the morning. The hotel staff assured the police that he hadn't seen the light of day again until tea time the following day. Inquiries around the university turned up one possible witness, who thought she saw Samantha talking to someone through a car window. At least the girl had long blonde hair, and was wearing the same clothes Samantha was when she left the pub, jeans, black calf-high boots, and a long flapping overcoat. The car was dark in colour, and the witness remembered the three last letters on the number plate because they formed her own initials, Catherine Wendy Thurlow. She said she had no reason to believe that there was any problem at the time, so she crossed over to her street and carried on to her own flat. The last two letters of a car number plate indicate the origin of its registration, and WT signifies Leeds. The DVLA at Swansea were able to supply a list of over a thousand possibilities, as Catherine hadn't been able to narrow the search down to make or even colour, and the owners were interviewed by Bradford CID. Nothing came of it. All the searches and interviews that followed 
turned up nothing more about Samantha Foster's disappearance, and rumblings were starting on the police tom-toms. Two disappearances, almost two months and about fifteen miles apart, were enough to set off a few alarm bells, but not a full-blown panic. Samantha didn't have many friends, but those she did have were loyal and devoted to her, in particular Angela Firth, Ryan Connor, and Abha Gupta, who were all devastated by Samantha's disappearance. According to them, Samantha was a very serious sort of girl, given to long reflective silences and gnomic utterances, with no time for small talk, sports and television. She had a level head on her shoulders, though, they insisted, and everyone said she wasn't the type to go off with a stranger on a whim. No matter how much she talked about the importance of experiencing life to the full. When the police suggested that Samantha might have wandered off under the influence of drugs, her friends said it was unlikely. Yes, they admitted she liked to smoke a joint occasionally. She said it helped her with her writing. But she didn't do any harder drugs. She also didn't drink much, and couldn't have had more than two or three glasses of wine the entire evening. She didn't have a boyfriend at the moment, and didn't seem interested in acquiring one. No, she wasn't gay, but she had spoken of exploring sexual experiences with other women. Samantha might appear unconventional in some ways, Angela explained, but she had a lot more common sense than people sometimes imagined on first impressions. She was just not frivolous, and she was interested in a lot of things other people laughed at or dismissed. According to her professors, Samantha was an eccentric student, with a tendency to spend too much of her time reading outside the syllabus. But one of her tutors, who had published some verse himself, said that he had hopes she might make a fine poet one day, if she could cultivate a little more self-discipline in her technique. Samantha's interests, so Abhar Gupta said, included art, poetry, nature, Eastern religions, psychic experiences and death. Banks and Ken Blackstone drove out to the village of Tong to the Greyhound, a low-beamed rustic pub with Toby jugs all around the plate racks, about fifteen minutes from the crime scene. It was going on for two o'clock, and neither of them had eaten yet that day. Banks hadn't eaten much in the past two days, in fact. Ever since he had heard of the fifth missing teenager in the wee hours of Saturday morning. Over the past two months, he had sometimes thought his head would explode under pressure of the sheer amount of detail he carried around in it. He would awaken in the early hours of the morning, at three or four o'clock, and the thoughts would spin around his mind and prevent him from going back to sleep. Instead, he would get up and brew a pot of tea and sit at the pine kitchen table in his pyjamas, making notes for the day ahead as the sun came up and spilled its liquid honey light through the high window or rain lashed against the panes. These were lonely, quiet hours, and while he had got used to, even embraced, solitude, sometimes he missed his previous life with Sandra and the kids in the Eastvale semi. But Sandra was gone, about to marry Sean, and the kids had grown up and were living their own lives. Tracy was in her second year at the University of Leeds, and Brian was touring the country with his rock band, going from strength to strength after the great reviews their first independently produced CD had received. Banks had neglected them both, he realised, over the past couple of months, especially his daughter. They ordered pints of Tetley's Bitter and the last two portions of lamb stew and rice at the bar. It was warm enough to sit outside at one of the tables next to the cricket field. A local team was out practising, and the comforting sound of leather on willow punctuated their conversation. Banks lit a cigarette and told Blackstone about A.C. Hartnell, giving North Yorkshire the P.C. Taylor investigation, and his certainty that it would go to Annie. She'll love that, said Blackstone. She's already made her feelings quite clear. You've told her? I tried to put a positive spin on it to make her feel better, but it sort of backfired. Blackstone smiled. Are you two still an item? 
I think so, sort of, but half the time I'm not sure, to be honest. She's very elusive. Ah, the sweet mystery of woman. Something like that. Maybe you're expecting too much of her. What do you mean? I don't know. Sometimes when a man loses his wife, he starts looking for a new one in the first woman who shows any interest in him. Marriage is the last thing on my mind, Ken. If you say so, I do. I haven't bloody time for a start. Talking about marriage, how do you think the wife, Lucy Payne, fits in? Blackstone asked. I don't know. She must have known. I mean, she was living with the bloke. Maybe, but you saw the way things were set up back there. Payne could have sneaked anyone in through the garage and taken them straight into the cellar. If he kept the place locked and barred, nobody need have known. It was pretty well soundproofed. I'm sorry, but you can't convince me that a woman lives with a killer who does what Payne did and she hasn't a clue, said Blackstone. What does he do? Get up after dinner and tell her he's just off down to the basement to play with a teenage girl he's abducted. He doesn't have to tell her anything. But she must be involved. Even if she wasn't his accomplice, she must at least have suspected something. Someone gave the cricket ball a hell of a whack, and a cheer went up from the field. Banks stubbed out his cigarette. You're probably right. Anyway, if there's anything at all to connect Lucy Payne to what happened in the cellar, We'll find out. For the moment, she's not going anywhere. Unless we find out differently, we'd better remember that she's a victim first and foremost. The Soko teams might be spending weeks at the scene, Banks knew, and very soon number 35 The Hill would resemble a house undergoing major structural renovations. They would be taking in metal detectors, laser lights, infrared, UV high-powered vacuums and pneumatic drills. They would be collecting fingerprints, flaked skin, fibres, dried secretions, hairs, paint chips, visa bills, letters, books and personal papers. They would strip the carpets and punch holes in the walls, break up the cellar and garage floors and dig up the gardens. And everything they gathered, perhaps more than a thousand exhibits, would have to be tagged entered in homes and stored in the evidence room at Milgarth. Their meals arrived and they tucked right in, waving away the occasional fly. The stew was hearty and mildly spiced. After a few mouthfuls, Blackstone shook his head slowly. Funny pain's got no form, don't you think? Most of them have something odd in their background waving their willies at school kids or a touch of sexual assault. More than his job's worth. Maybe he's just been lucky. Blackstone paused. Or we've not been doing our jobs properly. Remember the series of rapes out Seacroft Way two years or so back? The Seacroft Rapist, yes, I remember reading about it. We never did catch him, you know. You think it might have been pain? Possible, isn't it? The rape stopped. Then girls started disappearing. DNA? Semen samples. The Seacroft rapist was an excreta, and he didn't bother wearing a condom. Then check them against pains, and check where he was living at the time. Oh, we will, we will. By the way, Blackstone went on, one of the DCs who interviewed Maggie Forrest, the woman who phoned in the domestic, got the impression that she wasn't telling him everything. Oh, what did he say? That she seemed deliberately vague, holding back. She admitted she knew the pains, but said she knew nothing about them. Anyway, he didn't think she was telling the complete truth as far as her relationship with Lucy Payne went. He thinks they're a lot closer than she would admit. I'll talk to her later, said Banks, glancing at his watch. He looked around at the blue sky the white and pink blossoms drifting from the trees, the men in white on the cricket pitch. Christ, can I could sit here all afternoon, he said. But I'd better get back to the house to check on developments. As she feared, Maggie was unable to concentrate on her work for the rest of that day, and alternated between watching the police activity out of her bedroom window and listening to the local radio for news reports. 
What came through was scant enough, until the area commander in charge of the case gave a press conference, in which he confirmed that they had found the body of Kimberly Myers, and that it appeared she had been strangled. More than that, he wouldn't say, except that the case was under investigation, forensic experts were on the scene, and more details would be available shortly. He stressed that the investigation was not yet over, and appealed for anyone who had seen Kimberly after eleven o'clock on Friday evening to come forward. When the knock on the door and the familiar call, It's all right, it's only me, came after half past three, Maggie felt relieved. For some reason, she had been worried about Claire. She knew that she went to the same school as Kimberly Myers, and that Terence Payne was a teacher there. She hadn't seen Claire since Kimberly's disappearance, but imagined she must have been frantic with worry. The two were about the same age and surely must know one another. Claire Toth often called on her way home from school, as she lived two doors down. Both her parents worked, and her mother didn't get home until about half-past four. Maggie also suspected that Ruth and Charles had suggested Claire's visits as a sneaky way of keeping an eye on her. Curious about the newcomer, Claire had first just dropped in to say hello. Then, intrigued by Maggie's accent and her work, she had become a regular visitor. Maggie didn't mind. Claire was a good kid and a breath of fresh air, though she talked a mile a minute, and Maggie often felt exhausted when she left. I don't think I've ever felt so awful, Claire said, dropping her backpack on the living room floor and plonking herself down on the sofa, legs akimbo. This was odd for a start, as she usually headed straight for the kitchen to the milk and chocolate chip cookies Maggie fed her. She pulled back her long tresses and tucked them behind her ears. She was wearing her school uniform, green blazer and skirt, white blouse and grey socks, which had slipped down around her ankles. She had a couple of spots on her chin, Maggie noticed. Bad diet or time of the month. You know, it was all around school by lunchtime. Do you know Mr. Payne? He's my biology teacher, and he lives across the street from us. How could he? The pervert. When I think of what must have been going through his mind while he was teaching us about reproductive systems and dissecting frogs and all that stuff, ugh! She gave a shudder. Claire, we don't know that he did anything yet. All we know is that Mr. and Mrs. Payne had a fight and that he hit her. But they've found Kim's body, haven't they? And there wouldn't be all those policemen over the road if all he'd done was hit his wife, would there? If all he'd done was hit his wife. Maggie was often amazed at the casual acceptance of domestic violence, even by a girl child such as Claire. True enough, she didn't mean it the way it sounded, and would be horrified if she knew the details of Maggie's life back in Toronto. But still, the language came so easily. Hit his wife. Minor. Not important. You're quite right, she said. It is more than that, but we don't know that Mr. Payne was responsible for what happened to Kimberly. Someone else might have done it. No, it's him. He's the one. He killed all those girls. He killed Kim. Claire started crying, and Maggie felt awkward. She found a box of tissues and went to sit next to her on the sofa. Claire buried her head in Maggie's shoulder and sobbed. Her thin veneer of teenage cool stripped away in a second. I'm sorry, she said, sniffling. I don't usually act like such a baby. What is it? Maggie asked, still stroking her hair. What is it, Claire? You can tell me. You were her friend, weren't you? Kim's. Claire's lip trembled. I just feel so awful. I can understand that. But you don't, you can't, don't you see? See what? That it was my fault. It was my fault that Kim got killed. I should have been with her on Friday. I should have been with her. And when Claire buried her face in Maggie's shoulder again, there came a loud knock at the door. D.I. Annie Cabot sat at her desk, still cursing Banks under her breath, 
and wishing she had never accepted the appointment to complaints and discipline, even though it had been the only divisional opening available for her at the level of inspector after passing her boards. Of course, she could have stayed in CID as a detective sergeant, or gone back to uniform for a while as an inspector in traffic. But she had decided that C and D would be a worthwhile temporary step up, until a suitable position became available in CID, which Banks had assured her wouldn't be long. The Western Division was still undergoing some structural reorganisation, part of which involved staffing levels, and for the moment CID was taking a back seat to more visible, on-the-street and in-your-face policing. But their day would come. This way, at least, she would gain experience at the rank of inspector. The one good thing about the new appointment was her office. Western Division had taken over the building adjoining the old Tudor-fronted headquarters, part of the same structure, knocked through the walls and redone the interior. While Annie didn't have a large room to herself like Detective Superintendent Chambers, she did have a partitioned space in the general area, which gave her some degree of privacy, and looked out over the marketplace like Banks's office. Beyond her frosted glass compartment sat the two detective sergeants and three constables, who, along with Annie and Chambers, made up the entire Western Division Complaints and Discipline Department. After all, Police corruption was hardly a hot issue around Eastvale, and about the most serious case she had worked on so far was that of a beat policeman accepting free toasted tea cakes from the Golden Grill. It turned out that he had been going out with one of the waitresses there, and she was finding the way to his heart. Another waitress had become jealous and reported the matter to complaints and discipline. It probably wasn't fair to blame Banks, Annie thought standing at the window and looking down on the busy square, and perhaps she was only doing so because of the vague dissatisfaction with their relationship that she was already feeling. She didn't know what it was or why, only that she was beginning to feel a little uncomfortable with it. They hadn't seen one another that often because of the chameleon case, of course, and Banks had sometimes been so tired that he'd fallen asleep even before. But it wasn't that that bothered her so much as the easy familiarity their relationship seemed to be attaining. When they were together, they were behaving more and more like an old married couple, and Annie, for one, didn't want that. Ironic as it seemed, the comfort and familiarity were making her feel distinctly uncomfortable. All they needed was the slippers and the fireplace. Come to think of it, in Banks's cottage they even had those too. Annie's phone rang. It was Detective Superintendent Chambers summoning her to his office next door. She knocked and went in when he said enter, the way he liked it. Chambers sat behind his messy desk. A big man with the waistcoat buttons of his pinstripe suit stretched tight across his chest and belly. She didn't know if his tie was covered with food stains, or if it was supposed to look that way. He had the kind of face that seemed to be wearing a perpetual sneer, and small piggy eyes that Annie felt undress her as she walked in. His complexion resembled a slab of rare beef, and his lips were fleshy, wet and red. Annie always half expected him to start drooling and slobbering as he spoke, but he hadn't done it yet. Not one drop of saliva had found its way onto his green blotter. He had a home county's accent, which he seemed to think made him posh. Ah, D.I. Cabber, please be seated, sir. Annie sat as comfortably as she could, careful to make certain that her skirt didn't ride too high over her thighs. If she had known before she left for work that she was going to be summoned to see Chambers, she would have worn trousers. I've just been handed a most interesting assignment, Chambers went on. Most interesting indeed. One that I think will be right up your alley, as they say. Annie had the advantage over him, but didn't want to let it show. Assignment, sir? Yes. It's about time you started pulling your weight around here, D.I. Cabot. How long have you been with us now? Two months. And in that time you've accomplished... The case of Constable Chaplin, 
and the toasted tea cake, sir. Scandal narrowly averted. A satisfactory resolution all round, if I might say so. Chambers reddened. Yes, well, this one might just take the edge off your attitude, Inspector. Sir? Annie raised her eyebrows. She couldn't stop herself baiting Chambers. He had the kind of arrogant, self-important bearing that cried out for pricking. She knew it could be bad for her career, but even with the rekindling of her ambition, Annie had sworn to herself that her career wasn't worth anything if it cost her her soul. Besides, she had an odd sort of faith that good coppers, like Banks, Detective Superintendent Gristhorpe and A.C.C. McLaughlin, might have more say in her future than pillocks like Chambers, who, everyone knew, was a lazy slob just waiting for retirement. Still, she hadn't been a lot more careful with Banks at first, either, and it was only her good fortune that he had been charmed and seduced by her insubordination rather than angered by it. Grizz thought poor man was a saint, and she hardly ever saw Red Ron McLaughlin, so she didn't get a chance to piss him off. Yes, Chambers went on, warming to his task. I think you'll find this one a bit different from toasted tea cakes. This'll wipe the grin off your face. Perhaps you'd care to tell me about it, sir. Chambers tossed a thin folder towards her. It slipped off the edge of the desk onto Annie's knees and then to the floor before she could catch it. She didn't want to bend over and pick it up so that Chambers could have a bird's-eye view of her knickers, so she left it where it was. Chambers's eyes narrowed, and they stared at one another for a few seconds, but finally he eased himself out of his chair and picked it up himself. The effort made his face red. He slammed the file down harder on the desk in front of her. Seems a probationary PC in West Yorkshire has overdone it a bit with her bat on and they want us to look into it. Trouble is, the chappie she overdid it with is suspected to be that chameleon killer they've been after for a while, which, even you will realise, puts a different complexion on things. He tapped the folder. The details, such as they are at the moment, are all in there. Do you think you can handle it? No problem, said Annie. On the contrary, said Chambers. I think there'll be plenty of problems. It'll be what they call a high-profile case, and because of that, my name will be on it. I'm sure you understand that we can't have a mere inspector still wet behind the ears running a case of this importance. If that's the case, said Annie, why don't you investigate it yourself? Because I happen to be too busy at the moment, said Chambers, with a twisted grin. Besides, why own a dog and bark yourself? Absolutely, why indeed, of course, said Annie, who happened to know that Chambers couldn't investigate his way out of a paper bag. I understand completely. I thought you would. Chambers stroked one of his chins. And as my name's on it, I want no cock-ups. In fact, if any heads roll over this business, yours will be the first. Remember, I'm only a hair's breadth away from retirement, so the last thing on my mind is career advancement. You, on the other hand, well, I'm sure you catch my drift. Annie nodded. You'll be reporting to me directly, of course, Chambers went on. Daily reports required, except in the event of any major developments, in which case you're to report to me immediately, understood. I wouldn't have it any other way, said Annie. Chambers narrowed his eyes at her. One day that mouth of yours will get you into serious trouble, young lady. So my father told me. Chambers grunted and shifted his weight in his chair. There's one more thing. Yes? I don't like the way this assignment was delivered to me. There's something fishy about it. What do you mean, sir? I don't know. Chambers frowned. Acting Detective Superintendent Banks and the CID is running our part of the chameleon investigation, isn't he? Annie nodded. And if my memory serves me well, you used to work with him as a DS before coming here, didn't you? Again, Annie nodded. Well, it might be nothing, said Chambers, looking away from her, at a point high on the wall. 
summit and nout, as they say up here. But on the other hand... Sir? Keep an eye on him. Play your cards close to your chest. He looked at her chest as he spoke, and Annie gave an involuntary shudder. She stood up and walked over to the door. And another thing, D.I. Cabot. Annie turned. Sir? Chambers smirked. This Banks, watch out for him. He's got the reputation for being a bit of a ladies' man, in case you don't know that already. Annie felt herself flush as she left the office. Banks followed Maggie Forrest into the living room. With its dark wainscoting and brooding landscapes in heavy gilt frames on the walls. The room faced west, and the late afternoon sun cast dancing shadows of twisted foliage on the far walls. It was not a feminine room, but more like the kind to which the men withdrew for port and cigars in BBC period dramas. And Banks sensed that Maggie was uncomfortable in it, though he wasn't quite certain what gave him that impression. Noticing a whiff of smoke in the air and a couple of cigarette ends in the ashtray, Banks lit up, offering Maggie a silk cut. She accepted. He looked at the schoolgirl on the sofa, head lowered, bare knees close together, one of them scabbed from a recent fall, thumb in her mouth. Aren't you going to introduce us? he asked Maggie. Detective Banks, acting detective superintendent. Detective Superintendent Banks, this is Claire Toth, a neighbor. Pleased to meet you, Claire, said Banks. Claire looked up at him and mumbled hello. Then she took a crumpled packet of ten embassy regal from her blazer pocket and joined the adult smokers. Banks knew this was no time for lectures on the dangers of smoking. Something was clearly wrong. He could see by her red eyes and the streaks on her face that she had been crying. I've missed something, he said. Anyone care to fill me in? Claire went to school with Kimberly Myers, said Maggie. Naturally, she's upset. Claire grew edgy, her eyes flitting all over the place. She took short, nervous puffs on the cigarette, holding it affectedly, straight out with her first two fingers vertical, letting go as she puffed, then closing her fingers. She didn't seem to be inhaling, just doing it to look and act grown up, Banks thought. Or perhaps even to feel grown up. Because only God knew what turbulent feelings must be churning inside Claire right now. And it would only get worse. He remembered Tracy's reaction to the murder of an Eastvale girl, Deborah Harrison, just a few years ago. They hadn't even known each other well, had come from differing social backgrounds. But they were about the same age, and they had met and talked on several occasions. Banks had tried to protect Tracy from the truth for as long as he could, but in the end the best he could do was comfort her. She was lucky. She got over it in time. Some never do. Kim was my best friend, Claire said, and I let her down. What makes you think that? Banks asked. Claire flicked her eyes towards Maggie, as if seeking permission. Maggie nodded almost imperceptibly. She was an attractive woman, Banks noticed. Not so much physically, with a slightly long nose and pointed chin, though he also admired her elfin looks and her trim boyish figure, but it was the air of kindness and intelligence about her that struck him. He could see it in her eyes. And there was an artist's grace in the economy of her simplest movements, such as flicking ash from her cigarette in her large hands with the long, tapered fingers. I should have been with her, Claire said, but I wasn't. Were you at the dance? Banks asked. Claire nodded and bit her lip. Did you see Kimberly there? Kim. I always called her Kim. All right, Kim. Did you see Kim there? We went together. It's not far. Just up past the roundabout on a long town street near the rugby ground. I know where you mean, said Banks. Silver Hill Comprehensive, right? Yes. So you went to the dance together? Yes, we walked up there and... and... Take your time, said Banks, noticing she was about to cry again. Claire took a final puff at a cigarette and stubbed it out. She didn't do a good job, 
and the ashes continued to smolder. She sniffled. We were going to walk home together. I mean, people had said, you know, it was on the radio and television and my father had told me. We had to be careful, stick together. Banks had been responsible for the warnings. There was a fine line between panic and caution, he knew. And while he wanted to avert the kind of widespread paranoia that the Yorkshire Ripper case had whipped up for years in the early 80s, he also wanted to make it clear that young women should be cautious after dark. But short of instituting a curfew, you can't force people to be careful. What happened, Claire? Did you lose sight of her? No, it wasn't that. I mean, not really. You don't understand. Help us to understand, Claire, said Maggie, holding her hand. We want to. Help us. I should have been with her. Why weren't you? Banks asked. Did you have an argument? Claire paused and looked away. It was a boy, she said finally. Kim was with a boy. No, me. I was with a boy. Tears streamed down her cheeks, but she pressed on. Nicky Gallagher, I'd fancied him for weeks and he asked me to dance. Then he said he wanted to walk me home. Kim wanted to leave just before eleven. She had a curfew and normally I'd have gone with her, but Nicky, he wanted to stay for a slow dance. I thought there would be lots of people around. I... Then she broke down in tears again and buried her head in Maggie's shoulder. Banks took a deep breath. Claire's pain and guilt and grief were so real they broke over him in waves and made his breath catch in his chest. Maggie stroked her hair and muttered words of comfort, but still Claire let it all pour out. Finally she came to the end of her tears and blew her nose in a tissue. I'm sorry, she said. Really, I am. I'd give anything to live that night over again and do it differently. I hate Nicky Gallagher. Claire, said Banks, who was no stranger to guilt himself. It's not his fault, and it's certainly not yours. I'm a selfish bitch. I had Nicky to walk me home. I thought he might kiss me. I wanted him to kiss me, see? Oh, I'm a slut, too. Don't be silly, said Maggie. The superintendent is right. It's not your fault. But if I'd only... If, 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 said Banks. But it's true. Kim had no one, so she had to walk home by herself, and Mr. Payne got her. I bet he did awful things to her before he killed her, didn't he? I've read about people like him. Whatever happened that night, said Banks, it's not your fault. And whose fault is it? Nobody's. Kim was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It could have been... Banks stopped. Not a good idea. He hoped Claire hadn't picked up on the implication, but she had. Me? Yes, I know that. I wish it had been. You don't mean that, Claire, said Maggie. Yes, I do. Then I wouldn't have to live with it. It was because of me. Because she didn't want to be a gooseberry. Claire started crying again. Banks wondered if it could have been Claire. She was the right type blonde and long-legged, as so many young northern girls were. Was it as random as that? Or had Payne had his eyes on Kimberly Myers all along? Jenny might have some theories on that. He tried to picture what had happened. Payne parked in his car, near the school perhaps, knowing there was a dance on that night, knowing the one he'd had his eye on would be there. He couldn't count on her going home alone, of course, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. There was always a chance. A risk, of course. But it would have been worth it to him. His heart's desire. All the others were practice. This was the real thing. The one he had wanted right from the start. There at school, under his very eyes, tormenting him day after day. Terence Payne would also have known, as Banks did, that Kimberly lived about two hundred yards further down the hill than her friend Claire Toth, under the railway bridge, and that there was a dark, desolate stretch of road there, nothing but a wasteland on one side and a Wesleyan chapel on the other, which would have been in darkness at that hour. 
Wesleyans not being noted for their wild late-night parties. When Banks had walked down there on Saturday afternoon, the day after Kimberley had disappeared, following the route she would have taken home from the dance, he had thought it would have made an ideal pick-up place. Payne would have parked his car a little ahead of Kimberley, and either jumped her or said hello, the familiar, safe Mr. Payne from school, somehow manoeuvred her inside, then chloroformed her, and taken her back through the garage to the cellar. Perhaps Banks realised now Payne couldn't believe his luck when Kimberly started walking home alone. He would have expected her to be with her friend Claire, if not with others, and could only hope that the others would live closer to the school than Kimberly did, and that she would end up alone for that final, short but desolate stretch. But with her being alone right from the start, if he was careful and made sure that nobody could see, he could even have offered her a lift. She trusted him. Perhaps he had even, being the good, kind neighbour, given her a lift before. Get in the van, Kimberly. You know it's not safe for a girl your age to be walking the streets alone at this hour. I'll take you home. Yes, Mr. Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. You're lucky I happened by. Yes, sir. Now, fasten your seatbelt. Superintendent. I'm sorry, said Banks, who had been lost in his imaginings. Is it all right if Claire goes home? Her mother should be back by now. Banks looked at the child. Her world had shattered into pieces around her. All weekend she must have been terrified that something like this had happened, dreading the moment when the shadow of her guilt was made substance, when her nightmares proved to be reality. There was no reason to keep her here. Let her go to her mother. He knew where she was if he needed to talk to her again. Just one more thing, Claire, he said. Did he see Mr. Payne at all on the evening of the dance? No. He wasn't at the dance. No. He wasn't parked outside the school. Not that I saw. Did he notice anyone at all hanging around? No. But I wasn't really looking. Did you see Mrs. Payne at all? Mrs. Payne? No. Why? All right, Claire. You can go home now. Is there any more news of Lucy? Maggie asked after Claire had left. She's comfortable. She'll be fine. You wanted to see me? Yes, said Banks. Just a few loose ends from this morning's interview, that's all. Oh? Maggie fingered the neck of her T-shirt. Nothing important, I shouldn't think. What is it? One of the officers who interviewed you gave me the impression that he thought you weren't telling the full story about your relationship with Lucy Payne. Maggie raised her eyebrows. I see. Would you describe the two of you as close friends? Friends, yes, but close, no. I haven't known Lucy long. When did you last see her? Yesterday. She dropped by in the afternoon. What did you talk about? Maggie looked down at her hands on her lap. Nothing, really. You know, the weather, work, that sort of thing. Kimberly Myers was tied up naked in the cellar of the Payne house, and Lucy had dropped by to talk about the weather. Either she really was innocent, or her evil went way beyond anything Banks had experienced before. Did she ever give you any cause to suspect that anything was wrong at home? he asked. Maggie paused. Not in the way you're suggesting, no. What way am I suggesting? I assume it's to do with the murder, with Kimberly's murder. Banks leaned back in his armchair and sighed. It had been a long day, and it was getting longer. Maggie wasn't a convincing liar. Miss Forrest, he said, right now anything at all we can find out about life at number 35 The Hill would be useful to us, and I mean anything. I'm getting the same impression as my colleague that you're keeping something back. It's nothing relevant. How the hell would you know? Banks snapped at her. He was shocked by the way she flinched at his harsh tone, at the look of fear and submission that crossed her features, and the way she wrapped her arms around herself and drew in. Miss Forrest, Maggie, he said more softly. Look, I'm sorry, but I've had a bad day. 
and this is becoming very frustrating. If I had a penny for every time someone told me their information was irrelevant to my investigation, I'd be a rich man. I know we all have secrets. I know there are some things we'd rather not talk about. But this is a murder investigation. Kimberly Myers is dead. PC Dennis Morrissey is dead. God knows how many more bodies we'll unearth there. And I have to sit here and listen to you tell me that you know Lucy Payne and that she may have shared certain feelings and information with you and that you don't think it's relevant. Come on, Maggie, give me a break here. The silence seemed to go on for ages until Maggie's small voice broke it. She was being abused, Lucy. He, uh, her husband. He hit her. Terence Payne abused his wife. Yes, is that so strange? If he can murder teenage girls, he's certainly capable of beating his wife. She told you this? Yes. Why didn't she do something about it? It's not as easy as you think. I'm not saying it's easy. And don't assume that you know what I think. What did you advise her? I told her to seek professional help, of course, but she was dragging her heels. Banks knew enough about domestic violence to know that its victims often find it very difficult to go to the authorities or get out. They feel shame, feel it's their own fault, feel humiliated, and would rather keep it to themselves, believing it will turn out all right in the end. Many of them have nowhere else to go, no other lives to live, and they are scared of the world outside the home, even if the home is violent. He also got the impression that Maggie Forrest knew firsthand what she was talking about. The way she had flinched at his sharp tone. The way she had been so reluctant to talk about the subject, holding back. These were all signs. Did she ever mention that she suspected her husband of any other crimes? Never. But she was frightened of him. Yes. Did you visit their house? Yes, sometimes. Notice anything unusual? No. Nothing. How did the two of them behave together? Lucy always seemed nervous, edgy, anxious to please. Did you ever see any bruises? They don't always leave bruises. But Lucy seemed afraid of him, afraid of putting a foot wrong. That's what I mean. Banks made some notes. Is that all? he asked. What do you mean? Is that all you were holding back? Or is there something else? There's nothing else. Banks stood up and excused himself. Do you see now, he said at the door, that what you've told me is relevant, after all. Very relevant. I don't see how. Terence Payne has serious brain injuries. He's in a coma, from which he may never recover, and even if he does, he might remember nothing. Lucy Payne will mend quite easily. You're the first person who's given us any information at all about her, and it's information from which she could benefit. How? There are only two questions as regards Lucy Payne. First, was she involved? And second, did she know and keep quiet about it? What you've just told me is the first thing that tips the scales in her favour. By talking to me, you've done your friend a service. Good evening, Miss Forrest. I'll make sure there's an officer keeping an eye on the place. Why do you think I'm in danger? You said Terry. Not that sort of danger. The press. They can be very persistent. And I wouldn't want you telling them what you've just told me. Chapter 5 Leanne Ray was sixteen when she disappeared from Eastvale on Friday, 31st of March. She was five feet two inches tall, weighed just six stone twelve, and was an only child living with her father, Christopher Ray, a bus driver, and her stepmother, Victoria, who stayed home in a terrace house just north of Eastvale town centre. Leanne was a pupil at Eastvale Comprehensive. Leanne's parents later told police 
that they saw nothing wrong in letting their daughter go to the pictures that Friday night, even though they had heard of the disappearances of Kelly Matthews and Samantha Foster. After all, she was going with her friends, and they said she had to be home by half-past ten at the latest. The one thing Christopher and Victoria might have objected to, had they known about it, was the presence in the group of Ian Scott. Christopher and Victoria didn't like Leanne hanging around with Ian. For one thing, he was two years older than she was, and that meant a lot at her age. For another, Ian had a reputation as a bit of a troublemaker, and had even been arrested twice by the police, once for taking and driving away and once for selling ecstasy in the Bar Nun. Also, Leanne was a very pretty girl, slim and shapely, with beautiful golden blonde hair, an almost translucent complexion, and long-lashed blue eyes, and they thought an older boy like Ian could be interested in her for only one thing. That he had his own flat was another black mark against him. But Leanne just liked to hang out with Ian's crowd. Ian's girlfriend, also with them that night, was Sarah Francis, aged 17, and the fourth in the party was Mick Blair, aged 18, just a friend. They all said they had walked around the centre for a while after the film, then gone for a coffee at the El Toro, though the police discovered on further investigation that they had actually been drinking in the old ship inn, in an alley between North Market Street and York Road, and lied about it because both Leanne and Sarah were under age. When pressed, they all said that Leanne had left them just outside the pub and headed home on foot at about a quarter past ten, a journey that should have taken her no more than ten minutes. But she never arrived. Leanne's parents, though angry and worried, gave her until morning before calling the police, and an investigation headed by Banks soon went into full swing. Eastvale was papered with posters of Leanne. Everyone who had been at the cinema and in the old ship inn and in the town centre that evening was questioned. Nothing. They even ran a reconstruction, but nothing came of it. Leanne Ray had vanished into thin air. Not one person reported seeing her since she left the old ship. Her three friends said they went to another pub, the Riverboat, a crowded place that stayed open late and ended up at the Bar Nun on the Market Square. The closed-circuit TV cameras showed them turning up there at about half-past twelve. Ian Scott's flat was given the full Socco treatment to see if any evidence of Leanne's presence could be found there, but there was nothing. If she had been there, she had left no trace. There were hints of tension in the Ray home, Banks soon discovered, and according to a school friend, Jill Brown, Leanne didn't get on well with her stepmother. They argued a lot. She missed her real mother, who had died of cancer two years ago, and Leanne had told her friend that she thought Victoria ought to go out and get a job instead of sponging off her dad, who didn't make a lot of money anyway. Things were always a bit tough financially, Jill said, and Leanne had to wear sturdier clothes than she thought fashionable and make them last longer than she would have wished. When she was sixteen, she got a Saturday job in a town centre boutique, so she was able to buy nice clothes at a discount. There was, then, the faintest hope that Leanne had run away from a difficult situation and somehow hadn't heard the appeals. Until her shoulder bag was found in the shrubbery of a garden, she would have passed on her route home. The owners of the house were questioned, but they turned out to be a retired couple in their seventies, and was soon exonerated. After the third day, Banks contacted his assistant chief constable, Ron McLaughlin, and discussions with Area Commander Philip Hartnell of West Yorkshire Police followed. Within days, the Chameleon Task Force was created, and Banks was put in charge of North Yorkshire's part. It meant more resources, more man hours, and more concentrated effort. It also meant, sadly, that they believed a serial killer was at work and this was something the newspapers lost no time in speculating about. Leanne was an average pupil, so her teachers said. 
she could probably do better if she tried harder, but she didn't want to make the effort. She intended to leave school at the end of the year and get a job, maybe in a clothes shop or a music shop like Virgin or HMV. She loved pop music, and her favourite group was Oasis, no matter what people said about them. Leanne was a loyal fan. Her friends thought Leanne a rather shy but easy-going person, quick to laugh at people's jokes, and not given much to introspection. She also suffered from mild asthma and carried an inhaler, which had been found, along with the rest of her personal things, in the abandoned shoulder bag. If the second victim, Samantha Foster, was a little eccentric, Leanne Ray was about as ordinary a lower-middle-class Yorkshire lass as you could get. Yeah, I'm all right to talk to, sir, really. Come on in. PC Janet Taylor didn't look all right to Banks when he called at her flat after six that evening. But then anyone who had that morning both fought off a serial killer and cradled her dying partner's head on her lap, had every right to look a bit peaky. Janet was pale and drawn, and the fact that she was dressed all in black only served to accentuate her pallor. Janet's flat was above a hairdresser's on Harrogate Road, not far from the airport. Banks could smell the setting lotion and herbal shampoo inside the ground-floor doorway. He followed her up the narrow staircase. She moved listlessly, dragging her feet. Banks felt almost as weary as Janet seemed. He had just attended Kimberly Myers post-mortem, and while it had yielded no surprises, death by ligature strangulation, Dr. Mackenzie had found traces of semen in the vagina, anus, and mouth. With any luck, DNA would link that to Terence Payne. Janet Taylor's living room showed signs of neglect typical to a single police officer's dwelling. Banks recognised it all too well. He tried to keep his own cottage clean as best he could, but it was difficult sometimes when you couldn't afford a cleaning lady, and you didn't have time yourself. When you did have a bit of free time, the last thing you wanted to do was housework. Still, the small room was cosy enough, despite the patina of dust on the low table, and the T-shirt and bra slung over the back of the armchair, the magazines and occasional unwashed teacups. There were three framed posters of old bogey movies on the walls, Casablanca, The Maltese Falcon, and The African Queen, and some photos on the mantelpiece, including one of Janet looking proud in her uniform, standing between an older couple Banks took to be her mother and father. The potted plant on the windowsill looked to be on its last legs, wilting and brown around the edges of the leaves. A television set flickered in one corner, the sound turned down. It was a local news programme, and Banks recognised the scene around the Payne house. Janet moved the T-shirt and bra from the back of the armchair. Sit down, sir. Can we have the sound on for a minute? Banks asked. Who knows? Maybe we'll learn something. Sure. Janet turned the volume up but all they got was a repeat of A.C. Hartnell's earlier press statement. When it was over, Janet got up and turned off the TV. She still seemed slow in her movements, slurred in her speech, and Banks imagined it was something to do with the tranquilizers the doctor would have given her. Or maybe it was the half-empty bottle of gin on the sideboard. A plane took off from Leeds and Bradford Airport, and while the noise didn't actually shake the flat, it was enough to rattle a glass and make conversation impossible for a minute or so. It was also hot in the small room, and Banks felt the sweat gather on his forehead and under his arms. It's why the place is so cheap, Janet said after the noise had waned to a distant drone. I don't mind it that much. You get used to it. Sometimes I sit here, and imagine I'm up there in one of them flying off to some exotic country. She got up and poured herself a small gin, adding some tonic from an open bottle of Schweppes. Fancy a drink, sir? No, thanks. 
How are you coping? Janet sat down again and shook her head. The funny thing is, I don't really know. I'm all right, I suppose, but I feel sort of numb. As if I've just come round from an anaesthetic and I'm still all padded in cotton wool. Or like I'm in a dream and I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and everything will be different. It won't, though, will it? Probably not, said Banks. It might even be worse. Janet laughed. Well, thanks for not giving me a load of bollocks. Banks smiled. My pleasure. Look, I'm not here to question your actions, but I need to know what happened in that house. Do you feel up to talking about it? Sure. Banks noticed her body language, the way she crossed her arms and seemed to draw in on herself and guessed that she wasn't up to it, but he had to press on nonetheless. I felt like a criminal, you know, she said. What do you mean? The way the doctor examined me, bagged my clothes scraped under my fingernails. It's routine, you know it is. I know, I know. That's not what it feels like on the receiving end, though. I suppose not. Look, I'm not going to lie to you, Janet. This could be a serious problem. It could be over in no time at all, a minor bump in the road. But it could stick around, cause you problems with your career. I think that's pretty much over, don't you, sir? Not necessarily. Not unless you want it to be. I must admit I haven't given it a lot of thought since, you know. She gave a harsh laugh. Funny thing is, if this was America, I'd be a hero. What happened when you first received the call? Janet told him about the car fire and the call, and finding Lucy Payne unconscious in the hallway, in short, halting sentences, occasionally pausing for a sip of gin and tonic, once or twice losing her thread and staring towards the open window. Sounds of evening traffic came up from the busy road, and occasionally a plane landed or took off. Did you think she was seriously hurt? Serious enough, not life-threatening. But I stayed with her while Dennis checked around upstairs. He came back with a blanket and a pillow. I remember that. I thought that was nice of him. It surprised me. Dennis wasn't always nice. It's not a word I'd use to describe him, no. We disagreed a lot, but I suppose we got on okay. He's all right, just a bit of a Neanderthal. And full of himself. What did you do next? Dennis went in the back, the kitchen. I mean, someone had hit her, and if it was her husband, the odds were he was still in the house somewhere, right? Probably feeling sorry for himself. You stayed with Lucy? Yes. Then what happened? Dennis called me, so I left her. She was as comfortable as I could make her with the blanket and the pillow. The bleeding had pretty much stopped. I didn't think she was in any real danger. The ambulance was on its way. You didn't sense any danger in the house? Danger? No. Not at all. I mean, no more than you do in any domestic. They can turn on you. It's happened, but no. OK. What made you go down to the cellar? Did you think her husband might be there? Yes, I suppose we must have. Why did Dennis call you? Janet paused, clearly embarrassed. Janet? Finally, she looked at him. You've been there, down the cellar? Yes. That picture on the door, the woman. I saw it. Dennis called me to see it. It was his idea of a joke. That's what I mean, Neanderthal. I see. Was the door open, the door to the cellar? No, it was closed. But there was light showing under it, a sort of flickering light. You didn't hear anyone in there? No. Did either of you call out before you went in? 
identifying yourselves as police officers? I don't remember. OK, Janet, you're doing fine. Carry on. Janet's knees were pressed tight together, and she was twisting her hands on her lap as she spoke. Like I said, there was this flickering light, the candles. Janet looked at him and gave a little shudder. There was a bad smell, too. Like drains. Did you have any reason to be afraid at this point? Not particularly. It was creepy, but we were proceeding cautiously, as we always do in such situations. Routine. He could have been armed, the husband. We were aware of that possibility. But if you mean did we have any inkling of what we'd find in there, then no. If we had, we'd have been out of there like a shot and brought in the troops. Dennis and me were neither of us the hero types. She shook her head. Who went in first? I did. Dennis kicked the door in and stood back like, you know, making a bow. Checking the piss. What happened next? She gave a sharp jerk of her head. It was all so fast, it was a blur. I remember candles, mirrors, the girl, crude drawings on the walls, things I saw out of the corners of my eyes. But they're like images from a dream, a nightmare. Her breathing became sharper, and she curled up on the armchair, legs under her, arms wrapped around herself. Then he came in. Dennis was right behind me. I could feel his breath warm on my neck. Where did he come from? I don't know. Behind a corner. So fast. What did Dennis do? He didn't have time to do anything. He must have heard or sent something to make him turn. And the next thing I knew, he was bleeding. He screamed out. That's when I pulled my bat on. He cut Dennis again, and the blood sprayed over me. It was as if he hadn't noticed me or he didn't care. He'd get to me later. But when he did, I had my baton out and he tried to slash me, but I deflected it. Then I hit him. She started to sob and rubbed the backs of her hands against her eyes. Sorry, Dennis, I'm so sorry. It's all right, Banks said. Take it easy, Janet, you're doing fine. He had his head on my lap. I was trying to hold the artery closed like, to teach you in first aid, but I couldn't do it. I'd never done it before, not with anyone real. The blood just kept seeping out. So much blood. She sniffed and ran the back of her hand across her nose. Sorry. That's okay, you're doing fine, Janet. Before that, before you tried to save Dennis, what else did you do? I remember handcuffing the man to one of the pipes. How many times did you hit him? I don't remember. More than once? Yes. He wouldn't stop coming, so I hit him again. And again? Yes. He kept getting up. She started sobbing again. When she had calmed, she asked, Is he dead? Not yet. The bastard killed Dennis. I know. And when a man's partner is killed, he's supposed to do something about it, right? If you don't, it's bad for business. Bad for detectives everywhere. Janet looked at him as if he were crazy. What? Banks looked up at Bogart as Sam Spade. Clearly the posters were there for show, not as a result of any great passion for the films themselves, and his pathetic attempt at lightening things up fell flat. Never mind, he said. I was just wondering what went through your mind. Nothing. I didn't have time to stop and think. He had cut Dennis, and he was going to cut me. Call it self-preservation, if you like, but it wasn't a conscious thought. I mean, I didn't think I'd better hit him again, or he might get up and cut me. It wasn't like that. What was it like? Told you a blur. I disabled the killer handcuffed him to one of the pipes, and then I tried to keep Dennis alive. I didn't even look in Payne's direction again. 
To be honest, I didn't give a damn what shape it was in. Only Dennis. Janet paused and looked down at her hands, clasped around the glass. You know what really gets me? I'd just be nasty to him. All because he'd been telling his damn sexist jokes to that fireman. What do you mean? We'd been arguing, that's all. Just before we got to the house. I told him his mole was probably cancerous. It was cruel of me. I know he's a hypochondriac. Why did I do that? Why am I such a horrible person? Then it was too late. I couldn't tell him. I didn't mean it. She cried again, and Banks thought it best to let her get it all out. It would take more than one tearful session to purge her of her guilt, but at least it was a start. Have you been in touch with the Federation? Not yet. Do it tomorrow. Talk to your rep. They'll be able to help with counselling, if you want it, and legal representation. If it comes to that, yes. Janet got to her feet a bit more unsteadily and went to pour herself another drink. Are you sure that's wise? Banks asked. Janet poured herself a stiff measure and sat down again. Tell me what else I should be doing, sir. Should I be going to sit with Dennis's wife and kids? Should I try to explain to them how it happened, how it was all my fault? Or should I just smash up my flat and go out on the town and pick a fight in some anonymous pub somewhere, the way I feel like doing? I don't think so. This is by far the least harmful alternative to anything else I'd rather be doing right now. Banks realised that she had a point. He had felt that way himself more than once, and had even given in to the urge to go out on the town and pick a fight. It hadn't helped. He would be a hypocrite if he said he didn't understand plenty about finding oblivion at the bottom of a bottle. There had been two periods in his life when he had sought solace that way. The first was when he felt he was fast approaching burnout those last few months in London, before the transfer to Eastvale, and the second was more than a year ago, after Sandra had left him. The thing was, people said it didn't work, but it did, as a short-term solution for temporary oblivion. There was nothing to match the bottle, except perhaps heroin, which Banks hadn't tried. Maybe Janet Taylor was right, and tonight drinking was the best thing she could do. She was hurting, and sometimes you had to do your hurting by yourself. Booze helped dull the pain for a while, and eventually you passed out. The hangover would be painful, but that was for tomorrow. Right you are. I'll let myself out. On impulse, Banks leaned over and kissed the top of Janet's head as he left. Her hair tasted of burnt plastic and rubber. That evening, Jenny Fuller sat in her home office, where she kept all the files and notes on the investigation on her computer, no office having been made available to her at Milgarth. The office looked out over the green, a narrow stretch of parkland between her street and the east side estate. She could just see the lights of the houses through the spaces between the dark trees. Working so closely with Banks had made Jenny remember a lot of their history. She had once tried to seduce him, she recalled with embarrassment, and he had resisted politely, claiming to be a happily married man. But he was attracted to her, she knew that much. He wasn't a happily married man any more, but now he had the girlfriend, as Jenny had come to call Annie Cabot, though she had never met her. That had come about because Jenny had spent so much time out of the country and hadn't even been around when Banks and Sandra separated. If she had been, well, things might have been different. Instead, she had embarked on a series of disastrous relationships. 
one of the reasons she had spent so much time away. She had finally admitted to herself, after coming back from California this last time with her tail between her legs, was to get away from Banks. From the easy proximity to him that tormented her so much while she pretended to be casual about the whole thing, and much cooler than she felt. And now they were working closely together. With a sigh, Jenny returned her attention to her work. Her main problem thus far, she realized, had been an almost complete lack of forensic and crime scene information. And without them, it was damn near impossible to produce a decent threshold analysis, an initial review that could serve as an investigative compass, help the police know where to look, let alone a more complex profile. About all she had been able to work on was the victimology. All this, of course, had given her detractors on the task force, and they were legion, plenty of ammunition. England was still in the Dark Ages as far as the use of consultant psychologists and criminal profiling went, Jenny believed, especially as compared to the USA. Partly, this was because the FBI is a national force, with the resources to develop national programs, and Britain has fifty or more separate police forces all operating piecemeal. Also, profilers in the USA tend to be cops and are therefore more readily accepted. In Britain, profilers are usually psychologists or psychiatrists, and as such, are distrusted by the police and the legal system in general. Consultant psychologists would be lucky to make it to the witness box in an English court, Jenny knew, let alone be accepted as expert witnesses, the way they are in the USA. Even if they did get in the box, whatever evidence they gave would be looked at askance by judge and jury, and the defense would wheel in another psychologist with a different theory, the Dark Ages. When it came right down to it, Jenny was well aware that most of the police she worked with regarded her as perhaps only one step up from a clairvoyant, if that, and that they only brought her in because it was easier than not doing so. But she struggled on. While she was prepared to admit that profiling was still perhaps more of an art than a science, and while a profile could rarely, if ever, point the finger at a specific killer, she believed that it could narrow the field and help focus an investigation. Looking at pictures on a screen just didn't do it for Jenny, so she spread out the photographs again on her desk, though she knew them all by heart. Kelly Matthews, Samantha Foster, Leanne Ray, Melissa Horrocks, and Kimberly Myers, all attractive blonde girls between the ages of 16 and 18. There had been too many assumptions for Jenny's liking right from the start, the prime one being that all five girls had been abducted by the same person or persons. She could, she had told Banks and the team, make out almost as good a case for their not being linked, even on such little information as she possessed. Young girls go missing all the time, Jenny had argued. They have arguments with their parents and run away from home. But Banks told her that detailed and exhaustive interviews with friends, family, teachers, neighbours and acquaintances showed that all the girls, except perhaps Leanne Ray, came from stable family backgrounds. And apart from the usual rows about boyfriends, clothes, loud music and what have you, nothing unusual or significant had happened in their lives prior to their disappearances. These, Banks stressed, were not your common or garden teenage runaways. There was also the matter of the shoulder bags found abandoned, close to where the girls had last been seen. With the botched Yorkshire Ripper investigation still hanging like an albatross around its neck, West Yorkshire was taking no chances. The number became four, then five, and no traces whatsoever could be found of any of the girls through the usual channels youth support groups, the National Missing Persons Helpline, Crime Watch UK reconstructions, Missing Can You Help posters, 
media appeals and local police efforts. In the end, Jenny accepted Banks' argument and proceeded as if the disappearances were linked, at the same time keeping clear notes of any differences between the individual circumstances. Before long, she found that the similarities by far overwhelmed the differences. Victimology. What did they have in common? All the girls were young, had long blonde hair, long legs and trim athletic figures. It seemed to indicate the type of girl he liked, Jenny had said. They all have different tastes. By victim number four, Jenny had noticed the pattern of escalation. Nearly two months between victims one and two, five weeks between two and three, but only two and a half weeks between three and four. He had been getting needier, she thought at the time, which meant he might also become more reckless. Jenny was also willing to bet that there was a fair degree of personality disintegration going on. The criminal had chosen his haunts well. Open-air parties, pubs, dancers, clubs, cinemas and pop concerts were all places where you were very likely to find young people and they all had to get home one way or another. She knew that the team referred to him as the chameleon and agreed that he showed a very high level of skill in taking his pick of victims and not being seen. All had been abducted at night in urban settings, desolate stretches of city streets, ill-lit and deserted. He had also managed to stay well beyond the range of the CCTV cameras that covered many city centres and town squares these days. A witness said she saw Samantha, the Bradford victim, talking to someone through the window of a dark car, and that was the only information Jenny had about his possible method of abduction. While the New Year's party, the Harrogate Pop concert, the cinema and University Pub were common knowledge and obvious hunting grounds, one question that had bothered Jenny since Saturday morning was how the killer had known about the school dance after which Kimberly Myers had been abducted. Did he live in the neighbourhood? Had he simply happened to be passing at the time? As far as she knew, these things weren't advertised outside the immediate community or even beyond the school. Now she knew. Terence Payne lived just down the street, taught at the local comprehensive, knew the victim. Also, now some of the things she had learned that day were making sense of some of the other puzzling facts and questions she had gathered over the weeks. Of the five abductions, four had occurred on a Friday night, or in the early hours of Saturday morning, which had led Jenny to believe that the killer worked a regular five-day week and that he devoted his weekends to his hobby. The odd one out, Melissa Horrocks, had bothered her, but now that she knew Payne was a schoolteacher, the Tuesday, 18th of April abduction made sense too. It was the Easter holidays, and Payne had more spare time on his hands. From the scant information, all this before the Kimberly Myers abduction, Jenny had surmised that they were dealing with an abductor who struck opportunistically. He cruised suitable locations, looking for a certain type of victim, and when he found one, he struck as fast as lightning. There was no evidence that any of the girls had been stalked either on the evening of or prior to their abductions, though it was a possibility she had to bear in mind, but Jenny was willing to bet that he had scouted the locations, studied every way in and out, every dark nook and cranny, all the sight lines and angles. There was always a certain level of risk involved in things such as this, just enough, perhaps, to guarantee that quick surge of adrenaline that was probably part of the thrill. Now Jenny knew that he had used chloroform to subdue his victims. That decreased the level of risk. Jenny had also not been able, until now, to take into account any crime scene information because there hadn't been a crime scene available. 
There could be plenty of reasons why no bodies turned up, Jenny had said. They could have been dumped in remote locations and not discovered yet, buried in the woods, dumped in the sea, or in a lake. As the number of disappearances increased, though, and as time went on and still no bodies were found, Jenny found herself moving towards the theory that their man was a collector, someone who plucks and savours his victims, and perhaps then disposes of them the way a butterfly collector might gas and pin his trophies. Now she had seen the anteroom, where the killer had buried or partially buried the bodies, and she didn't think that had been done by chance or done badly. She didn't think that the toes of one victim were sticking through the earth because Terence Payne was a sloppy worker. They were like that because he wanted them that way. It was part of his fantasy, because he got off on it, as they said back in America. They were part of his collection, his trophy room, or his garden. Now Jenny would have to rework her profile, factoring in all the new evidence that would be pouring out of number 35 the hill over the next few weeks. She would also have to find out all she could about Terence Payne. And there was another thing. Now Jenny also had to consider Lucy Payne. Had Lucy known what her husband was doing? It was possible at least that she had her suspicions. Why didn't she come forward? Because of some misguided sense of loyalty, perhaps? This was her husband, after all. Or fear. If he had hit her with a vase last night, he could have hit her at other times, too. Warned her of the fate that awaited her if she told anyone the truth. It would have been a living hell for Lucy, of course. But Jenny could believe her doing that. Plenty of women live their whole lives in such hells. But was Lucy more involved? Again, possible. Jenny had suggested tentatively that the method of abduction indicated the killer might have had a helper, someone to lure the girl into the car or distract her while he came up from behind. A woman would have been perfect for that role, would have made the actual abduction easier. Young girls wary of men are far more likely to lean in the window and help when a woman pulls over at the curb. Were women capable of such evil? Definitely. And if they were ever caught, the outrage against them was far greater than against any male. You only had to look at the public's reactions to Maria Hindley, Rosemary West, and Carla Homolka to see that. So was Lucy Payne a killer? Banks felt bone-weary when he pulled up in the narrow lane outside his Gratley cottage, close to midnight that night. He knew he should have probably taken a hotel room in Leeds, as he had done before, or accept a Ken Blackstone's offer of the sofa. But he had very much wanted to go home tonight, even if Annie had refused to come over, and he didn't mind the drive too much. It helped relax him. There were two messages waiting for him on the machine. The first was from Tracy, saying she had heard the news and hoped he was all right and the second was from Leanne Ray's father, Christopher, who had seen the press conference and the evening news and wanted to know if the police had found his daughter's body at the Payne house. Banks didn't answer either of them. For one thing, it was too late, and for another, he didn't want to talk to anybody. He could deal with them all in the morning. Now that he was home, he was even glad that Annie wasn't coming. The idea of company tonight, even Annie's, didn't appeal. And after all he'd seen and thought about today, the idea of sex held about as much interest as a trip to the dentist's. Instead, he poured himself a generous tumbler of Lefroig and tried to find some suitable music. He needed to listen to something, but he didn't know what. Usually, he had no trouble finding what he wanted in his large collection. But tonight he rejected just about every CD he picked out. He knew he didn't want to listen to jazz or rock or 
anything too wild and primitive like that. Wagner and Marlowe were out, as were all the romantics, Beethoven, Schubert, Rachmaninoff, and the rest. The entire twentieth century was out, too. In the end, he went for Rostropovich's rendition of Bach's cello suites. Outside the cottage, the low stone wall between the dirt lane and the beck bulged out and formed a little parapet over Gratley Falls, which was just a series of terraces, none more than a few feet in height, running diagonally through the village and under the little stone bridge that formed its central gathering place. Since he had moved into the cottage the previous summer, Banks had got into the habit of standing out there last thing at night, if the weather was good enough, or even sitting on the wall dangling his legs over the beck, and enjoying his nightcap and a cigarette before bed. The night air was still, and smelled of hay and warm grass. The dale below him was sleeping. One or two farmhouse lights shone on the far valley side, but apart from the sounds of sheep in the field across the beck, and night animals from the woods, all was quiet. He could just make out the shapes of distant fell sides in the dark, humped back or jagged against the night sky. He thought he heard a curlew's eerie trill from high up on the moors. The new moon gave sparse light, but there were more stars than he had seen in a long time. As he watched, the star fell through the darkness, leaving a thin, milky trail. Banks didn't make a wish. He felt depressed. The elation he had expected to feel on finding the killer somehow eluded him. He had no sense of an ending, of an evil purged. In some odd way he felt the evil was just beginning. He tried to shake off his sense of apprehension. He heard a meow beside him and looked down. It was the skinny marmalade cat from the woods. Starting that spring, it had come over on several occasions when Banks was outside alone late at night. The second time it appeared, he had brought it some milk, which it lapped up before disappearing back into the trees. He had never seen it anywhere else, or at any other time than night. Once, he had even bought some cat food to be more prepared for its visit but the cat hadn't touched it. All it would do was meow, drink the milk, strut around for a few minutes and go back where it came from. Banks fetched a saucer of milk and set it down, refilling his own glass at the same time. The cat's eyes shone amber in the darkness as it looked up at him before bending to drink. Banks lit his cigarette and leaned against the wall, resting his glass on its rough stone surface. He tried to purge his mind of the day's terrible images. The cat rubbed against his leg and ran off back into the woods. Rostropovich played on, and Bach's precise mathematical patterns of sound formed an odd counterpoint to the wild, roaring music of Gratley Falls so recently swelled by the spring thaw. And for a few moments at least, Banks succeeded in losing himself. Chapter 6 According to her parents, Melissa Horrocks, aged 17, who failed to return home after a pop concert in Harrogate on the 18th of April, was going through a rebellious phase. Stephen and Mary Horrocks, had only the one daughter, a late blessing in Mary's mid-thirties. Stephen worked in the office of a local dairy, while Mary had a part-time job in an estate agent's office in the city centre. Around the age of sixteen, Melissa developed an interest in the kind of theatrical pop music that used Satanism as its main stage prop. Though friends advised Stephen and Mary that it was harmless enough, just youthful spirits, that it would soon pass, they were nonetheless alarmed when she started altering her appearance and letting her schoolwork and athletics slip. Melissa first dyed her hair red, got a stud in her nose, and wore a lot of black. 
Her bedroom wall was adorned with posters of skinny, satanic-looking pop stars, such as Marilyn Manson, and occult symbols her parents didn't understand. About a week before the concert, Melissa decided she didn't like the red hair, so she reverted to her natural blonde colouring. There was a good chance, Banks thought later, that if she'd kept it red, that might have saved her life, which also led Banks to think that she hadn't been stalked before her abduction, or at least not for long. The chameleon wouldn't stalk a redhead. Harrogate, a prosperous Victorian-style North Yorkshire city of about 70,000, known as a conference centre and a magnet for retired people, wasn't exactly the typical venue for a Beelzebub's bollocks concert. But the band was new and had yet to win a major recording contract. They were working their way up to bigger gigs. There had been the usual calls for a band from retired colonels and the kind of old busybodies who watch all the filth on television so they can write letters of protest, but in the end this was to no avail. About five hundred kids wandered into the converted theatre, including Melissa and her friends Jenna and Kayla. The concert ended at half-past ten, and the three girls stood around outside for a while talking about the show. The three of them split up at about a quarter to eleven, and went their separate ways. It was a mild night, so Melissa said she was going to walk. She didn't live far from the city centre, and most of her walk home took her along the busy, well-lit Ripon Road. Two people later came forward to say they saw her, close to eleven o'clock, walking south by the junction of West Park and Beech Grove. To get home, she would turn down Beech Grove and then turn off after about a hundred yards but she never got there. At first, there was a faint hope that Melissa might have run away from home, given the ongoing battle with her parents. But Stephen and Mary, along with Jenna and Kayla, assured Banks this could not be the case. The two friends in particular said they shared everything, and they would have known if she was planning on running away. Besides, she had none of her valued possessions with her, and she told them she was looking forward to seeing them the next day at the Victoria Centre. Then there was the satanic element, not to be lightly dismissed when a girl had disappeared. The members of the band were interviewed, along with as many audience members as could be rounded up, but that went nowhere too. Even Banks had to admit, when examining the statements later, that the whole thing had been pretty tame and harmless. The black magic merely theatre as it had been for Black Sabbath and Alice Cooper in his day. Beelzebub's bollocks didn't even bite the heads off chickens on stage. When Melissa's black leather shoulder bag was found in some bushes two days after her disappearance, as if it had been tossed from the window of a moving car, money still intact, the case came to the attention of Banks' chameleon task force. Like Kelly Matthews, Samantha Foster, and Leanne Ray before her, Melissa Horrocks had disappeared into thin air. Jenna and Kayla were devastated. Just before Melissa had walked off into the night, they had joked, Kayla said, about perverts. But Melissa pointed to her chest and said the occult symbol on her T-shirt would ward off evil spirits. The incident room was crowded at nine o'clock on Tuesday morning. Over forty detectives sat on the edges of their desks or leaned against the walls. Smoking was not permitted in the building, and many of them chewed gum or fidgeted with paper clips or rubber bands instead. Most had been on the task force since the beginning, and they had all put in long hours, invested a lot of themselves in the job, emotionally as well as physically. It had taken its toll on all of them. Banks happened to know that one unfortunate D.C.'s marriage had broken up over the hours he spent away from home and the neglect he displayed towards his wife. It would have happened some other time anyway, Banks told himself, but an investigation like this one can put the pressure on, can push events to a crisis point, especially if that crisis point isn't too far away to start with. These days, Banks also felt that he was approaching his own crisis point though he had no idea where it was or what would happen when he got there. Now there was at least some sense of progress, 
no matter how unclear things still seemed, and the air buzzed with speculation. They all wanted to know what had happened. The mood was mixed. On the one hand, it looked as if they had their man. On the other, one of their own had been killed, and his partner was about to be put through the hoops. When Banks strode in, somewhat the worse for wear after another poor night's sleep, despite a third Lefroig and the second disc of Bach's cello sonatas, the room hushed, everyone waiting to hear the news. He stood next to Ken Blackstone, beside the photographs of the girls pinned to the cork board. OK, he said. I'll do my best to explain where we are with this. The Sockos are still at the scene, and it looks as if they'll be there for a long time yet. So far, they've uncovered three bodies in the cellar anteroom, and it doesn't look as if there's room for any more. They're digging in the back garden for the fourth. None of the victims has been identified yet. But D.S. Novak says the bodies are all young and female, so it's reasonable to assume, for the moment, that they're the young girls who went missing. We should be able to make some headway on identification later today by checking dental records. Dr. Mackenzie performed the post-mortem on Kimberly Myers late yesterday and found that she had been subdued by chloroform, but death was due to vagal inhibition, caused by ligature strangulation. Yellow plastic fibres from the clothesline were embedded in the wound. He paused, then sighed and went on. She was also raped anally and vaginally, and forced to perform fellatio. What about pain, sir? someone asked. Is the buster going to die? The last I heard was that they had to operate on his brain. Terence Payne is still in a coma, and there's no telling how long that might last or how it will end. By the way, we now know that Terence Payne lived and taught in Seacroft before he moved to West Leeds in September, the year before last at the start of the school year. DCI Blackstone has him in the frame for the Seacroft rapist, so we're already checking DNA. I'll want a team to go over the casework on that one with the local CID. Dear Stuart, can you get that organised? Right away, sir. That'll be Chapeltown CID. Chapeltown will be hot to trot on this, Banks knew. It was a red inker for them, an easy way of closing several open case files at one fell swoop. We've also checked Payne's car registration with DVLA in Swansea. He was using false plates. His own plates end in KWT, just like the witness in the Samantha Foster disappearance saw. The Sockos found them hidden in the garage. That means Bradford CID must have already interviewed him. I'd imagine it was after that he switched the false ones. What about Dennis Morrissey? someone asked. P.C. Morrissey died of blood loss caused by the severings of his carotid artery and jugular vein, according to Dr. Mackenzie's examination at the scene. He'll be doing the PM later today. As you can imagine, there's getting to be quite a queue down at the mortuary. He's looking for assistance. Anyone interested? Nervous laughter rippled through the room. What about P.C. Taylor? One of the detectives asked. P.C. Taylor's coping, said Banks. I talked to her yesterday evening. She was able to tell me what happened in the cellar. As you all probably know, she'll be under investigation, so let's try to keep that one at arm's length. A chorus of boos came up from the crowd. Banks quieted them down. It's got to be done, he said, unpopular as it is. We're none of us above the law. But let's not let that distract us. Our job is far from over. In fact, it's just beginning. There's going to be a mountain of stuff coming out of forensic examinations at the house. It'll all have to be tagged, logged and filed. Holmes is still in operation, so the green sheets will have to be filled out and fed in. Banks heard Carol Houseman, the trained Holmes operator, groan. Oh, bugger it. Sorry, Carol, he said, with a sympathetic smile. Needs must. In other words, despite what's happened, we're still very much in business for the time being. We need to gather the evidence, 
We need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Terence Payne is the killer of all five missing girls. What about his wife? someone asked. She must have known. Just what Ken Blackstone had said. We don't know that, said Banks. For the moment, she's a victim. But her possible involvement is one of the things we'll be looking into. We're already aware that he might have had an accomplice. She should be able to talk to me later this morning. Banks glanced at his watch and turned to D.S. Filey. In the meantime, Ted, I'd like you to put a team together to go over all the statements and re-interview everyone we talked to when the girls were first reported missing. Family, friends, witnesses, everyone. OK. Right you are, Gov, said Ted Filey. Banks hated being called Gov but he let it go by. Get some photographs of Lucy Payne and show one to everyone you talk to. See if anyone remembers seeing her in connection with any of the missing girls. More muttering broke out, and Banks quieted them down again. For the moment, he said, I want you all to keep in close touch with our office manager, D.S. Grafton, here. A cheer went up, and Ian Grafton blushed. He'll be issuing actions and TIEs, and there'll be plenty of them. I want to know what Terence and Lucy Payne eat for breakfast, and how regular their bowel movements are. Dr. Fuller suggested that Payne would have kept some sort of visual record of his deeds, video most likely, but maybe just ordinary still photographs. Nothing's been found at the scene yet, but we'll need to know if the Paynes ever owned or rented video equipment. Banks noticed the number of sceptical looks at the mention of Jenny Fuller. Typical narrow-minded thinking, in his opinion. Consultant psychologists might not be possessed with magic powers and able to name the killer within hours, but in Banks's experience, they could narrow the field and target the area where the offender might live. Why not use them? At best, they could help, and at worst, they did no harm. Remember, he went on, Five girls were abducted, raped and murdered. Five girls. You don't need me to tell you. Any one of them could have been your daughter. We think we've got the man responsible, but we can't be sure he acted alone. And until we can prove it was him, no matter what shape he's in, there'll be no slacking on this team. Got it? The assembled detectives muttered. Yes, sir. Then the group started to split up, some drifting outside for a much-needed cigarette, others settling back at their desks. One more thing, said Banks. DC's Bowmore and Sing in my office now. After a brief meeting with Area Commander Hartnell, who definitely gave her the eye, and Banks, who seemed uncomfortable about the whole thing, D.I. Annie Cabot read over P.C. Janet Taylor's file as she waited in the small office assigned to her. Hartnell himself had decided that as Janet Taylor was coming in voluntarily, and as she wasn't under arrest, an office would be a far less threatening environment for the preliminary talk than the standard grungy interview room. Annie was impressed by P.C. Taylor's record. There was little doubt that she would find a place in the accelerated promotion course, and make the rank of inspector within five years, if she was cleared of all charges. A local girl from Pulsey, Janet Taylor had four A-levels and a degree in sociology from the University of Bristol. She was just 23 years old, unmarried and living alone. Janet had high scores on all her entrance exams, and in the opinions of those who had examined her, she showed a clear grasp of the complexities of policing a diverse society. Along with the sort of cognitive skills and problem-solving abilities that augured well for a detective, she was in good health and listed her hobbies as squash, tennis and computers. Throughout her student career, she had spent her summers working for security at the White Rose Centre in Leeds, both manning the cameras and patrolling the shopping precinct. Janet had also done voluntary community work for her local church group, helping the elderly. All of this sounded quite dull to Annie, who grew up in an artist's commune, near St. Ives, surrounded by oddballs, hippies and weirdos of all sorts. 
Annie had also come late to the police, and though she had a degree, it was in art history, not much use in the force, and she hadn't got on the APC because of an incident at her previous county, when three fellow officers had attempted to rape her at a party following her promotion to sergeant. One succeeded before she had managed to fight them off. Traumatised, Annie had not reported the incident until the following morning, by which time she had spent hours in the bath washing away all evidence. The DCS had accepted the words of the three officers against hers, and while they admitted that things had got a little out of hand, with the drunken Annie leading them on, they said they had retained their control and no sexual assault had taken place. For a long time, Annie hadn't much cared about her career, and no one had been more surprised than she had at the rekindling of her ambition, which had meant dealing with the rape and its aftermath, more complicated and traumatic than anyone but her really knew. But it had happened, and now she was a fully-fledged inspector, investigating a politically dodgy case for Detective Superintendent Chambers, who was clearly scared stiff of the assignment himself. A brief tap at the door was followed by the entry of a young woman with short black hair, which looked rather dry and lifeless. They told me you were in here, she said. Annie introduced herself. Sit down, Janet. Janet sat and tried to make herself comfortable on the hard chair. She looked as if she hadn't slept all night, which didn't surprise Annie in the least. Her face was pale, and there were dark semicircles under her eyes. Perhaps beyond the ravages of sleeplessness and abject terror, Janet Taylor was an attractive young woman. She certainly had beautiful eyes, the colour of loam, and the kind of cheekbones that models hang their careers on. She also seemed a very serious person, weighed down by the gravity of life, or perhaps that was a result of recent events. How is he? Janet asked. Who? You know, pain. Still unconscious. Will he survive? They don't know yet, Janet. Okay, I mean, it's just that, well, I suppose it makes a difference, you know, to my case. If he dies, yes, it does. But don't let's worry about that for the time being. I want you to tell me what happened in the pain cellar. Then I'll ask you a few questions. Finally, I want you to write it all down in a statement. This isn't an interrogation, Janet. I'm sure you went through hell down in that cellar, and nobody wants to treat you like a criminal. But there are procedures to be followed in cases like this, and the sooner we get going, the better. Annie wasn't being entirely truthful, but she wanted to set Janet Taylor as much at ease as possible. She knew she would have to push and prod a bit, maybe even go in hard now and again. It was her interrogation technique. After all, it was often under pressure of some sort that the truth slipped out. She would play it by ear. But if she needed to badger Janet Taylor a bit, then so be it. Damn Chambers and Hartnell. If she was going to do the bloody job, she was going to do it properly. Don't worry, said Janet. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm sure you haven't. Tell me about it. As Janet Taylor spoke, sounding rather bored and detached, as if she had been through this all too many times already, or as if she were recounting someone else's story, Annie watched her body language. Janet shifted in her chair often, twisted her hands on her lap, and when she got to the real horror, she folded her arms, and her voice became flatter, lacking expression. Annie let her go on, making notes on points she thought relevant. Janet didn't so much come to a definite end as trail off, after she said she had settled to wait for the ambulance, cradling P.C. Morris's head on her lap and feeling the warm blood seep through on her thighs. As she spoke about this, her eyebrows rose and wrinkled the centre of her forehead, and tears formed in her eyes. Annie let the silence stretch for a while after Janet had fallen silent. Then she asked if Janet would like a drink. She asked for water. 
and Annie brought us some from the fountain. The room was hot, and Annie got some for herself, too. Just a couple of things, Janet. Then I'll leave you alone to write your statement. Janet yawned. She put her hand to her mouth, but didn't apologize. Normally Annie would have taken a yawn as a sign of fear or nervousness, but Janet Taylor had good reason to be tired, so she didn't make too much of it on this occasion. What were you thinking about while it was happening? Annie asked. Thinking? I'm not sure I was thinking at all. Just reacting. Did you remember your training? Janet laughed, but it was forced. Training doesn't prepare you for something like that. What about your baton training? I didn't have to think about that. It was instinctive. You were feeling threatened. Damn right I was. He was killing Dennis, and he was going to kill me next. He'd already killed a girl on the bed. How did you know she was dead? What? Kimberly Myers. How did you know she was dead? You said it all happened so fast you barely caught a glimpse of her before the attack. I... I suppose I just assumed. I mean, she was lying there naked on the bed with a yellow rope around her neck. Her eyes were open. It was a reasonable assumption to make. Okay, said Annie. So you never thought of yourself as saving her, as rescuing her? No. It was what was happening to Dennis that concerned me. And what you thought was going to happen to you next? Yes. Janet sipped some more water. A little of it dripped down her chin onto the front of her grey T-shirt, but she didn't seem to notice. So you got your baton out. What next? I told you, he came at me with this crazy look in his eye. And he lashed out at you with his machete. Yes, I deflected the blow with my baton, the side against my arm, like the tortoise. And then, when he'd swung, before he could bring it back into position again, I swung out and hit him. Where did the first blow land? On his head. Where exactly on his head? I don't know, I wasn't concerned about that. But you wanted to put him out of commission, didn't you? I wanted to stop him from killing me. So you'd want to hit him somewhere effective? Well, I'm right-handed, so I suppose I must have hit him on the left side of his head, somewhere around the temple. Did he go down? No. But he was dazed. He couldn't get his machete in position to strike again. Where did you hit him next? The wrist, I think. To disarm him? Yes. Did you succeed? Yes. What did you do next? I kicked the machete into the corner. What did Payne do? He was holding his wrist and cursing me. You had hit him once on the left temple and once on the wrist by this time. That's right. What did you do next? I hit him again. Where? On the head. Why? To incapacitate him. Was he standing at this point? Yes. He'd been on his knees trying to get the machete. But he got up and came at me. He was unarmed now. Yes, but he was still bigger and stronger than me. And he had this insane look in his eyes, as if he had strength to spare. So you hit him again? Yes. Same spot? I don't know. I used my baton in the same way. So, yes, I suppose so, unless he was half turned away. Was he? I don't think so. But it's possible. I mean, it was you who suggested it. I suppose it's possible, but I don't see why. You didn't hit him on the back of his head at any point. I don't think so. Janet had started to sweat now. Annie could see beads of it around her hairline, and a dark stain spreading slowly under her arms. She didn't want to put the poor woman through much more. But she had her job to do, and she could be hard when she needed to be. What happened after you hit Payne on the head a second time? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Nothing. He kept coming. So you hit him again? Yes. I took the bat on in both hands like a cricket bat, so I could hit him harder. He had nothing to defend himself with at this time, right? Only his arms. But he didn't raise them to ward off the blow. He was holding his wrist, 
I think it was broken. I heard something crack. So you had free rein to hit him as hard as you liked? He kept coming at me. You mean he kept moving towards you? Yes, and calling me names. What sort of names? Filthy names. And Dennis was groaning, bleeding. I wanted to go to him to see if I could help, but I couldn't do anything until pain stopped moving. You didn't feel you could restrain him with handcuffs at this point? No way. I'd already hit him two or three times, but it seemed to have no effect. He kept coming. If I'd gone in close, and he'd got a hold of me, he'd have strangled the life out of me, even with his broken wrist. Yes, he could have got his arm across my throat. Okay. Annie paused to make some notes on the pad in front of her. She could almost smell Janet Taylor's fear. And she wasn't sure if it was residual from the cellar or because of present circumstances. She drew out the note-making process until Janet started shifting and fidgeting. Then she asked, How many times do you think you hit him, in all? Janet turned her head to one side. I don't know. I wasn't counting. I was fighting for my life, defending myself against a maniac. Five times, six times. I told you, I don't remember. As many times as I needed to make him stop coming. He just wouldn't stop coming at me. Janet broke into sobs, and Annie let her cry. It was the first time emotion had broken through the shock, and it would do her good. After a minute or so, Janet collected herself and sipped some more water. She seemed embarrassed to have broken down in front of a colleague. I've almost finished now, Janet, said Annie. Then I'll leave you be. Okay. You managed to get him to stay down, didn't you? Yes. He fell against the wall and slid down. Was he still moving then? Not very much. He was sort of twitching and breathing heavily. There was blood on his mouth. Final question. Janet, did you hit him again after he went down? Her eyebrows shot together in fear. No, I don't think so. What did you do? I handcuffed him to the pipe. And then? Then I went to help Dennis. Are you sure you didn't hit him again after he went down? Just to make sure. Janet looked away. I told you, I don't think so. Why would I? Annie leaned forward and rested her arms on the desk. Try to remember, Janet. But Janet shook her head. It's no good. I don't remember. Okay, said Annie, getting to her feet. Interview over. She pushed a statement sheet and a pen in front of Janet. Write out what you've told me in as much detail as you can remember. Janet grasped the pen. What happens next? When you've finished, love, go home and have a stiff drink. Hell, have two. Janet managed a weak but genuine smile as Annie left and shut the door behind her. DC's Bowmore and Singh looked shifty when they walked into Banks's temporary Milgarth office, as well they might, he thought. Sit down, he said. They sat. What is it, sir? asked D.C. Singh, attempting lightness. Got a job for us? Banks leaned back in his chair and linked his hands behind his head. In a manner of speaking, he said, if you call sharpening pencils and emptying the waste paper baskets a job. Their jaws dropped. Sir, Beaumont began, but Banks held up his hand. A car number plate ending KWT. Ring any bells? Sir? KWT. Catherine Wendy Thurlow. Yes, sir, said Singh. It's the number Bradford CID got in the Samantha Foster investigation. Bingo, said Banks. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Bradford send us copies of all their files on the Samantha Foster case when this team was set up? Yes, sir. Including the name of everyone in the area who owned a dark car with the number plate ending KWT? Over a thousand, sir. Over a thousand, indeed. Bradford CID interviewed them all. And guess who's among that thousand? Terence Payne, sir, answered Singh again. Bright lad, said Banks. Now, when Bradford CID were working on that case, 
Did they have any links to any similar crimes? No, sir, answered Bowmore this time. There was the girl missing from the New Year's party in Roundy Park, but there was no reason to link them together at the time. Right, said Banks. So why do you think I issued an action shortly after this task force was set up to go over all the evidence on the previous cases, including the disappearance of Samantha Foster? Because you thought there was a link, sir, said D.C. Singh. Not just me, said Banks, but yes, three girls as it was then, then four, then five. The possibility of a link was becoming stronger and stronger. Now, guess who was assigned to go over the evidence in the Samantha Foster case? Singh and Beaumont looked at one another, then frowned and looked at Banks. We were, sir, they said as one, including re-interviewing the list of car owners Bradford CID got from the DVLA. Over a thousand, sir. Indeed, said Banks. But am I correct in assuming that you had plenty of help, that the action was split up, that the letter P was among those alphabetically assigned to you? Because... That's what it says in my files. P for pain. There was still a lot to go, sir. We haven't got around to them all yet. You haven't got around to them yet. This was at the beginning of April, over a month ago. You've been dragging your feet a bit, haven't you? It's not as if it was the only action assigned to us, sir, said Beaumont. Look, said Banks, I don't want any excuses. For one reason or another, you failed to re-interview Terence Payne. But it wouldn't have made any difference, sir, Beaumont argued. I mean, Bradford CID didn't exactly mark him down as their number one suspect, did they? What was he going to tell us that he didn't tell them? He wasn't going to decide to confess just because we went to talk to him, was he? Banks ran his hand over his hair and muttered a silent curse under his breath. He was not a natural authoritarian, far from it, and he hated this part of the job, dishing out bollockings having been on the receiving end of plenty himself. But if anyone ever did, these two price pillocks deserve the worst he could give. Is this supposed to be an example of you using your initiative, he said, because if it is, you'd have been better advised to stick to procedure and follow orders. But sir, Singh said, he was a school teacher, newly married, nice house. We did read over all the statements. I'm sorry, said Banks, shaking his head. Am I missing something here? What do you mean, sir? Well, I'm not aware that Dr. Fuller had given us any sort of profile of the person we were looking for at this point. Dr. Singh grinned. Hasn't given us much of anything when you get right down to it, has she, sir? So what made you think you could rule out a recently married schoolteacher with a nice house? Singh's mouth opened and shut like a fish's. Beaumont looked down at his shoes. Well, Banks repeated, I'm waiting. Look, sir said Singh. I'm sorry, but we just hadn't got round to him yet. Have you talked to any of the people on your list? A couple, sir, muttered Singh. The ones Bradford CID had marked down as possibles. There was one bloke had a previous for flashing, but he had a solid alibi for Leanne Ray and Melissa Horrocks. We checked that out, sir. So, when you'd nothing better to do, You'd fill in a bit of overtime by ticking a name or two off the list. Names that Bradford CID had put question marks beside, is that it? That's not fair, sir, Beaumont argued. Not fair. I'll tell you what's not bloody fair, DC Beaumont. It's not bloody fair that at least five girls that we know of so far have most likely died at the hands of Terence Payne. That's not what's fair. But he wouldn't have admitted it to us, sir, Singh protested. You're supposed to be detectives, aren't you? Look, let me put it simply. If you'd gone around to Payne's house when you were supposed to, say, last month, then one or two more girls might not have died. You can't put that down to us, sir, Beaumont protested, red in the face. That's just not on. Oh, isn't it? What if you'd seen or heard something suspicious while you were in the house interviewing him? What if your finely developed detective's instinct had picked up on something and he had asked to have a look around? Bradford CID didn't. I don't give a damn what Bradford CID did or didn't do. They were examining a single case, the disappearance of Samantha Foster. You, on the other hand, were investigating a case of serial abductions. 
If you'd had any reason at all to look in the cellar, you'd have had him, believe me. Even if you'd poked around his video collection, it might have raised your suspicions. If you'd looked at his car, you'd have noticed the false plates. The ones he's using now end in NGV, not KWT. That might have rung a few alarm bells, don't you think? Instead, you decide on your own that this action isn't worth rushing on. God knows what else you thought was so much more important. Well, they both looked down. Nothing to say for yourselves? No, sir, muttered a tight-lipped D.C. Singh. I'll even give you the benefit of the doubt, said Banks. I'll assume that you were pursuing other angles and not just skiving off. But you still screwed up. But he must have lied to Bradford's CID, Beaumont argued. He'd only have lied to us, too. You just don't get it, do you? said Banks. I've told you, you're supposed to be detectives. You don't take anything at face value. Maybe you'd have noticed something about his body language. Maybe you'd have caught him out in a lie. Maybe, God forbid, you might have even checked one of his alibis and found it didn't hold up. Maybe just something might have made you a little suspicious about Terran's pain. Am I making myself clear? You had at least two, maybe three more things to go on than Bradford had, and you blew it. Now you're off the case, both of you, and this is going on your records. Clear? Beaumont looked daggers at Banks, and Singh seemed close to tears, but Banks had no sympathy for either of them at that moment. He felt a splitting headache coming on. Get the hell out of here, he said, and don't let me see you in the incident room again. Maggie hid herself away in the sanctuary of Ruth's studio. Spring sunshine spilled through the window, which she opened an inch or two to let in some air. It was a spacious room at the back of the house, originally the third bedroom. And while the view through the window left a lot to be desired, a grotty litter-strewn back passage and the council estate beyond, the room itself was perfect for her needs. Upstairs, in addition to the three rooms, toilet and bathroom, there was also a loft, accessed by a pull-down ladder, that Ruth said she used for storage. Maggie didn't store anything there. In fact, she never even went up there, as she felt disturbed by spidery, dusty, neglected places, the mere thought of which made her shiver. She had allergies, too, and the slightest hint of dust made her eyes burn and her nose itch. Another bonus today was that upstairs at the back of the house, she wasn't constantly distracted by all the activity out on the hill. It was open to traffic again, but number 35 was screened off, and people kept coming and going, bringing out boxes and bags of God knew what. She couldn't quite put it out of her mind, of course, but she didn't read the newspaper that morning, and she tuned the radio to a classical station that had few news breaks. She was preparing to illustrate a new coffee table selection of Grimm's fairy tales, working on thumbnails and preliminary sketches, and what nasty, gruesome little stories they were, she discovered on reading through them for the first time since childhood. Back then, they had seemed remote, cartoonish, but now the horror and the violence seemed all too real. The sketch she had just finished was for Rumpelstiltskin, the poisoned dwarf who helped Anna spin straw into gold in exchange for her firstborn. Her illustration was a bit too idealised, she thought. A sad-looking girl child at a spinning wheel, with just the suggestion of two burning eyes and the distorted shadow of the dwarf in the background. She could hardly use the scene where he stamped so hard his foot went through the floor and his leg came off as he tried to pull it out. Matter-of-fact violence, no dwelling on blood and guts the way so many films did these days. Special effects for the sake of it, but violence nonetheless. Now she was working on Rapunzel, and her preliminary sketches showed the young girl, another firstborn taken from her true parents, letting her long blonde hair down from the tower, where she was held captive by a witch. Another happy ending, with the witch being devoured by a wolf, except for her talon-like hands and feet, which it spat out to be eaten by worms and beetles. 
She was just trying to get the rope of hair and the angle of Rapunzel's head right, so that it would at least look as if she might be able to support the prince's weight when the telephone rang. Maggie picked up the studio extension. Yes? Margaret Forrest? It was a woman's voice. Am I speaking to Margaret Forrest? Who's asking? Is that you, Margaret? My name's Lorraine Temple. You don't know me. What do you want? I understand that it was you who dialed in the emergency call on the hill yesterday morning. A domestic disturbance? Who are you? Are you a reporter? Oh, didn't I say? Yes, I write for the post. I'm not supposed to talk to you. Go away. Look, I'm just down the street, Margaret. I'm calling on my mobile. The police won't let me near your house, so I wondered if you'd care to meet me for a drink or something. It's almost lunchtime. There's a nice pub. I've nothing to say to you, Miss Temple, so there's no point in our meeting. You did report a domestic disturbance at number 35 The Hill early yesterday morning, didn't you? Yes, but then I have got the right person. What made you think it was a domestic? I'm sorry, I don't understand. I don't know what you mean. You heard noises, didn't you? Raised voices, breaking glass, a thud. How do you know all this? I'm just wondering what made you jump to the conclusion that it was a domestic disturbance, that's all. I mean, why couldn't it have been someone grappling with a burglar, for example? I don't know what you're getting at. Oh, come on, Margaret. It's Maggie, isn't it? Can I call you Maggie? Maggie said nothing. She had no idea why she didn't just hang up on Lorraine Temple. Look, Maggie, Lorraine went on, give me a break here. I've got my living to make. Were you a friend of Lucy Payne's? Is that it? Do you know something about her background? Something the rest of us don't know? I can't talk to you any more, Maggie said, and then she did hang up. But something Lorraine Temple had said struck a chord, and she regretted doing so. Despite what Banks had told her, if she were to be Lucy's friend, then the press might prove an ally, not an enemy. She might have to speak to them, to mobilise them in Lucy's support. Public sympathy would be very important, and in that the media might be able to help her. Of course, all this depended on the approach the police took. If Banks believed what Maggie had told him about the abuse, and if Lucy confirmed it, as she would, then they would realise that she was more of a victim than anything else, and just let her go as soon as she was well again. Lorraine Temple was persistent enough to call back a couple of minutes later. Come on, Maggie, she said. Where's the harm? All right, said Maggie. I'll meet you for a drink, ten minutes. I know the place you mean. It's called a woodcutter. At the bottom of the hill, right? Right, ten minutes. I'll be there. Maggie hung up. While she was still close to the phone, she took out the yellow pages and looked up a local florist. She arranged to have some flowers delivered to Lucy in her hospital bed along with a note wishing her well. Before she left, she had one last quick look at her sketch and noticed something curious about it. Rapunzel's face. It wasn't the all-purpose fairy tale princess sort of face you saw in so many illustrations. It was individual, unique, something Maggie prided herself on. More than that, though, Rapunzel's face half turned to the viewer, resembled Claire Toth's, even down to the two spots on her chin. Frowning, Maggie picked up her rubber and erased them before she went off to meet Lorraine Temple from the post. Banks hated hospitals, hated everything about them, and he had done so ever since he'd had his tonsils out at the age of nine. He hated the smell of them, the colours of the walls, the echoing sounds, the doctor's white coats and the uniforms the nurses wore, hated the beds, thermometers, syringes, stethoscopes, IVs, and the strange machines glimpsed behind half-open doors. Everything. If truth be told, he had hated it all since well before the tonsil experience. When his brother Roy was born, Banks was five, seven years too young to be allowed inside a hospital at visiting time. His mother had some problems with the pregnancy, those unspecified adult problems that grown-ups always seemed to be whispering about, and spent an entire month there, 
Those were the days when they'd let you hang on to a bed that long. Banks was sent away to live with his aunt and uncle in Northampton, and went to a new school for the whole period. He never settled in, and being the new boy, he had to stick up for himself against more than one bully. He remembered his uncle driving him to the hospital to see his mother one dark, cold winter's night, holding him up to the window. Thank God she was on the ground floor, so he could wipe the frost off with his wool mitten and see her swollen shape halfway along the ward and wave to her. He felt so sad. It must be a horrible place, he remembered thinking, that would keep a mother from her son and make her sleep in a room full of strange people when she was so poorly. The tonsillectomy had only confirmed what he already knew in the first place, and now he was older, hospitals still scared the shit out of him. He saw them as last resorts, places where one ends up, where one goes to die, and where the well-intentioned ministrations, the probing, pricking, slicing, and all the various ectomies of medical science only postpone the inevitable, filling one's last days on earth with torture, pain, and fear. Banks was a veritable Philip Larkin when it came to hospitals, could only think of the anaesthetic from which none come round. Lucy Payne was under guard at Leeds General Infirmary, not far from where her husband lay in intensive care after emergency surgery to remove skull splinters from his brain. The PC sitting outside her room, a dog-eared Tom Clancy paperback on the chair beside him, reported no comings or goings other than hospital staff. It had been a quiet night, he said. Lucky for some, Banks thought, as he entered the private room. The doctor was waiting inside. She introduced herself as Dr. Landsberg, no first name. Banks didn't want her there, but there was nothing he could do about it. Lucy Payne wasn't under arrest, but she was under the doctor's care. I'm afraid I can't give you very long with my patient, she said. She has suffered an extremely traumatic experience, and she needs rest more than anything. Banks looked at the woman in the bed. Half her face, including one eye, was covered with bandages. The eye that he could see was the same shiny black as the ink he liked to use in his fountain pen. Her skin was pale and smooth. Her raven's wing hair spread out over the pillow and sheets. He thought of Kimberly Meyer's body, spread-eagled on the mattress. That had happened in Lucy Payne's house, he reminded himself. Banks sat down beside Lucy, and Dr. Landsberg hovered like a lawyer waiting to interrupt when Banks overstepped his pace bounds. Lucy, he said, my name's Banks, Acting Detective Superintendent Banks. I'm in charge of the investigation into the five missing girls. How are you feeling? Not bad, Lucy answered, considering. Is there much pain? Some. My head hurts. How's Terry? What's happened to Terry? Nobody will tell me. Her voice sounded thick, as if her tongue were swollen, and her words were slurred. The medication. Perhaps if you just told me what happened last night, Lucy. Can you remember? Is Terry dead? Someone told me he was hurt. The concern of the abused wife for her abuser, if that was what he was witnessing, didn't surprise Banks very much at all. It was an old sad tune, and he had heard it many times before, in all its variations. Your husband was very badly injured, Lucy, Dr. Landsberg cut in. We're doing all we can for him. Banks cursed her under his breath. He didn't want Lucy Payne to know what kind of shape her husband was in. If she thought he wasn't going to survive, she could tell Banks whatever she wanted, knowing he'd have no way of checking whether it was true or not. Can you tell me what happened last night? he repeated. Lucy half closed her good eye. She was trying to remember, or pretending she was trying to remember. I don't know. I can't remember. Good answer, Banks realized. Wait and see what happens to Terry before admitting to anything. 
She was sharp, this one, even in her hospital bed under medication. Do I need a lawyer? she asked. Why would you need a lawyer? I don't know. When the police talk to people, you know, on television. We're not on television, Lucy. She wrinkled her nose. I know that, silly. I didn't mean... Never mind. What's the last thing you remember about what happened to you? I remember waking up, getting out of bed, putting on my dressing gown. It was late. Or early. Why did you get out of bed? I don't know. I must have heard something. What? A noise I can't remember. What did you do next? I don't know. I just remember getting up, and then it hurt and everything went dark. Do you remember having an argument with Terry? No. Did you go in the cellar? I don't think so. I don't remember. I might have done. Covering all the possibilities. Did you ever go in the cellar? That was Terry's room. He would have punished me. If I went down there, he kept it locked. Interesting, Banks thought. She could remember enough to distance herself from whatever they might have found in the cellar. Did she know? Forensics ought to be able to confirm whether she was telling the truth or not about going down there. It was the basic rule. Wherever you go, you leave something behind and take something with you. What did he do down there? Banks asked. I don't know. It was his own private den. So you never went down there? No, I didn't dare. What do you think he did down there? I don't know. Watch videos? Read books? Alone? A man needs his privacy sometimes, that's what Terry said. And you respected that? Yes. What about that poster on the door, Lucy? Did you ever see it? Only from the top of the steps, coming in from the garage. It's quite graphic, isn't it? What did you think of it? Lucy managed a thin smile. Men. Men are like that, aren't they? They like that sort of thing. So it didn't bother you? She did something with her lips that indicated it didn't. Superintendent, Dr. Landsberg cut in, I really think you ought to be going now and let my patient get some rest. Just a couple more questions, that's all. Lucy, do you remember who hurt you? I, I, it must have been Terry. There was no one else there, was there? Had Terry ever hit you before? She turned her head sideways, so the only side Banks could see was bandaged. You're upsetting her, Superintendent. I really must insist. Lucy, did you ever see Terry with Kimberly Myers? You do know who Kimberly Myers is, don't you? Lucy turned to face him again. Yes, she's that poor girl that went missing. That's right. Did you ever see Terry with her? I don't remember. She was a pupil at Silver Hill, where Terry taught. Did he ever mention her? I don't think so. I. You don't remember? No, I'm sorry. What's wrong? What's happening? Can I see Terry? I'm afraid you can't. Not at the moment, said Dr. Landsberg. Then she turned to Banks. I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. You can see how agitated Lucy is becoming. When can I talk to her again? I'll let you know. Soon, please. She took Banks by the arm. Banks knew when he was beaten. Besides, the interview was going nowhere. He didn't know whether Lucy was telling the truth about not remembering or whether she was confused because of her medication. Get some rest, Lucy, Dr. Landsberg said as they left. Mr. Banks, superintendent. It was Lucy, her small, thick, slurred voice, her obsidian eye fixing him in its gaze. Yes? When can I go home? Banks had a mental image of what home would look like right now, and probably for the next month or more, under construction. I don't know, he said. We'll be in touch. Outside in the corridor, Banks turned to Dr. Landsberg. Can you help me with something, Doctor? Perhaps. 
her not remembering, is that symptomatic? Dr. Landsberg rubbed her eyes. She looked as if she got about as much sleep as Banks did. Someone paged to Dr. Thorson over the PA system. It's possible, she said. In cases like this, there's often post-traumatic stress disorder, one of the effects of which can be retrograde amnesia. Do you think that's the case with Lucy? Too early to say, and I'm not an expert in the field. You'd have to talk to a neurologist. All I can say is that we're pretty certain there's no physical brain damage, but emotional stress can be a factor too. Is this memory loss selective? What do you mean? She seems to remember her husband was hurt, and that he was the one who hit her, but nothing else. It's possible, yes. Is it likely to be permanent? Not necessarily. So her complete memory might come back? In time? How long? Impossible to say. As early as tomorrow, as late as, well, maybe never. We know so little about the brain. Thank you, Doctor. You've been very helpful. Dr. Landsberg gave him a puzzled glance. Not at all, she said. Superintendent, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I had a word with Dr. Mugabe, he's Terence Payne's doctor, just before you came. Yes? He's very concerned. Oh? This was what D.C. Hodgkins had told Banks the day before. Yes. It seems as if his patient was assaulted by a policewoman. Not my case, said Banks. Dr. Landsberg's eyes widened. Just like that, you're not at all concerned? Whether I'm concerned or not doesn't enter into it. Someone else is investigating the assault on Terence Payne, and will no doubt be talking to Dr. Mugabe in due course. My interest is in the five dead girls and the Paynes. Goodbye, Doctor. And Banks walked off down the corridor, footsteps echoing, leaving Dr. Landsberg to her dark thoughts. An orderly pushed a wave-faced, wrinkled old man past on a gurney. IV hooked up, on his way to surgery by the look of things. Banks shuddered and walked faster. Chapter 7 One good thing about the family-style chain pubs, thought Maggie, was that nobody raised an eyebrow if you only ordered a pot of tea or a cup of coffee, which was all she wanted when she met Lorraine Temple at the woodcutter that Tuesday lunchtime. Lorraine was a plump, petite brunette, with an easy manner and an open face, a face you could trust. She was about Maggie's age, early thirties, wearing black jeans and jacket over a white silk blouse. She bought the coffees and put Maggie at ease with some small talk and sympathetic noises about the recent events on the hill. Then she got down to business. She used a notebook rather than a tape recorder, Maggie was glad to see. For some reason, she didn't like the idea of her voice, her words being recorded as sounds, but as squiggles on the page, they hardly seemed to matter. Do you use shorthand? she asked, thinking nobody used that any more. Lorraine smiled up at her. My own version. Would you like something to eat? No, thanks, I'm not hungry. OK, we'll start then, if that's all right with you. Maggie tensed a little, waiting for the questions. The pub was quiet, mostly because it was a weekday, and the bottom of the hill was hardly a tourist area or a business centre. There were a couple of industrial estates nearby, but it wasn't quite lunchtime yet. Pop music played on the jukebox at an acceptable level, and even the few children in the family room seemed more subdued than she would have expected. Maybe the recent events had got to everyone in one way or another. It felt as if a pall lay over the place. Can you tell me how it happened? Lorraine asked first. Maggie thought for a moment. Well, I don't sleep very well, and maybe I was awake or it woke me up, I'm not sure. But I heard noises across the street. What noises? Voices arguing. A man's and a woman's. Then a sound of glass breaking, then a thud. And you know this was coming from across the street? Yes. When I looked out of the window, there was a light on, and I thought I saw a shadow pass across it. Lorraine paused a moment to catch up with her notes. Why were you so sure it was a domestic incident? she asked, as she had done over the phone. It just... I mean... 
Take your time, Maggie. I don't want to rush you. Think back. Try to remember. Maggie ran her hand over her hair. Well, I didn't know for certain, she said. I suppose I just assumed, from the raised voices and, you know. Did you recognise the voices? No, they were too muffled. But it could have been someone fighting off a burglar, couldn't it? I understand there's quite a high burglary rate in this area. That's true. So what I'm getting at, Maggie, is that maybe there was some other reason you thought you were witnessing a domestic argument. Maggie paused. Her moment of decision had arrived, and when it came, it was more difficult than she thought it would be. For one thing, she didn't want her name splashed all over the papers, in case Bill saw it back in Toronto, though she very much doubted that even he would come this far to get at her. There was little likelihood of such exposure, with a regional daily like the Post, of course, but if the national press got onto it, that would be another matter. This was a big story, and the odds were that it would at least make the National Post and the Globe and Mail back home. On the other hand, she had to remember her goal, focus on what was important here, Lucy's predicament. First and foremost, she was talking to Lorraine Temple in order to get the image of Lucy the victim in people's minds. Call it a preemptive strike. The more the public saw her that way from the start, the less likely they were to believe that she was the embodiment of evil. All people knew so far was that the body of Kimberly Myers had been found in the Payne cellar, and a policeman had been killed, most likely by Terence Payne. But everyone knew they were digging there, and everyone knew what they were likely to find. Maybe there was, she said. Could you elaborate on that? Maggie sipped some coffee. It was lukewarm. In Toronto, she remembered, they would come round and refill your cup once or twice. Not here. I might have had reason to believe that Lucy Payne was in danger from her husband. Did she tell you that? Yes. That her husband abused her? Yes. What do you think of Terence Payne? Not much, really. Do you like him? Not particularly. Not at all, Maggie admitted to herself. Terence Payne very much gave her the creeps. She didn't know why, but she would cross the street if she saw him coming, rather than meet, say hello, and make small talk about the weather, all the time with him looking at her in that curiously empty, dispassionate way he had, as if she were a butterfly pinned to a felt pad, or a frog on the table ready for dissection. As far as she knew, though, she was the only one to feel that way. He was handsome and charming on the surface, and according to Lucy he was popular at school, both with the kids and with his colleagues on the staff. But there was still something about him that put Maggie off, an emptiness at his centre that she found disturbing. With most people, she felt that whatever it was she communicated, whatever radar or sonar beam went out, bounced off something and came back in some manner, made some sort of blip on the screen. With Terry, it didn't. It disappeared in the vast, sprawling darkness inside him, where it echoed forever unheard. That was the only way she could explain how she felt about Terry Payne. She admitted to herself that she might be imagining it, responding to some deep fear or inadequacy of her own and God knew there were enough of those. So she had resolved to try to like him for Lucy's sake, but it had been difficult. What did you do after Lucy told you this? Talk to her? Try to persuade her to seek professional help? Have you ever worked with abused women? No, not really, I... Were you a victim of abuse yourself? Maggie felt herself tightening up inside. Her head started to spin. She reached for her cigarettes, offered one to Lorraine, who refused, then lit up. She had never talked about the details of her life with Bill, the pattern of violence and remorse, blows and presence, with anyone here except her psychiatrist and Lucy Payne. I'm not here to talk about me, she said. 
I don't want you to write about me. I'm here to talk about Lucy. I don't know what happened in that house, but it's my feeling that Lucy was as much a victim as anything else. Lorraine put her notebook aside and finished her coffee. You're Canadian, aren't you? she asked. Surprised, Maggie answered that she was. Where from? Toronto. Why? Just curious, that's all. I've got a cousin lives there. That house you're living in. Tell me, but doesn't it belong to Ruth Everett, the illustrator? Yes, it does. I thought so. I interviewed her there once. She seems like a nice person. She's been a good friend. How did you meet, if you don't mind me asking? We met professionally at a convention a few years ago. So you're an illustrator too? Yes, children's books, mostly. Perhaps we can do a feature on you and your work. I'm not very well known. Illustrators really are. Even so, we're always looking for local celebrities. Maggie felt herself blush. Well, I'm hardly that. I'll talk with my features editor anyway, if that's okay with you. I'd rather you didn't, if that's all right. But please, no, okay? Lorraine held her hand up. All right. I've never known anyone turn down a bit of free publicity before, but if you insist. She put a notebook and pencil in her handbag. I must be going now, she said. Thank you for talking to me. Maggie watched her leave, feeling oddly apprehensive. She looked at her watch. Time for a little walk around the pond before heading back to work. Well, you certainly know how to pamper a girl, Tracy said as Banks led her into the McDonald's at the corner of Brigget and Boer Lane later that afternoon. Banks laughed. I thought all kids love McDonald's. Tracy nudged him in the ribs. Enough of the kid, please, she said. I'm twenty now, you know. For one horrible moment, Banks feared he might have forgotten her birthday. But no, it was back in February, before the task force, and he had sent a card, given her some money, and taken her out to dinner at Brasserie 44, a very expensive dinner. Not even a teenager any more, then, he said. That's right. And it was true. Tracy was a young woman now, an attractive one at that. It almost broke Banks's heart to see how much she resembled Sandra twenty years ago. The same willowy figure, with the same dark eyebrows, high cheekbones, hair in a long blonde ponytail, stray tresses tucked behind her delicate ears. She even echoed some of Sandra's mannerisms, such as biting her lower lip when she was concentrating, and winding strands of hair around her fingers as she talked. She was dressed like a student today. Blue jeans, white t-shirt with a rock band's logo, denim jacket carrying a backpack and she moved with assurance and grace. A young woman, no doubt about it. Banks had returned her phone call that morning, and they had arranged to meet for a late lunch after her last lecture of the day. He had also told Christopher Ray that they hadn't found his daughter's body yet. They stood in line. The place was full of office workers on afternoon break, truant school kids and mothers with prams and toddlers, taking a break from their shopping. What do you want? Banks asked. My treat. In that case, I'll have the full Monty. Big Mac, large fries and large Coke. Sure, that's all. We'll see about a sweet later. It'll bring you out in spots. No, it won't. I never come out in spots. It was true. Tracy had always had a flawless complexion. School friends had often hated her for it. You'll get fat, then. She patted her flat stomach and pulled a face at him. She had inherited his metabolism, which allowed him to live on beer and junk food and still remain lean. They got their food and sat at a plastic table near the window. It was a warm afternoon. Women wore bright sleeveless summer dresses, and the men had their suit jackets slung over their shoulders and their shirt sleeves rolled up. How's Damon? Banks asked. We've decided not to see each other till after exams. There was something about Tracy's tone that indicated there was more to it than that. Boyfriend trouble? With the monosyllabic Damon, who had spirited her off to Paris last November, when Banks himself should have been with her instead of hunting down Chief Constable Riddle's wayward daughter. 
He didn't want to make her talk about it. She would get to it in her own time if she wanted to. He couldn't make her talk anyway. Tracy had always been a very private person, and could be as stubborn as he was when it came to discussing her feelings. He bit into his Big Mac. Special sauce oozed down his chin. He wiped it off with a serviette. Tracy was already halfway through her burger, and the chips were disappearing quickly too. I'm sorry I haven't been in touch very often lately, Banks said. I've been very busy. Story of my life, said Tracy. I suppose so. She put her hand on his arm. I'm only teasing, Dad. I've got nothing to complain about. You've got plenty. But it's nice of you not to say so. Anyway, apart from Damon, how are you? I'm fine. Studying hard. Some people say second year's harder than finals. And he plans for the summer. I might go to France again. Charlotte's parents have a cottage in the Dordogne, but they're going to be in America, and they said she can take a couple of friends down if she wants. Lucky you. Tracy finished her Big Mac and sipped some coke through her straw, looking closely at Banks. You look tired, Dad, she said. I suppose I am. Your job? Yes, it's a lot of responsibility. Keeps me awake at night. I'm not at all certain I'm cut out for it. I'm sure you're just wonderful. Such faith, but I don't know. I've never run such a big investigation before, and I'm not sure I ever want to again. But you've caught him, Tracy said. A chameleon killer. Looks that way. Congratulations, I knew you would. I didn't do anything. The whole thing was a series of accidents. Well, the result's the same, isn't it? True. Look, Dad, I know why you haven't been in touch. You've been busy, yes, but it's more than that, isn't it? Banks pushed his half-eaten burger aside and worked on the chips. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You probably held yourself personally responsible for those girls' abductions, the way you always do, didn't you? I wouldn't say that. I'll bet you thought that if you relax your vigilance for just one single moment, he'd get someone else, another young woman, just like me, didn't you? Banks applauded his daughter's perception, and she did have blonde hair. Well, there may be a grain of truth in that, he said. Just a tiny grain. Was it really horrible down there? I don't want to talk about it. Not at lunch. Not with you. I suppose you think I've been nosy for sensation like a newspaper reporter. But I worry about you. You're not made of stone, you know. You let these things get to you. For a daughter, said Banks, you do a pretty good impersonation of a nagging wife. Immediately the words were out of his mouth, he regretted them. It brought the spectre of Sandra between them again. Tracy, like Brian, had struggled not to take sides in the breakup. But whereas Brian had taken an immediate dislike to Sean, Sandra's new companion, Tracy got along with him quite well, and that hurt Banks, though he would never tell her. Have you talked to Mum lately? Tracy asked, ignoring his criticism. You know I haven't. Tracy sipped some more coke, frowned like her mother, and stared out of the window. Why? Banks asked, sensing a change in the atmosphere. Is there something I should know? I was down there at Easter. I know you were. Did she say something about me? Banks knew he had been dragging his feet over the divorce. The whole thing had just seemed too hurried to him, and he wasn't inclined to hurry, seeing no reason. So Sandra wanted to marry Sean, make it legal, big deal. Let them wait. It's not that, Tracy said. What then? You really don't know? I'd say if I did. Oh, shit. Tracy bit her lip. I wish I'd never got into this. Why do I have to be the one? Because you started it. And don't swear. Now, give. Tracy looked down at her empty chip carton and sighed. All right, she told me not to say anything to you yet, but you'll find out eventually. Remember, you asked for it. Tracy, okay, okay. Mum's pregnant. 
That's what it's all about. She's three months pregnant. She's having Sean's baby. Not long after Banks had left Lucy Payne's room, Annie Cabot strode down the corridors of the hospital to her appointment with Dr. Mugabe. She hadn't been at all satisfied with P.C. Taylor's statement and needed to check out the medical angle as far as it was possible to do so. Of course, Payne wasn't dead, so there would be no post-mortem, at least not yet. If he had done what it very much seemed that he had, then Annie thought it might not be such a bad idea to carry out a post-mortem on him while he was still alive. Come in, called Dr. Mugabe. Annie went in. The office was small and functional, with a couple of bookcases full of medical texts, a filing cabinet whose top drawer wouldn't shut, and the inevitable computer on the desk, a laptop. Various medical degrees and honours hung on the cream-painted walls, and a pewter-framed photograph stood on the desk facing the doctor, a family picture, Annie guessed. There was no skull beside it, though, nor was there a skeleton standing in the corner. Dr. Mugabe was smaller than Annie had imagined, and his voice was higher in pitch. His skin was a shiny purple-black and his short curly hair grey. He also had small hands, but the fingers were long and tapered. A brain surgeon's fingers, Annie thought, though she had nothing for comparison. And the thought of them poking their way through the grey matter made her stomach lurch. Pianist's fingers, she decided. Much easier to live with or artist's fingers, like a father's. He leaned forward and linked his hands on the desk. I'm glad you're here, Detective Inspector Cabot, he said with a voice straight out of Oxford. Indeed, if the police hadn't seen fit to call, I would have felt obliged to bring them in myself. Mr. Payne was most brutally beaten. Always willing to be of service, said Annie. What can you tell me about the patient, in layman's terms, if you please? Dr. Mugabe inclined his head slightly. Of course, he said, as if he already knew the elite technical mumbo-jumbo of his profession would be wasted on an ignorant copper such as Annie. Mr. Payne was admitted with serious head wounds, resulting in brain damage. He also had a broken ulna. So far, we have operated on him twice, once to relieve a subdural hematoma. That's... I know what a hematoma is said Annie. Very well. The second to remove skull fragments from the brain. I could be more specific, if you wish. Go ahead. Dr. Mugabe stood up and started walking back and forth behind his desk, hands clasped behind his back, as if he were delivering a lecture. When he came to name the various parts, he pointed to them on his own skull as he paced. The human brain is essentially made up of the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. The cerebrum is uppermost, divided into two hemispheres by a deep groove at the top, giving what you have probably heard called right brain and left brain. Do you follow? I think so. Prominent grooves also divide each hemisphere into lobes. The frontal lobe is the largest. There are also parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. The cerebellum is at the base of the skull behind the brainstem. When Dr. Mugabe had finished, he sat down again, looking very pleased with himself. How many blows were there? Annie asked. It's difficult to be specific at this stage, said Dr. Mugabe. I was concerned merely with saving the man's life, you understand, not with conducting an autopsy. But at an estimate, I'd say two blows to the left temple, perhaps three. They caused the most damage to begin with, including the hematoma and skull fragments. There is also evidence of one or two blows at the top of the cranium, denting the skull. The top of his head. The cranium is that part of the head which isn't the face, yes. Hard blows, as if someone hit directly down on it. Possibly, but I can't be a judge of that. They would have been incapacitating, but not life-threatening. The top of the cranium is hard, and though the skull there was dented and fractured, as I said, the bone didn't splinter. Annie made some notes. Those weren't the most damaging injuries, though, Dr. Mugabe added. Oh, no. 
The most serious injury was caused by one or more blows to the back of the head, the brain stem area. You see, that contains the medulla oblongata, which is the heart, blood vessel, and breathing center of the brain. Any serious injury to that can be fatal. Yet Mr. Payne is still alive. Barely. Is there a possibility of permanent brain damage? There already is permanent brain damage. If Mr. Payne recovers, he may well spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair, in need of twenty-four-hour-a-day care. The only good thing is that he probably won't be aware of that fact. This injury to the medulla, could it have occurred as Mr. Payne fell back against the wall? Dr. Mugabe rubbed his chin. Again, it's not my place to do the police job, or the pathologist, Detective Inspector. Suffice to say that, in my opinion, these wounds were caused by the same blunt instrument as the others. Make of that what you will, he leaned forward. In the simplest layman's terms, this man received a most vicious beating about the head, Detective Inspector. Most vicious, I hope you believe as I do, that the perpetrator should be brought to justice. Shit, thought Annie, putting her notebook away. Of course, Doctor she said, heading for the door. You will keep me informed, won't you? You can count on it. Annie looked at her watch. Time to head back to Eastvale and prepare her daily report for Detective Superintendent Chambers. After lunch with Tracy, Banks wandered around Leeds City Centre in a daze, thinking of the news she had given him. The matter of Sandra's pregnancy had hit him harder than he would have expected after so long a part. He realised as he stood and gazed in Curry's window on Brigitte, hardly taking in the display of computers, camcorders and stereo systems. He had last seen her in London the previous November, when he was down there searching for Chief Constable Riddle's runaway daughter, Emily. Looking back, he felt foolish for the way he had approached that meeting, full of confidence that because he had applied for a job with a national crime squad that would take him back to live in London, Sandra would see the error of her ways, dump the temper of Sean, and run back into Banks's arms. Wrong. Instead, she had told Banks that she wanted a divorce because she and Sean wanted to get married, and that cathartic event, he thought, had flushed Sandra out of his system forever, along with any thoughts of moving to the NCS until Tracy told him about the pregnancy. Banks hadn't thought, hadn't suspected for a moment, that they wanted to get married because they wanted to have a baby. What on earth did Sandra think she was playing at? The idea of a half-brother or sister for Brian and Tracy, twenty years younger, seemed unreal to Banks, and the thought of Sean, whom he had never met, being the father, seemed even more absurd. He tried to imagine their conversations leading up to the decision, the love-making, the maternal desire rekindled in Sandra after so many years, and even the shadowiest of imaginings made him feel sick. He didn't know her, this woman in her early forties, who wanted a baby with a boyfriend she had hardly been with for five minutes, and that also made Banks feel sad. Banks was in borders looking at the colourful display of bestsellers, and he didn't even remember walking into the shop when his mobile rang. He went outside and ducked into the Victoria Quarter before answering, leaning near the entrance across from the Harvey Nichols Café. It was Stefan. Alan, I thought you'd like to know ASAP. We've identified the three bodies in the cellar. Got lucky with the dentists. We'll still run the DNA, though, cross-check with the parents. That's great, said Banks snapping back from his gloomy thoughts of Sandra and Sean. And Melissa Horrocks, Samantha Foster and Kelly Matthews. What? I said, I know. I heard what you said, I just... People were walking by with their shopping, and Banks didn't want to be overheard. To be truthful, he also still felt like a bit of a dickhead talking on his mobile in public, though from what he saw around him, nobody else did. He had even once witnessed a father sitting in a Helmthorpe cafe phone his daughter in the playground across the road when it was time to go home and curse because the kid had switched her mobile off 
so he had to walk across the road and shout to her instead. I'm just surprised, that's all. Why, what's wrong? It's the sequence, Banks said. It's all wrong. He lowered his voice and hoped that Stefan could still hear him. Working backwards, Kimberly Myers, Melissa Horrocks, Leanne Ray, Samantha Foster, Kelly Matthews. One of the three should be Leanne Ray. Why isn't she there? A little girl holding her mother's hand gave Banks a curious look as they passed him by in the arcade. Banks switched off his mobile and headed towards Milgarth. Jenny Fuller was surprised to find Banks ringing her doorbell that evening. It was a long time since he had visited her at home. They had met many times for coffee or drinks, even lunch or dinner, but rarely had he come here. Jenny had often wondered whether this was anything to do with that clumsy attempt at seduction, the first time they had worked together. Come in, she said, and Banks followed her through the narrow hall into the high-ceilinged living room. She had redecorated and rearranged the furniture since his last visit, and noticed him glancing around in that policeman's way of his checking it out. Well, the expensive stereo was the same, and the sofa, she thought, smiling to herself, was the very same one where she had tried to seduce him. She had bought a small television and video when she got back from America, having picked up the habit of watching there. But apart from the wallpaper and carpeting, nothing much else had changed. She noticed his gaze settle on the Emily Carr print over the fireplace, a huge, dark, steep mountain dominating a village in the foreground. Jenny had fallen in love with Emily Carr's work when she was doing postgraduate work in Vancouver and had bought that print to bring back as a reminder of her three years there. Happy years, for the most part. Drink, she asked. Whatever you're pouring. Knew I could count on you. I'm sorry I don't have any Lefroy. Is red wine okay? Fine. Jenny went to pour the wine and noticed Banks walk over to the window. The green looked peaceful enough in the golden evening sunlight. Long shadows, dark green leaves, people walking their dogs, kids holding hands. Perhaps he was remembering the second time he visited her, Jenny thought with a shudder as she poured the Sainsbury's Cote de Rhone. A drugged-out kid called Mick Webster had held her hostage with a handgun, and Banks had managed to defuse the situation. The kid's mood swings had been extreme, and the whole thing had been touch and go for a while. Jenny had been terrified. Ever since that day, she had been unable to listen to Tosca, which had been playing in the background at the time. When she had poured the wine, she shook off the bad memory, put a CD of Mozart's string quartets on, and carried the glasses over to the sofa. Cheers! They clinked glasses. Banks looked as tired as Jenny had ever seen him. His skin was pale, and even his normally sharp and lean features seemed to be sagging on the bone the way his suit sagged on his frame, and his eyes seemed more deeply set than usual, duller, lacking their usual sparkle. Still, she told herself, the poor sod probably hasn't had a decent night's sleep since he was put in charge of the task force. She wanted to reach out and touch his face, smooth away the cares, but she didn't dare risk rejection again. So, to what do I owe the honour? Jenny said. I'm assuming it's not just my irresistible company that's brought you here. Banks smiled. It made him look a little better, she thought. A little. I'd like to say it was, he answered, but I'd be a liar if I did. And God forbid you should ever be a liar, Alan Banks, such an honourable man. But couldn't you be a, a bit less honourable sometimes? The rest of us human beings, well, we can't help the occasional untruth. But you, no, you can't even lie to give a girl a compliment. Jenny, I just couldn't stay away. Some inner force drove me to your house, compelled me to seek you out. I just knew I had to come. Jenny laughed and waved him down. All right, all right. That's enough. Honourable is much better. She ran her hand through her hair. How Sandra? Sandra's pregnant. Jenny shook her head, as if she had been slapped. 
She's what? She's pregnant. I'm sorry to state it so abruptly, but I can't think of a better way. That's all right. I'm just a bit gobsmacked. You and me both. How do you feel about it? You sound like a psychologist. I am a psychologist. I know. But you don't have to sound like one. How do I feel about it? I don't know yet. When you get right down to it, it's none of my business, is it? I let go the night she asked for a divorce, so she could marry Sean. Is that why? Yes. They want to get married, make the kid legal. Did you talk to her? No. Tracy told me. Sandra and I, well, we don't communicate much anymore. That's sad, Alan. Maybe. Still a lot of anger and bitterness? Funnily enough, there isn't. Oh, I know I might sound a bit upset, but it was the shock, that's all. I mean, there was a lot of anger. But it was sort of a revelation when she asked for the divorce, a release. I knew then that it was really over and that I should just get on with my life. And? And I have done for the most part. But residual feelings surprise you sometimes? Creep up behind you and hit you on the back of your head? I suppose you could say that. Welcome to the human race, Alan. You ought to know by now that you don't stop having feelings for someone just because you split up. It was all new to me. She was the only woman I'd been with for any length of time. The only one I wanted. Now I know what it feels like. Naturally, I wish them all the best. Meow. There you go again. Banks laughed. No, really, I do. Jenny sensed that there was something he wasn't telling her. But she also knew that he guarded his feelings when he wanted to. And she would get nowhere if she pushed him. Best move on to the business at hand, she thought. And if he wants to say anything more about Sandra, he'll say it in his own time. That wasn't why you came to see me either, was it? Not really. Maybe partly. But I do want to talk to you about the case. Any new developments? Just one. Banks told her about the identification of the three bodies and how he found it puzzling. Curious, Jenny agreed. I would have expected some sort of sequence, too. They're still digging outside. Oh, yes. They'll be out there for a while. There wasn't much room in that little cellar. Just enough for about three, true, said Banks. But that still doesn't explain why it isn't the most recent three. Anyway, I'd just like to go over some stuff with you. Remember when you suggested quite early on that the killer might have had an accomplice? It was only a remote possibility. Despite the inordinate amounts of publicity your Wests and Bradys and Hindleys get, the killer couple is still a rare phenomenon. I assume you're thinking of Lucy Payne. Banks sipped some wine. I talked to her at the hospital. She... Well, she said she didn't remember much about what happened. Not surprising, said Jenny. Retrograde amnesia. That's what Dr. Landsberg said. It's not that I don't believe in it. I've come across it before. It's just so damn... Convenient? That's one way of putting it. Jenny, I just couldn't get over the feeling that she was waiting, calculating, stalling in some way. Waiting for what? waiting to see which way the wind was going to blow, as if she can't work out what to say until she knows what's happening with Terry. And it would make sense, wouldn't it? What would? The way the girls were taken. A girl walking home on her own would be most unlikely to stop and give directions, say, to a male driver, but she might stop if a woman called her over. And the man? Crouched down in the back seat with a chloroform ready? Jumps out the back door and drags her in? I don't know the details, but it makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, it makes sense. Have you got any other evidence of her complicity? None. But it's early days yet. The Sockos are still going through the house, and the lab boys are working on the clothes she was wearing when she was assaulted. Even that might come to nothing if she says she went down in the cellar, saw what her husband had done, and ran away screaming. That's what I mean about her waiting to see which way the wind blows. If Terence Payne dies, Lucy's home free. If he lives, his memory could be damaged irretrievably. He is very badly hurt, 
and even if he recovers, he might decide to protect her, gloss over what part she played. If she played a part, she certainly couldn't rely on his memory being damaged or his dying. That's true. But it might have given her the perfect opportunity to cover up her own involvement, if there was any. You had a look around the house, didn't you? Yes. What was your impression? Jenny sipped some wine and thought about it. The magazine perfect decor, the little knick-knacks, the obsessive cleanliness. I suppose you're thinking of the videos and books, she said. Partly. There looked to be some pretty raunchy stuff, especially in the bedroom. So they're into porn and kinky sex, so what? She raised her eyebrows. As a matter of fact, I've got a couple of soft porn videos in my bedroom. I don't mind a little kinkiness now and then. Oh, don't blush, Alan. I'm not trying to seduce you. I'm simply pointing out that a few videos featuring three-way sex and a bit of mild consensual S&M don't necessarily make a killer. I know that. And while it is true, Jenny went on, that statistically most sex killers are into pornography of an extreme kind, it's false logic to argue the opposite. I know that too, said Banks. What about the occult connection? I wondered about the candles and incense in the cellar. Could be just for atmosphere. But there was a sort of ritual element. Possibly. I was even wondering if there could be some connection there with a the fourth victim, Melissa Horrocks. She was into that satanic rock music stuff, you know, Marilyn Manson and the rest. Or maybe Payne just has an extreme sense of irony in his choice of victims. But look, Alan, even if Lucy did get off on the kinky stuff and Satanism, it's hardly evidence of anything else, is it? I'm not asking for court evidence. At the moment, I'll take anything I can get. Jenny laughed, clutching at straws again. Maybe so. Ken Blackstone reckons Payne might also be the Seacroft rapist. Seacroft rapist? Two years ago. Between May and August, you were in America. A man raped six women in Seacroft, never caught. It turns out Payne was living there, single, at the time. He met Lucy that July and they moved to the hill around the beginning of September when he started teaching at Silver Hill. The rape stopped. It wouldn't be the first time a serial killer was a rapist first. Indeed not. Anyway, they're working on DNA. Have a smoke if you want, Jenny said. I can see you're getting all twitchy. Am I? I will then, if you don't mind. Jenny brought him an ashtray. She kept in the sideboard for the occasional visitor who smoked. Though a non-smoker herself, she wasn't as fanatical about not allowing any smoking in her house as some of her friends were. In fact, her time in California had made her hate the Nico nazis even more than the smokers. What do you want me to do? she asked. Your job, said Banks, leaning forward. And the way I see it now is that we've probably got enough to convict Terry Payne ten times over, if he survives. It's Lucy I'm interested in, and time's running out. What do you mean? Banks drew on his cigarette before answering. As long as she stays in hospital, we're fine. But as soon as she's released, we can only hold her for 24 hours. Oh, we can get extensions. Maybe, in an extreme case like this, up to 96 hours. But we'd better damn well have something solid to go on if we're going to do that, or she walks. I still think it's more than possible that she had nothing to do with the killings. Something woke her up that night, and her husband wasn't there. So she looked around the house for him saw the lights in the cellar, went down and saw... But why hadn't she noticed before, Jenny? Why hadn't she been down there before? She was afraid to. It sounds as if she's terrified of her husband. Look at what happened to her when she did go down. I know that, but Kimberly Myers was the fifth victim, for God's sake. The fifth! Why did it take Lucy so long to find out? Why did she wake up and go exploring only this time? She said she never went down in the cellar, that she didn't dare. What was so different about this time? Perhaps she didn't want to know before. 
But don't forget, the way it looks is that pain was escalating, unravelling. I'd guess he was fast becoming highly unstable. Perhaps this time even she couldn't look away. Jenny watched Banks take a contemplative drag on his cigarette and let the smoke out slowly. You think so? he said. It's possible, isn't it? Earlier, if her husband was behaving strangely, she might have suspected that he had some sort of horrible secret vice, and she wanted to pretend it wasn't there, the way most of us do with bad things. Sweep it under the carpet. Or play the ostrich. Bury her head in the sand, yes. Why not? So we're both agreed that there are any number of possibilities to explain what happened, and that Lucy Payne might be innocent. Where are you going with this, Alan? I want you to dig deep into Lucy Payne's background. I want you to find out all you can about her. I want... But, no, let me finish, Jenny. I want you to get to know her inside out, her background, her childhood, her family, her fantasies, her hopes, her fears. Slow down, Alan. What's the point of all this? You might come across something that implicates her, or absolves her. Banks held his hands out, palms open. If that's what you find, fine. I'm not asking you to make anything up, just dig. Even if I do, I might not come up with anything useful at all. Doesn't matter. At least we'll have tried. Isn't this a police job? Banks stubbed out his cigarette. Not really. I'm after an evaluation here. An in-depth psychological profile of Lucy Payne. Of course, we'll check out any leads you might stumble across. I don't expect you to play detective. Well, I'm grateful for that. Think about it, Jenny. If she's guilty, she didn't just start helping her husband abduct and kill young girls out of the blue on New Year's Eve. There has to be some pathology, some background of psychological disturbance, some abnormal pattern of behaviour, doesn't there? There usually is. But even if I find out that she was a bedwetter, liked to start fires and torture animals, it still won't give you anything you can use against her in court. It will if someone was hurt in the fire. It will if you find out about any other mysterious events in her life that we can investigate. That's all I'm asking, Jenny. That you make a start on the psychopathology of Lucy Payne. And if you turn up anything we should investigate further, you let us know and we do it. And if I turn up nothing, then we go nowhere. But we're already nowhere. Jenny sipped some more wine and thought for a moment. Alan seemed so intense about it that she was feeling browbeaten, and she didn't want to give in just because of that. But she was intrigued by his request. She couldn't deny that the enigma of Lucy Payne interested her both professionally and as a woman. She had never had the chance to probe the psychology of a possible serial killer up close before. And Banks was right that if Lucy Payne were complicit in her husband's acts, then she hadn't just come from nowhere. If Jenny dug deeply enough, there was a chance that she might find something in Lucy's past. After that, well, Banks had said that was the police's job. And he was right about that, too. She topped up their wine glasses. What if I agree? she asked. Where do I start? Right here said Banks, digging out his notebook. There's a friend from the NatWest branch where Lucy Payne worked. One of our teams went and talked to the employees, and there's only one of them who knows her well. Name's Pat Mitchell. Then there's Clive and Hilary Liversedge, Lucy's parents. They live out Hullway. Do they know? Of course they know. What do you think we are? Jenny raised a fine plucked eyebrow. They know. How did they react? Upset, of course. Stunned, even. But according to the DC who interviewed them, they weren't much help. They hadn't been in close touch with Lucy since she married Terry. Have they been to see her in hospital? No. Seems the mother's too ill to travel and the father's a reluctant caregiver. What about his parents, Terry's? As far as we've been able to work out, 
Banks said. His mother's in a mental asylum. Has been for fifteen years or so. What's wrong with her? Schizophrenia. And the father? Died two years ago. What of? Massive stroke. He was a butcher in Halifax. Had a record for minor sex offences. Exposing himself, peeping, that sort of thing. Sounds a pretty classic background for someone like Terry Payne, wouldn't you say? If there is such a thing. The miracle is that Terry managed to become a teacher. Jenny laughed. Oh, they'll let anyone in the classroom these days. Besides, that's not the miracle. What is? That he managed to hold on to the job for so long. And that he was married. Usually, serial sex offenders such as Terence Payne find it hard to hold down a job and maintain a relationship. Our man did both. Is that significant? It's intriguing. If I'd been pushed for a profile a month or so ago, I'd have said you were looking for a man between twenty and thirty, most likely living alone and working at some sort of menial job or a succession of such jobs. Just shows how wrong one can be, doesn't it? Will you do it? Jenny toyed with the stem of her glass. The Mozart ended and left only the memory of music. A car passed by and a dog barked on the green. She had the time to do as Banks asked. She had a lecture to give on Friday morning, but it was one she had given a hundred times so she didn't need to prepare. Then she had nothing until a string of tutorials on Monday. That should give her plenty of time. As I said, it's intriguing. I'll need to talk to Lucy herself. That can be arranged. You are our official consultant psychologist, after all. Easy for you to say that now you need me. I've known it all along. Don't let a few narrow-minded... All right, said Jenny. You've made your point. I can take being laughed at behind my back by a bunch of thick plods. I'm a big girl. When can I talk to her? Best do it as soon as possible, while she's still only a witness. Believe it or not, but defence lawyers have been known to claim that psychologists have tricked suspects into incriminating themselves. How about tomorrow morning? I've got to be down at the hospital for the next post-mortem at eleven anyway. Lucky you. OK. I'll give you a lift if you like. No. I'll go straight over to talk to the parents after I've talked to Lucy and her friend. I'll need my car. Meet you there. Ten o'clock, then. Fine. Banks told her how to find Lucy's room. And I'll let the parents know you're coming. Banks gave her the details. You'll do it, then. What I'm asking. Doesn't look as if I have much choice, does it? Banks stood up, leaned forward and kissed her swiftly on the cheek. Even though she could smell the wine and smoke on his breath, her heart jumped, and she wished his lips had lingered a little longer, moved a little closer to her own. Hey, any more of that, she said, and I'll have you up on sexual harassment charges. Chapter 8 Banks and Jenny walked past the police guard into Lucy Payne's room just after ten o'clock the following morning. There was no doctor standing over them this time, Banks was happy to note. Lucy lay propped against the pillows reading a fashion magazine. The slats of the blinds let in some of the morning sun, lighting the vase of tulips on the bedside table, forming a pattern of bars over Lucy's face and the white bedsheets. Her glossy black hair was spread out on the pillow around her hospital pale face. The colours of her bruises had deepened since the previous day, which meant they were on the mend and she still wore half her head swathed in bandages. Her good eye, long-lashed, dark and sparkling, gazed up at them. Banks wasn't sure what he saw in it, but it wasn't fear. He introduced Jenny as Dr. Fuller. Lucy looked up and gave them a fleeting wisp of a smile. Is there any news? she asked. No, said Banks. He's going to die, isn't he? What makes you think that? I just have this feeling he's going to die, that's all. Would that make a difference, Lucy? What do you mean? You know what I mean. If Terry died, 
Would it make a difference to what you might care to tell us? How could it? You tell me. Lucy paused. Banks could see her frown as she thought about what to say next. If I were to tell you, you know, what went on, I mean, if I knew, you know, about Terry and those girls and all, what would happen to me? You'll have to be a bit clearer than that, I'm afraid, Lucy. She licked her lips. I can't really be any clearer. Not at this point. I have to think of myself. I mean, if I remembered something that didn't show me in a good light, what would you do? Depends what it is, Lucy. Lucy retreated into silence. Jenny sat on the edge of the bed and smoothed her skirt. Banks gave her the go-ahead to pick up the questioning. Do you remember anything more about what happened? she asked. Are you a psychiatrist? I'm a psychologist. Lucy looked at Banks. They can't make me have tests, can they? No, said Banks. Nobody can force you to undergo testing. That's not why Dr. Fuller's here. She just wants to talk to you. She's here to help. And the checks in the post, Banks added silently. Lucy glanced at Jenny. I don't know. You've got nothing to hide, have you, Lucy? Jenny asked. No. I'm just worried that they'll make things up about me. Who'll make things up? Doctors, the police. Why would they want to do that? I don't know, because they think I'm evil. Nobody thinks you're evil, Lucy. You wonder how I could have lived with him, a man who did what Terry did, don't you? How could you live with him? Jenny asked. I was frightened of him. He said he'd kill me if I left him. And he abused you, is that right? Yes. Physically. Sometimes he hit me, where the bruises wouldn't show. Until Monday morning. Lucy touched her bandages. Yes. Why was it different that time, Lucy? I don't know. I still can't remember. That's okay, Jenny went on. I'm not here to force you to say anything you don't want. Just relax. Did your husband abuse you in other ways? What do you mean? Emotionally, for example? Do you mean like putting me down? Humiliating me in front of people? That's the kind of thing I mean. Then the answer's yes. Like, you know, if something I cooked wasn't very good or I hadn't ironed his shirt properly. He was very fussy about his shirts. What did he do if his shirts weren't ironed properly? He'd make me do them again and again. Once he even burned me with the iron. Where? Lucy looked away. Where it wouldn't show. I'm curious about the cellar, Lucy. Detective Superintendent Banks here told me you said you never went down there. I might have been there the once, you know, the time he hurt me. On Monday morning? Yes. But you don't remember? No. You never went down there before? Lucy's voice took on a strange keening edge. No, never. Not since we first moved in, anyway. How long after that was it that he forbade you to go there? I don't remember. Not long. When he'd done his conversions. What conversions? He told me he'd made it into a den, his own private place. Were you never curious? Not much. Besides, he always kept it locked, and he carried the key with him. He said, if he ever thought I'd been down there, he'd thrash me to within an inch of my life. And you believed him? She turned her dark eye on Jenny. Oh, yes. It wouldn't have been the first time. Did your husband ever mention pornography to you? Yes. He sometimes brought videos home. Things he said he'd borrowed from Jeff, one of the other teachers. Sometimes we'd watch them together. She looked at Banks. You must have seen them. I mean, you've probably been in the house searching and stuff. Banks remembered the tapes. Did Terry have a camcorder? He asked her. Did he make his own tapes? No, I don't think so, she said. Jenny picked up the thread again. What sort of videos did he like? She asked. People having sex. Girls together, sometimes people tied up. 
You said you watched the videos together sometimes. Did you like them? What effect did they have on you? Did he force you to watch them? Lucy shifted under her thin bedsheets. The outline of her body stirred Banks in ways he didn't want to be stirred by her. I really didn't like them much, she said in a sort of husky little girl voice. Sometimes, you know, though, even so, they... they excited me. She moved again. Did your husband abuse you sexually? Make you do things you didn't want to do? Jenny asked. No, she said. It was all just normal. Banks was beginning to wonder if the marriage to Lucy was just a part of Terence Payne's normal facade. Something to make people think twice about his real proclivities. After all, it had worked on DC's Beaumont and Singh, who hadn't even bothered to re-interview him. Perhaps he went elsewhere to satisfy his more perverse tastes. Prostitutes, for example. It was worth looking into. Do you know if he went with other women? Jenny asked, as if reading Banks's mind. He never said. But did you suspect it? I thought he might have done yes. Prostitutes? I don't know. I didn't like to think about it. Did you ever find his behavior bizarre? What do you mean? Did he ever shock you? Make you wonder what he was up to? Not really. He had a terrible temper, you know, if he didn't get his own way, and sometimes, during school holidays, I didn't see him for days. You didn't know where he was? No. And he never told you? No. Weren't you curious? She seemed to shrink back into the bed. Curiosity never did you any good with Terry. Curiosity killed the cat, he'd say, and if you don't shut up, it'll kill you too. She shook her head. I don't know what it did wrong. Everything was fine. It was just a normal life. Until I met Terry. Then everything started to fall apart. How could I be such a fool? I should have known. Known what, Lucy? What kind of person he was, what a monster he was. But you did know. You told me he hit you, humiliated you in public and in private. You did know. Are you trying to tell me you thought that was normal? Do you think that was how everybody lived? No, of course not. But it didn't make him the sort of monster you think he is. Lucy looked away again. What is it, Lucy? Jenny asked. You must think I'm such a weak person to let him do all that. A terrible person, but I'm not. I'm a nice person. Everybody says I am. I was frightened. Talk to Maggie. She understands. Banks stepped in. Maggie Forrest, your neighbour? Yes. Lucy looked in his direction. She sent me those flowers. We talked about it, you know, about men abusing their wives. And she tried to persuade me to leave Terry, but I was too frightened. Maybe in a while I might have found the courage. I don't know. It's too late now, isn't it? Oh, please, I'm tired. I don't want to talk any more. I just want to go home and get on with my life. Banks wondered whether he should tell Lucy that she wouldn't be going home for some time, that her home looked like the site of an archaeological dig and would be in the police's hands for weeks, perhaps months to come. He decided not to bother. She would find out soon enough. We'll go now, then, said Jenny, standing up. Take care, Lucy. Would you do me a favour? Lucy asked as she stood in the doorway. What is it? Banks asked. Back at the house, there's a nice little jewellery box on the dressing table in the bedroom. It's a lacquered Japanese box, black with all kinds of beautiful flowers hand-painted on it. Anyway, it's got all my favourite pieces in, earrings I bought on our honeymoon on Crete, a gold chain with a heart Terry bought me when we got engaged. They're my things. Would you bring it to me, please, my jewellery box? Banks tried to hold in his frustration. Lucy, he said as calmly as he could manage, we believe that several young girls were sexually abused and murdered in the cellar of your house, and all you can think about is your jewellery. That's not true, said Lucy, a hint of petulance in her tone. 
I'm sorry for what happened to those girls. Of course I am, but it's not my fault. I don't see why it should stop me having my jewel box. The only thing anyone's let me have from there is my handbag and purse, and I could tell someone had even been searching through them first. Banks followed Jenny out into the corridor, and they headed for the lifts. Calm down, Alan, said Jenny. Lucy's dissociating. She doesn't realise the emotional significance of what's happened. Right, said Banks, glancing at the clock on the wall. That's just bloody fine and dandy. Now I have to go and watch Dr. Mackenzie do his next post-mortem. But I'll do my damnedest to remember that none of it is Lucy Payne's fault. And she's managing to disassociate herself from it all, thank you. Jenny put her hand on his arm. I can understand why you're frustrated, Alan. But it won't do any good. You can't push her. She won't be pushed. Be patient. The lift came and they got in. Trying to have a conversation with that woman is like trying to catch water in a sieve, Banks said. She's a weird one, all right. Is that your professional opinion? Jenny grinned. Let me think about it. I'll talk to you after I've talked to her co-worker and her parents. Bye. They arrived at the ground floor, and she hurried off towards the car park. Banks took a deep breath and pressed the down button. Rapunzel was going much better today, Maggie decided, as she stood back and examined her work, tip of her tongue between her small white teeth. She didn't look as if one good yank on her hair would rip her head from her shoulders, and she didn't look a bit like Claire Toth. Claire hadn't turned up as usual yesterday after school, and Maggie wondered why not. Perhaps it was only to be expected that she didn't feel very sociable after what had happened. Maybe she just wanted to be alone, to sort out her feelings. Maggie decided she would talk to her psychiatrist, Dr. Sims, about Claire, see if there was something that ought to be done. She had an appointment tomorrow, which, despite the events of the week, she was determined to keep. Lorraine Temple's story hadn't turned up in the morning newspaper, as Maggie had expected it to, and she had felt disappointed when she had searched through every page and not found it. She assumed that the journalist needed more time to check her facts and put the story together. After all, it had only been yesterday when they talked. Perhaps it would be a long article focusing on the plight of abused women, a feature in the weekend paper. She bent over the drawing board and got back to work on the Rapunzel sketch. She had to turn her desk light on as the morning had turned overcast and muggy. A couple of minutes later her phone rang. Maggie put her pencil aside and answered it. Maggie? She recognised the soft, husky voice. Lucy, how are you? I'm feeling much better now, really. Maggie didn't know what to say at first. She felt awkward. Despite her sending the flowers and defending Lucy to the police and with Lorraine Temple, she realised they didn't know one another well and came from very different worlds. It's good to hear from you, she said. I'm glad you're feeling better. I just wanted to thank you for the flowers, Lucy went on. They're lovely. They make all the difference. It was a nice thought. It's the least I can do. You know, you're the only person who's bothered with me. Everyone else has written me off. I'm sure that's not true, Lucy. Oh, but it is. Even my friends from work. Though Maggie could hardly bring herself to ask, it was only polite. How's Terry? They won't even tell me that, but I think he's very badly hurt. I think he's going to die. I think the police are going to try to blame me. What makes you think that? I don't know. Have they been to talk to you? Twice. Just now there were two of them. One was a psychologist. She asked me all sorts of questions. About what? about things Terry did to me, about our sex life. I felt like such a fool. Maggie, I just feel so frightened and alone. Look, Lucy, if I can help in any way, thank you. Have you got a solicitor? No, I don't even know any. Look, Lucy, if the police come bothering you again, don't say anything to them. I know how they can twist your words 
make something out of nothing. Will you at least let me try to get you someone? One of Ruth and Charles's friends is a solicitor in town, Julia Ford. I've met her, and she seems nice enough. She'll know what to do. But I don't have that much money, Maggie. Don't worry. We'll sort it out with her somehow. Will you let me call her for you? I suppose so. I mean, if you think it's for the best. I do. I'll call her right now and ask her to drop by and talk to you, shall I? Okay. Are you sure there's nothing else I can do for you? Maggie heard a defeated laugh over the line. Pray for me, perhaps. I don't know, Maggie. I don't know what they're going to do to me. For the moment, I'd just like to know there's someone on my side. Count on it, Lucy. There is. Thank you. I'm tired. I have to go now. And Lucy hung up the phone. After attending Dr. Mackenzie's post-mortem on the sad pile of bones and decaying flesh that had once been a young and vibrant girl with hopes and dreams and secrets, Banks felt twenty years older but none the wiser. First on the slab was the freshest, because Dr. Mackenzie said it might tell him more, which seemed logical to Banks. Even so, the body had been partially buried under a thin layer of soil in Payne's cellar for about three weeks, Dr. Mackenzie estimated, which was why the skin, hair and nails were loose and easy to pull off. Insects had been at work, and much of the flesh was gone. Where skin remained, it had burst open in places, revealing the glistening muscle and fat beneath. Not much fat, because this was Melissa Horrocks, weighing just a little under seven stone, whose T-shirt bore symbols to ward off evil spirits. Banks left before Dr. Mackenzie had finished, not because it was too gruesome for him, but because these post-mortems were going to go on for some time yet, and he had other business to attend to. It would be more than a day or two, Dr. Mackenzie said, before he would be able to get down to a report, as the other two bodies were in an even worse state of decomposition. Someone from the team had to sit through the post-mortems, but this was one job Banks was happy to delegate. After the sights, sounds and smells of Mackenzie's post-mortem, the bland headmaster's office at Silver Hill Comprehensive came as a relief. There was nothing about the uncluttered and nondescript room that indicated it had anything to do with education, or anything else for that matter. It was much the same as any anonymous office in any anonymous building, and it didn't even smell of much except a faint whiff of lemon-scented furniture polish. The head was called John Knight, early forties, balding, stoop-shouldered, dandruff on his jacket collar. After getting a few general details about Payne's employment history, Banks asked Knight if there had been any problems with Payne. There have been a few complaints, now that you mention it, Knight admitted. Banks raised his eyebrows. From pupils? Knight reddened. Good Lord, no, nothing like that. Have you any idea what happens at the merest hint of something like that these days? No, said Banks. When I was at school, the teachers used to thrash us with just about anything they could lay their hands on. Some of them enjoyed it, too. Well, those days are over, thank the Lord. Or the law. Not a believer. My job makes it difficult. Yes, I can understand that. Knight glanced towards the window. Mine, too, sometimes. That's one of the great challenges of faith, don't you think? So what sort of problems were you having with Terence Payne? Knight brought himself back from a long way away and sighed. Oh, just little things. Nothing important in themselves, but they all add up. For example, tardiness. Too many days off without a valid reason. Teachers may get generous holidays, superintendent, but they are expected to be here during term time. Barring some serious illness, of course. I see. Anything else? Just the general sort of sloppiness. Exams not marked on time. Projects left unsupervised. Terry has a bit of a temper, and he can get quite stroppy if you call him up on anything. How long has this been going on? According to the head of science, only since the new year. And before that? No problems at all. Terence Payne is a good teacher, knows his stuff. 
and he seemed popular with the pupils. None of us can believe what's happened. We're stunned. Just absolutely stunned. Do you know his wife? I don't know her. I met her once at the staff Christmas party. Charming woman. A little reserved, perhaps, but charming nonetheless. Does Terry have a colleague here called Jeff? Yes, Jeffrey Brighouse. He's the chemistry teacher. The two of them seem pretty thick. Went out for a jar or two together every now and again. What can you tell me about him? Jeff's been with us six years now. Solid sort of fellow. No trouble at all. Can I talk to him? Of course. Knight looked at his watch. He should be over in the chemistry lab right now, preparing for his next class. Follow me. They walked outside. The day was becoming more and more muggy as the clouds thickened, threatening rain. Nothing new. Apart from the past few days, it had been raining pretty much every day on and off since the beginning of April. Silverhill Comprehensive was one of the few pre-war Gothic red brick schools that hadn't been sandblasted and converted into offices or luxury flats yet. Knots of adolescents lounged around the asphalt playground. They all seemed subdued, Banks thought, and a pall of gloom, fear and confusion hung about the place, palpable as a pea super. The groups weren't mixed, Banks noticed. The girls stood in their own little conclaves, as if huddled together for comfort and security, staring down and scuffing their shoes on the asphalt as Banks and Knight walked by. The boys were a bit more animated. At least some of them were talking, and there was a bit of the usual playful pushing and shoving. But the whole effect was eerie. It's been like this since we heard, said Knight, as if reading Banks's mind. People don't realise how far-reaching and long-lasting the effects will be around this place. Some of the students may never get over it. It'll blight their lives. It's not just that we've lost a cherished pupil, but someone we put in a position of trust seems to be responsible for some abominable acts, if I'm not speaking out of turn. You're not, said Banks, and abominable only scratches the surface. But don't tell the papers. My lips are sealed. They've been around already, you know. It doesn't surprise me. I didn't tell them anything, nothing to tell, really. Here we are, the Bascom Building. The Bascom Building was a modern concrete and glass addition to the main school building. There was a plaque on the wall near the door which read, This building is dedicated to the memory of Frank Edward Bascom, 1898-1971. Who was he? Banks asked as they went in the door. A teacher here during the war, Knight explained. English teacher? This used to be part of the main building then, but it was hit by a stray doodle bug in October of 1944. Frank Bascom was a hero. He got twelve children and another teacher out. Two pupils were killed in the attack, just through here. He opened the door to the chemistry lab, where a young man sat at the teacher's desk, in front of a sheaf of notes. He looked up. Jeff, a detective superintendent banks to see you. Then he left shutting the door behind him. Banks hadn't been in the school chemistry lab for thirty years or more, and though this one had far more modern fixtures than he remembered from his own school days, much of it was still the same. The high lab benches, Bunsen burners, test tubes, pipettes and beakers. The glass-fronted cabinet on the wall full of stoppered bottles containing sulfuric acid, potassium, sodium phosphate and such. What memories! It even smelled the same, slightly acrid, slightly rotten. Banks remembered the first chemistry set his parents bought him for Christmas, when he was thirteen. Remembered the fine powdered alum, the blue copper sulphate, and bright blue crystals of potassium permanganate. He liked to mix them all up and see what happened, paying no regard to the instructions or the safety precautions. Once he was heating some odd concoction over a candle at the kitchen table when the test tube cracked, making a mess all over the place. His mother went spare. Brighouse, wearing a lightweight jacket and grey flannel trousers, not a lab coat, came forward and shook hands. He was a fresh-faced lad, about Payne's age, 
with pale blue eyes, fair hair, and a lobster complexion, as if he'd been able to find some sun and stayed out in it too long. His handshake was firm, dry, and short. He noticed Banks looking around the lab. Bring back memories, does it? he asked. A few. Good ones, I hope. Banks nodded. He had enjoyed chemistry, but his teacher, Titch Barker, was one of the worst, most brutal bastards in the school. He used the rubber connecting lines of the Bunsen burners in his thrashings. Once, he held Banks' hand over a burner and made as if to light it, but he backed off at the last moment. Banks had seen the sadistic gleam in his eye, how much effort it had cost him not to strike the match. Banks hadn't given him the satisfaction of a plea for mercy or an outward expression of fear, but he had been shaking inside. Anyway, sodium today, said Brighouse. Pardon? Sodium. The way it's so unstable in air. Always goes down well. The kids these days don't have much of an attention span, so you have to give them pyrotechnics to keep them interested. Luckily, there's plenty of scope for that in chemistry. Ah, sit down. He pointed towards a tall stool by the nearest bench. Banks sat in front of a rack of test tubes and a Bunsen burner. Brighouse sat opposite. I'm not sure I can help you in any way, Brighouse began. I know Terry, of course. We're colleagues and good mates to some extent. But I can't say I know him well. He's a very private person in many ways. Stands to reason, said Banks. Look at what he was doing in private. Brighouse blinked. Er, uh, quite. Mr. Brighouse, Jeff, please call me Jeff. Right, Jeff, said Banks, who always preferred the first name, as it gave him an odd sort of power over a suspect, which Jeff Brighouse certainly was in his eyes. How long have you known Mr. Payne? Since he first came here nearly two years ago. He was teaching in Seacroft before then, is that right? Yes, I think so. You didn't know him then? No. Look, if you don't mind my asking, how is he, by the way? He's still in intensive care, but he's hanging on. Good. I mean... Oh, shit, this is so difficult. I still can't believe it. What am I supposed to say? The man's a friend of mine, after all, no matter... Brighouse put his fist to his mouth and chewed on a knuckle. He seemed suddenly close to tears, no matter what he's done. I was going to say that, but... I'm just confused. Forgive me. It'll take time, I understand. But in the meantime, I need to find out all I can about Terence Payne. What sorts of things did you do together? Mostly went to pubs. We never drank a lot. At least I didn't. Payne's a heavy drinker? Not until recently. Did you say anything to him? A couple of times, you know, when he was in his car. What did you do? I tried to take his keys away. What happened? He got angry. He even hit me once. Terence Payne hit you? Yeah, but he was pissed. He's got a temper when he's pissed. Did he give you any reason why he was drinking so much? No. He didn't talk about any personal problems he might be having? No. Did you know of any problems other than the drinking? He was letting his work slip a bit. The same thing Knight had said. Like the drinking... It was probably more of a symptom than the problem itself. Jenny Fuller would perhaps be able to confirm it. But Banks thought it made sense that a man who was doing, who felt compelled to do what Payne had been doing, would need some sort of oblivion. It seemed almost as if he had wanted to be caught, wanted it all to be over. The abduction of Kimberly Myers, when he knew he was already in the system because of his car number plate, was a foolhardy move. If it hadn't been for D.C.'s Bowmore and Singh, he might have been brought to Banks' attention earlier. Even if nothing had come from a second interview, his name would have leapt out of Holmes as soon as Carol Houseman had entered the new data that Kimberly Myers was a pupil at Silverhill, where Payne taught, and that he was listed as the owner of a car whose number ended in KWT despite the false NJV plates. Did he ever talk about Kimberly Myers? Banks asked. No, never. Did he ever talk about young girls in general? He talked about girls, not particularly young ones. How did he talk about women? With affection, with disgust, with lust, with anger? 
Brighouse thought for a moment. Come to think of it, he said, I always thought Terry sounded a bit sort of domineering, the way he talked about women. How so? Well, he'd spot a girl he fancied in a pub, say, and gone about, you know, how he'd like to fuck her, tie her to the bed and fuck her brains out, that sort of thing. I, I mean, I'm not a prude, but sometimes it was a bit over the top. But that's just male crudeness, isn't it? Brighouse raised an eyebrow. Is it? I don't know. I honestly don't know what it means. I'm just saying he sounded rough and domineering when he talked about women. Talking about male crudeness. Did you ever lend Terry any videos? Brighouse looked away. What do you mean? What sort of videos? Pornographic videos. It wasn't possible for someone as red as Brighouse to blush. But for a moment, Banks could almost have sworn that he did. Just some soft stuff. Nothing under the counter. Nothing you can't rent at the corner shop. I lent him other videos, too. War films, horror, science fiction. Terry's a film buff. No homemade videos. Of course not. What do you think I am? The jury's still out on that one, Jeff. Does Terry own a camcorder? Not that I know of. Do you? No. I can just about manage a basic point-and-shoot camera. Did you go to his house often? Once in a while. Ever go down in the cellar? No. Why? Are you sure about that, Jeff? Damn it, yes. Surely you can't think... You do realise we're carrying out a complete forensic examination of the pain cellar, don't you? So? So the first rule of a crime scene is that anyone who's been there leaves something and takes something away. If you were there, we'll find out, that's all. I wouldn't want you looking guilty simply for not telling me you were there on some innocent mission like watching a porn video together. I never went down there. OK, just as long as you know. Did the two of you ever pick up any women together? Brighouse's eyes shifted towards the Bunsen burner, and he fiddled with the test tube rack in front of him. Mr. Brighouse, Jeff, it could be important. I don't see how. Let me be the judge of that. And if you're worried about splitting on a mate, you shouldn't be. Your mate's in hospital in a coma. His wife's in the same hospital, with a few cuts and bruises he inflicted on her. And we found the body of Kimberly Myers in the cellar of his house. Remember, Kimberly? You probably taught her, didn't you? I've just been to the post-mortem of one of his previous victims, and I'm still feeling a bit off-colour. You don't need to know any more, and believe me, you don't want to. Brighouse took a deep breath. Some of the bright red colouring seemed to have leached from his cheeks and brow. Well, OK, yeah, we did once. Tell me what happened. Nothing, you know. No, I don't know. Tell me. Look, this is... I don't care how embarrassing it is. I want to know how he behaved with this woman you picked up. Carry on. Think of it as confiding in your doctor over a dose of clap. Brighouse swallowed and went on. It was at a conference in Blackpool. In April, just over a year ago. Before he got married. Yeah, he was seeing Lucy, but they weren't married then. Not till May. Go on. Not much to tell. There was this cracking young teacher from Aberdeen, and one night, you know, we'd all had a few drinks at the bar and got to flirting and all. Anyway, she seemed game enough after a few gins, so we went up to the room. The three of you. Yes, Terry and I were sharing a room. I mean, I'd have stayed away if it was his score, like, but she made it clear she didn't mind. It was her idea. She said she'd always fancied a threesome. And you? It had been a fantasy of mine, yes. What happened? What do you think? We had sex. Did she enjoy it? Well, like I said, it had been mostly her idea in the first place. She was a bit drunk. We all were. She didn't object. Really, she was keen. It was only later... What was only later? Look, you know what it's like. No, I don't know what it's like. Well, Terry, he suggested a Greek sandwich. I don't know if you... I know what a Greek sandwich is. Go on but she didn't fancy it. What happened? Terry can be very persuasive. 
How? Violence? No, he just doesn't give up. He keeps on coming back to what he wants, and it just wears down people's resistance in the end. So you had your Greek sandwich. Brighouse looked down and rubbed his fingertips on the rough, scratched lab bench. Yeah. And she was willing? Sort of. I mean, yes. Nobody forced her. Not physically. We'd had a couple more drinks, and Terry was at her, you know, just verbally, about how great it would be, so, in the end... What happened afterwards? Nothing, really. I mean, she didn't kick up a fuss, but it soured the mood. She cried a bit, seemed down, you know, as if she felt betrayed, used, and I could tell she didn't like it much when it was happening. But you didn't stop? No. Did she scream or tell you to stop? No. I mean, she was making noises, but... Well, she was a real screamer to start with. I was even worried about the people next door telling us to keep the noise down. What happened next? She went back to her own room. We had a few more drinks, then I passed out. I assume Terry did the same. Banks paused and made a jotting in his notebook. I don't know if you realise this, Jeff, but what you've just told me constitutes accessory to rape. Nobody raped her. I told you she was willing enough. Doesn't sound like it to me. Two men, her by herself. What choice did she have? She made it clear that she didn't want to do what Terence Payne was asking for, but he went ahead and did it anyway. He brought her round to his way of thinking. Bollocks, Jeff. He wore down her resistance and resolve. You said so yourself. And I'll also bet she was worried what might happen if she didn't go along with him. Nobody threatened her with violence. Maybe not in so many words. Look, maybe things went just a little too far. Got out of hand. Maybe a little. Banks sighed. The number of times he had heard that excuse for male violence against women. It was what Annie Cabot's assailants had claimed too. He felt disgusted with Geoffrey Brighouse. But there wasn't much he could do. The incident had taken place over a year ago. The woman hadn't filed a complaint as far as he knew and Terence Payne was fighting for his life in the infirmary anyway. Still, it was one worth noting down for future reference. I'm sorry, said Brighouse, but you must understand, she never told us to stop. Didn't seem as if she had much chance to do that. Sandwiched between two strapping lads like you and Terry. Well, she had enjoyed everything else. Move on, Banks told himself, before you hit him. Any other incidents like that? No. It was the only time. Believe it or not, Superintendent. But after that night, I was a bit ashamed, even though I did nothing wrong, and I would have been uncomfortable getting into a situation like that with Terry again. It was too much for me, so I just avoided the possibility. So Payne was faithful to his wife from then on. I didn't say that. What do you mean? Just that the two of us didn't pick up any more girls together. Sometimes he told me, you know, about picking up prostitutes and all. What did he do with them? What do you think? He didn't go into detail. No. Did he ever talk about his wife in a sexual way? No, never. He was very possessive about her, and very guarded. He hardly mentioned her at all when we were together. It was as if she were part of a different life altogether. Terry's got a remarkable ability to compartmentalise things. So it would seem. Did he ever suggest abducting young girls? Do you seriously believe that I'd have anything to do with that sort of thing? I don't know, Jeff. You tell me. He talked to you about tying them up and fucking their brains out. And he certainly raped that teacher in Blackpool. No matter how willing she might have been to have regular sex with the two of you earlier. I don't know what to think of your part in all this, Jeff, to be quite honest. Brighouse had lost all his colour now, and he was trembling. But you can't think that I... I mean... Why not? There's no reason you couldn't have been in it with him. More convenient if there were two of you. Easier to abduct your victims. Any chloroform in the lab? Chloroform, yes. Why? Under lock and key, is it? Of course. Who has a key? I do. Terry. Keith Miller, the department head. Mr Knight. I don't know who else. 
Probably the caretaker and the cleaners, for all I know. Whose prints do you think we'd find on the bottle? I don't know. I certainly can't remember the last time I used the stuff. What did he do last weekend? Not much. Stayed at home. Marked some projects. Went shopping in town. Got a girlfriend at the moment, Jeff? No. See anyone else over the weekend? Just neighbours, you know. People from the other flats in the hall on the stairs. Oh, and I went to the picture Saturday night. On your own? Yes. What did you go to see? A new James Bond in the city centre. And then I dropped in at my local. Anyone see you? A few of the regulars, yes. We had a game of darts. How late were you there? Closing time. Banks scratched his cheek. I don't know, Jeff. When you get right down to it, it's not much of an alibi, is it? I wasn't aware I'd be needing one. The lab door opened and two boys poked their heads in. Jeff Brighouse seemed relieved. He looked at his watch, then at Banks, and gave a weak smile. Time for class, I'm afraid. Banks stood up. That's all right, Jeff. I wouldn't want to interfere in the education of the young. Brighouse beckoned the boys in, and more followed, swarming around the stools at the benches. He walked with Banks over to the door. I'd like you to come down to Milgarth and make a statement, Banks said before leaving. A statement? Me? But why? Just a formality. Tell the detective exactly what you just told me. And we'll also need to know exactly where you were and what you were doing at the times those five girls were abducted. Details, witnesses, the lot. We'll also need a fingerprint scan and a sample of DNA. It won't be painful, just like brushing your teeth. This evening after school will do fine, say five o'clock. Go to the front desk and ask for DC Eunice. He'll be expecting you. Banks gave him a card and wrote down the name of the bright, if rather judgmental, young DC. He had that very second chosen for the task of taking Brighouse's formal statement. DC Eunice was active in his local Methodist chapel and a bit conservative morally. Cheers, said Banks leaving a stunned and worried-looking Jeff Brighouse to teach his class the joys of unstable sodium. Chapter 9 Pat Mitchell took a break when Jenny turned up at the bank, and they walked to the cafe in the shopping centre over the road, where they sipped rather weak milky tea as they talked. Pat was a vivacious brunette with damp brown eyes and a big engagement ring. All she could do at first was shake her head and repeat, I still can't believe this. I just can't believe this is happening. Jenny was no stranger to denial, either as a psychologist or as a woman. So she made sympathetic noises and gave Pat the time to compose herself. Once in a while, someone from one of the other tables would give them a puzzled look, as if he or she recognised them, but couldn't quite place them. But for the most part, the cafe was empty and they were able to talk undisturbed. "'How well do you know, Lucy?' Jenny asked when Pat had stopped crying. "'We're pretty close. I mean, I've known her for about four years, ever since she started here at the bank. She had a little flat then, just off Tong Road. We're about the same age. How is she? Have you seen her?' All the time she talked, Pat's big brown eyes continued to glisten on the brink of tears. I saw her this morning, Jenny answered. She's doing well, healing nicely. Physically, anyway. What was she like when you first met? Pat smiled at the memory. She was fun, a laugh. She liked a lark. What do you mean? You know, she just wanted to enjoy herself, have a good time. What was her idea of a good time? Clubbing, going to pubs, parties, dancing, chatting up lads. Just chatting them up. Lucy was, well, she was just funny when it came to lads back then. I mean, most of them seemed to bore her. She'd go out with them a couple of times and then she'd chuck them. Why do you think that was? Pat swirled the greyish tea in her cup and looked into it as if she was seeking her fortune in the leaves. I don't know. It was as if she was waiting for someone. Mr. Wright, 
Pat laughed. Oh, something like that. Jenny got the impression that her laugh would have been a lot more ready and frequent had it not been for the circumstances. Did she ever tell you what her idea of Mr. Wright was? No, just that none of the lads around here seemed to satisfy her in any way. She thought they were all stupid, and all they had on their minds was football and sex, in that order. Jenny had met plenty of lads like that. What was she after? A rich man, an exciting one, a dangerous one? She wasn't interested in money particularly. Dangerous? I don't know, maybe. She liked to live on the edge back then, like. She could be quite over the top. Jenny made some notes. How? In what way? It's nothing, really. I shouldn't have spoken. Go on, tell me. Pat lowered her voice. Look, you're a psychiatrist, right? Psychologist. Whatever. Does that mean if I tell you something it goes no further? It stays between you and me and nobody can make you name your source. I mean, I wouldn't want Lucy to think I'd been talking out of turn. While Jenny might have some valid defences for not turning over her patient's files without a court order, in this instance she was working for the police and couldn't promise privacy. On the other hand, she needed to hear Pat's story and Lucy would probably never find out about it. Without resorting to an outright lie, she said, I'll do my best, I promise. Pat chewed on her lower lip and thought for a moment. Then she leaned forward and gripped her teacup in both hands. Well, once she wanted to go to some of those clubs in Chapeltown. West Indian clubs? Yes, I mean, most nice white girls wouldn't go near places like that. But Lucy thought it would be exciting. Did she go? Yes. She went with Jasmine, a Jamaican girl from the Boer Lane branch. Of course nothing happened. I think she might have tried some drugs, though. Why? What did she say? She just hinted and did that, you know, that knowing sort of thing with her eyes, like she'd been there, and the rest of us had only seen it on television. She can be quite unnerving like that, can Lucy? Was there anything else? Yes. Once Pat was in full flow, it seemed there was no stopping her. She once told me she'd acted as a prostitute. She'd what? It's true. Pat looked around her to make sure no one was interested and lowered her voice even more. It was over a couple of years ago, before Terry came on the scene. We'd talked about it in a pub one night, when we saw one, you know, a prostitute, wondering what it would be like and all, doing it for money, just as a bit of a laugh, really. Lucy said she'd like to try it and find out, and she'd let us know. Did she? Uh-huh. That's what she told me. About a week later, she said the night before, she'd put on some slutty clothes, fishnet tights, high heels, a black leather miniskirt, and a low-cut blouse, and she sat at the bar of one of those business hotels near the motorway. It didn't take long, she said, before a man approached her. Did she tell you what happened? Not all the details. She knows when to hold back, does Lucy, for effect like. But she said they talked, very businesslike and polite and all that, and they came to some financial arrangement. And then they went up to his room and... And they did it. Did you believe her? Not at first. I mean, it's outrageous, isn't it? But eventually you did. Well, like I said, Lucy's always capable of surprising you. And she likes danger, excitement. I suppose it was when she showed me the money that tipped the balance. She showed you? Yes. Two hundred pounds. She could have got it out of the bank. She could, but... Anyway, that's all I know about it. Jenny made some more notes. Pat tilted her head to see what she was writing. It must be a fascinating job, yours, she said. It has its moments. Just like that woman who used to be on television, prime suspect. I'm not a policewoman, Pat. Just a consultant psychologist. Pat wrinkled her nose. Still, it's an exciting life, isn't it? Catching criminals and all that. Excitement wasn't the first word that came to Jenny's mind. 
but she decided to leave Pat to her illusions. Like most people's, they wouldn't do her any real harm. What about after Lucy met Terry? She changed, but then you do, don't you? Otherwise, what's the point of getting married? If it doesn't change you, I mean. I see your point. How did she change? She became a lot more reserved. Stopped home more. Terry's a bit of a homebody, so there was no more clubbing. He's the jealous type, too, is Terry, if you know what I mean. So she had to watch herself chatting up the lads. Not that she did that after they were married. It was Terry, Terry, Terry all the way, then. Were they in love? I'd say, dotty about each other. At least that's what she said. And she seemed happy, mostly. Let's back up a bit. Were you there when they met? She says so, but I can't for the life of me remember the meeting. When was it? Nearly two years ago, July. A warm, muggy night. We were on a girls' night out at a pub in Seacroft, one of those really big places with lots of rooms and dancing. How do you remember it? I remember Lucy leaving alone. She said she hadn't enough money for a taxi, and she didn't want to miss her bus. They don't run late. I'd had a few drinks, but I remember because I said something about her being careful. The Seacroft rapist was active around then. What did she say? She just gave me that look and left. Did you see Terry that night? Did you see him chatting her up? I think I saw him there, by himself at the bar, but I don't remember seeing them talking. What did Lucy say later? That she'd talked to him when she went to the bar for drinks once, and quite liked the look of him. Then they met again on her way out and went to some other pub together. Can't remember. I was definitely a bit squiffy. Anyway, whatever happened, that was it. From then on, it was a different Lucy. She didn't have anywhere near enough time for her old friends. Did you ever visit them, go for dinner? A couple of times with my fiancé, Steve. We got engaged a year ago. She held up her ring. The diamond caught the light and flashed. We're getting married in August. We've already booked the honeymoon. We're going to Rhodes. Did you get along with Terry okay? Pat gave a little shudder. No, I don't like him. Never did. Steve thought he was all right, but that's why we stopped going over, really. There's just something about him. And Lucy, she was sort of like a zombie when he was around. Either that or she acted like she was on drugs. What do you mean? Well, it's just a figure of speech. I mean, I know she wasn't really on drugs, but just, you know, overexcited. Talking too much. Mind jumping all over the place. Did you ever see any signs of abuse? You mean, did he hit her and stuff? Yes. No, nothing. I never saw any bruises or anything like that. Did Lucy seem to change in any way? What do you mean? Recently. Did she become more withdrawn, seem afraid of anything? Pat chewed on the edge of her thumb for a moment before answering. She changed a bit over the past few months, now you come to mention it, she said finally. I can't say exactly when it started, but she seemed more nervy, more distracted, as if she had a problem, a lot on her mind. Did she confide in you? No. We drifted apart quite a bit by then. Was he really beating her? I can't understand it, can you, how a woman, especially a woman like Lucy, can let that happen? Jenny could. But there was no point trying to convince Pat. If Lucy sensed that would be her old friend's attitude towards her problem, it was no surprise that she turned to a neighbour like Maggie Forrest, who at least showed empathy. Did Lucy ever talk about her past, her childhood? Pat looked at her watch. No. All I know is that she's from somewhere near Hull, and it was a pretty dull life. She couldn't wait to get away, and she didn't keep in touch as much as she should, especially after Terry came on the scene. Look, I really have to get back now. I hope I've been of help. She stood up. Jenny stood and shook her hand. Thanks, yes, you've been very helpful. As she watched Pat scurry back to the bank, Jenny looked at her watch too. She had enough time to drive out to Hull and see what Lucy's parents had to say.
It was several days since Banks had last stopped in at his Eastvale office, and the amount of accumulated paperwork was staggering, since he had temporarily inherited Detective Superintendent Gristhorpe's workload. Consequently, when he did find time to drop by the station late that afternoon, driving straight back after his interview with Jeff Brighouse, his pigeonhole was stuffed with reports, budget revisions, memos, requests, telephone message slips, crime statistics and various circulars awaiting his signature. He decided to clear up some of the backlog of paperwork and take Annie Cabot for a quick drink at the Queen's Arms to discuss her progress in the Janet Taylor investigation and maybe build a few bridges in the process. After leaving a message for Annie to drop by his office at six o'clock, Banks closed the door behind him and dropped the pile of papers on his desk. He hadn't even changed his Dalesman calendar from April to May, he noticed, flipping over from a photo of the stone bridge at Linton to the soaring lines of York Minster's east window. Pink and white May blossom blurred in the foreground. It was Thursday the 11th of May. Hard to believe it was only three days since the gruesome discovery at number 35 The Hill. Already the tabloids were rubbing their hands with glee and calling the place Dr. Terry's House of Horrors, and even worse, the House of Pain. They had somehow got hold of photographs of both Terry and Lucy Payne, the former cropped from a school-class picture by the look of it, and the latter from an Employee of the Month presentation to Lucy at the Nat West branch where she worked. Both photos were poor in quality, and you'd have to know who they were before you'd recognise either of them. Banks turned on his computer and answered any email he thought merited a response. Then he picked away at the pile of paper. Not much, it seemed, had happened in his absence. The major preoccupation had been with a series of nasty post office robberies, in which one masked man terrorised staff and customers with a long knife and an ammonia spray. No one had been hurt yet, but that didn't mean they wouldn't be. There had been four such robberies in the Western Division over a month. D.S. Hatchley was out rounding up his ragbag assortment of informants. Apart from the robberies, perhaps the most serious crime on their hands was the theft of a tortoise that happened to be sleeping in a cardboard box nicked from someone's garden, along with a rally bicycle and a lawnmower. Business as usual. And somehow... Banks found an odd sort of comfort in these dull, predictable crimes after the horrors of the Payne's cellar. He turned on his radio and recognised the slow movement from a late Schubert piano sonata. He felt a tight pain between his eyes and massaged the spot gently. When that didn't work, he swallowed a couple of paracetamol he kept in his desk for emergencies, such as this. Washed them down with tepid coffee then he pushed the mound of paper aside and let the music spill over him in gentle waves. The headaches were coming more frequently these days, along with the sleepless nights and a strange reluctance to go to work. It reminded him of the pattern he went through just before he left London for Yorkshire, when he was on the edge of burnout, and he wondered if he was getting in the same state again. He should probably see the doctor, he decided, when he had time. The ringing telephone disturbed him, as it had so often before. Scowling, he picked up the offending instrument and growled. Banks, Stefan here. You asked me to keep you informed. Banks relaxed his tone. Yes, Stefan, any developments? Banks could hear voices in the background, Milgarth, most likely, or the Payne House. One piece of good news. They've lifted Payne's prints from the machete used to kill P.C. Morrissey, and the lab reports both yellow plastic fibres from the rope in the scrapings, taken from under Lucy Payne's fingernails, along with traces of Kimberly Myers' blood on the sleeve of her dressing gown. Kimberly's blood on Lucy Payne's dressing gown, yes. So she was down there, Banks said. Looks like it. Mind you, she could explain away the fibres by saying she hung out the washing. They did use the same kind of clothesline in the back garden. I've seen it. But the blood? 
may be more tricky, said Stefan. There wasn't very much, but at least it proves that she was down there. Thanks, Stefan. It's a big help. What about Terence Payne? The same. Blood and yellow fibers, along with a fair quantity of P.C. Morris's blood. What about the bodies? One more, skeletal, out in the garden. That makes all five. Skeletal? How long would that take? Depends on temperature and insect activity, said Stefan. Could it have happened in just a month or so? Could have, with the right conditions. It hasn't been very warm this past month, though. But it is possible. It's possible. Leanne Ray had disappeared on the 31st of March. So there was at least some possibility that it was her remains. Anyway, Stefan went on, there's plenty of garden left. They're digging very slowly and carefully to avoid disturbing the bones. I've arranged for a botanist and an entomologist from the university to visit the scene tomorrow. They should be able to help us with time of death. Did you find any clothing with the victims? No, nothing of a personal nature. Get to work on identifying that body, Stefan, and let me know the minute you have anything, even if it's negative. Will do. Banks said goodbye to Stefan and hung up. Then he walked over to his open window and sneaked a prohibited cigarette. It was a hot, muggy afternoon, with the sort of tension in the air that meant rain would probably come soon perhaps even a thunderstorm. Office workers sniffed the air and reached for their umbrellas as they headed home. Shopkeepers closed up and wound back the awnings. Banks thought about Sandra again, how when she used to work at the community centre down North Market Street, they would often meet for a drink in the Queen's Arms before heading home. Happy days, or so they had seemed. And now she was pregnant with Sean's baby. The Schubert piano music played on, the serene and elegiac opening of the final B-flat sonata. Banks's headache began to subside a little. The one thing he remembered about Sandra's pregnancies was that she hadn't enjoyed them, hadn't glowed with the joys of approaching motherhood. She had suffered extreme morning sickness, and though she didn't drink or smoke much, she continued to do both, because back then nobody made such a fuss about it. She also continued to go to galleries and plays and meet with friends, and complained when her condition made it difficult or impossible for her to do so. While pregnant with Tracy, she had slipped on ice and broken her leg in her seventh month, and spent the rest of her confinement with a cast on. That, more than anything, had driven her crazy unable to get out and about with her camera, the way she loved to do, stuck in their pokey little Kennington flat, watching grey day follow grey day all that winter, while Banks was working all hours, hardly ever home. Well, perhaps Sean would be around for her more often. Lord only knew, perhaps, if Banks had been. But he didn't get to follow that thought, the particular circle of hell, he was sure must be reserved for neglectful husbands and fathers. Annie Cabot tapped at his door and popped her head around, giving him a temporary escape from the guilt and self-recrimination that seemed to be so much his lot these days, no matter how hard he tried to do the right thing. You did say six o'clock, didn't you? Yes, sorry, Annie, miles away. Banks picked up his jacket, checking the pockets for wallet and cigarettes then cast a backward glance at the pile of untouched paperwork on his desk. To hell with it. If they expected him to do two, three jobs at once, then they could wait for their bloody paperwork. As Jenny drove through a shower and looked out at the ugly forest of cranes that rose up from ghoul docks, she wondered for the umpteenth time what on earth had induced her to return to England, to Yorkshire. It certainly wasn't family ties. Jenny was an only child and her parents were retired academics, living in Sussex. Both her mother and father had been far too wrapped up in their work. He, as a historian, 
She is a physicist. And Jenny had spent more of her childhood with a succession of nannies and au pairs than with her parents. Given their natural academic detachment, too, Jenny often felt that she had been far more of an experiment than a daughter. It didn't bother her. After all, she didn't know any different. And it was very much the way she had lived her life, too, as an experiment. Sometimes she looked back, and it all seemed so shallow and self-centred that she felt herself panic. Other times it seemed just fine. She would turn forty that coming December, was still single, had never, in fact, been married, and while a bit shop-soiled, battered and bruised, she was far from down and out for the count. She still had her looks and her figure, though she needed more and more magic potions for the former, and had to work harder and harder at the university gym to keep those excess pounds from creeping on, given her taste for good food and wine. She also had a good job, a growing reputation as an offender profiler, publications to her credit. So why did she sometimes feel so empty? Why did she always feel she was in a hurry to get somewhere she never arrived at? Even now, with the rain lashing against her windscreen, the wipers going as fast as they could go, she was doing ninety. She slowed down to eighty, but her speed soon started creeping up again along with the feeling that she was late for something, always late for something. The shower ended. Elgar's Enigma Variations was playing on Classic FM. To the north, a power station with its huge corset-shaped cooling towers squatted against the horizon, the steam it spewed almost indistinguishable from the low cloud. She was nearing the end of the motorway now. The eastbound M62 was like so many things in life. It left you just short of your destination. Well, she told herself, she came back to Yorkshire because she was running away from a bad relationship with Randy. Story of her life. She had a nice condo in West Hollywood, rented at the most generous rate by a writer who had made enough money to buy a place way up in Laurel Canyon, and she was within walking distance of a supermarket and the restaurants and clubs on Santa Monica Boulevard. She had her teaching and research at UCLA, and she had Randy. But Randy had a habit of sleeping with pretty 21-year-old graduate students. After a minor breakdown, Jenny had called it a day and come running back to Eastvale. Perhaps that explained why she was always in a hurry, she thought. Desperate to get home, wherever that was. Desperate to get away from one bad relationship and right into the next one. It was a theory, at any rate. And then, of course, Alan was in Eastvale, too. If he was part of the reason why she had stayed away, could he also be part of the reason why she had come back? She didn't want to dwell on that. The M62 turned into the A63, and soon Jenny caught a glimpse of the Humber Bridge, ahead to her right stretching out majestically over the broad estuary into the mists and fens of Lincolnshire and Little Holland. Suddenly a few shafts of sunlight pierced the ragged cloud cover as the Nimrod variation reached its rousing climax. A Yorkshire moment. She remembered the L.A. moments. Randy was so fond of pointing out in their early days when they drove and drove and drove around the huge sprawling city a palm tree silhouetted against the blood-orange sky, a big bright full moon low over the Hollywood sign. As soon as she could, Jenny pulled into a lay-by and studied her map. The clouds were dispersing now, allowing even more sunlight through, but the roads were still swamped with puddles, and the cars and lorries switched up sheets of water as they sped by her. Lucy's parents lived off the A164 to Beverly, so she didn't have to drive through Hull city centre. She pressed on through the straggling western suburbs and soon found the residential area she was looking for. Clive and Hilary Liversedger's house was a nicely maintained bay window semi in a quiet crescent of similar houses. Not much of a place for a young girl to grow up, Jenny thought. Her own parents had moved often throughout her childhood, 
and though she had been born in Durham, she had at various times lived in Bath, Bristol, Exeter, and Norwich, all university towns, and all full of randy young men. She had never been stuck in a dull suburban backwater like this. A small plump man with a soft grey moustache answered the door. He was wearing a green cardigan, unbuttoned, and dark brown trousers which hugged the underside of his rounded gut. A belt wouldn't be much good with a shape like that, Jenny thought, noticing the braces that held the trousers up. Clive Liversedge. Come in, love, he said. You must be Dr. Fuller. That's me. Jenny followed him into the cramped hall, from which a glass-panelled door led to a tidy living room with a red velour three-piece suite, an electric fire with fake coals, and striped wallpaper. Somehow, it wasn't the kind of place Jenny had imagined Lucy Payne growing up in. She couldn't get any sense of Lucy living in this environment at all. She could see what Banks meant about the invalid mother. Pale skin and raccoon eyes. Hilary Liversedge reclined on the sofa, a wool blanket covering her lower half. Her arms were thin and the skin looked puckered and loose. She didn't move when Jenny entered, but her eyes looked lively and attentive enough, despite the yellowish cast of the sclera. Jenny didn't know what was wrong with her, but she put it down to one of those vague chronic illnesses that certain types of people luxuriate in towards the ends of their lives. How is she? Clive Liversedge asked, as if Lucy had perhaps suffered a minor fall or car accident. They said it wasn't serious. Is she doing all right? I saw her this morning, Jenny said, and she's bearing up well. Poor lass, said Hilary, to think of what she's been through. Tell her she's welcome to come here and stay with us when she gets out of hospital. I just came to get some sense of what Lucy's like. Jenny began. What sort of a girl she was? The liver sedges looked at one another. Just ordinary, said Clive. Normal, said Hilary. Right, thought Jenny. Normal girls go marrying serial killers every day. Even if Lucy had nothing at all to do with the killings, there had to be something odd about her, something out of the ordinary. Jenny had even sensed that during their brief chat in the hospital that morning, she could couch it in as much psychological gobbledygook as she wanted. And Jenny had come across plenty of that in her career, but what it came down to was the feeling that Lucy Payne was definitely a sausage or two short of the full English breakfast. What was she like at school? Jenny pressed on. Very bright, answered Clive. She got three A-levels, good marks too, A's and B's, added Hilary. She could have gone to university, Clive added. Why didn't she? She didn't want to, said Clive. She wanted to get out in the world and make a living for herself. Isn't she ambitious? She's not greedy, if that's what you mean, Hilary answered. Of course she wants to get on in the world like everyone else but she doesn't think she needs a university degree to do it. They're overrated anyway, don't you think? I suppose so, said Jenny, who had a BA and a PhD. Was she studious when she was at school? I wouldn't really say so, said Hilary. She did what she had to do in order to pass, but she wasn't a swat. Was she popular at school? She seemed to get on all right with the other children, we got no complaints from her at any rate. No bullying, nothing like that. Well, there was one girl once, but that came to nothing, said Clive. Someone bullying Lucy? No, someone complaining she was being bullied by Lucy. Accused her of demanding money with threats. What happened? Nothing. It was just her word against Lucy's. And you believed Lucy? Yes. So no action was taken? No. They couldn't prove anything against her. And nothing else like that occurred? No. Did she take part in any after-school activities? She wasn't much of a one for sports, but she was in a couple of school plays. Very good, too, wasn't she, love? Hilary Liversedge nodded. Was she wild at all? She could be high-spirited. 
and if she got it in her mind to do something, there was no stopping her. But I wouldn't say she was especially wild. What about at home? How did you all get along? They looked at each other again. It was an ordinary enough gesture, but it unnerved Jenny a bit. Fine, quiet as a mouse, never any trouble, said Clive. When did she leave home? When she was eighteen, she got that job at the bank in Leeds. We didn't stand in her way. Not that we could have, added Hilary. Have you seen much of her lately? Hilary's expression darkened a little. She said she's not been able to get over here as much as she'd have liked. When was the last time you saw her? Christmas, answered Clive. Last Christmas? The year before that? It was as Pat Mitchell had said. Lucy had become distanced from her parents. So that's seventeen months. I suppose so. Did she telephone or write? She writes us nice letters, said Hilary. What does she tell you about her life? About her job and the house, just normal, ordinary sorts of things. Did she tell you how Terry was doing at the school? This exchange look definitely spoke volumes. No, said Clive, and we didn't ask. We didn't approve of her taking up with the first boy she met, said Hilary. Did she have other boyfriends before Terry? Nobody serious. But you thought she could do better? We're not saying there's anything wrong with Terry. He seems nice enough, and he's got a decent job, good prospects. But? But he seemed to sort of take over, didn't he, Clive? Yes, it was very odd. What do you mean? Jenny asked. It was as if he didn't want her to see us. Did he or she ever say that? Hilary shook her head. The loose skin flapped. Not in so many words. It was just an impression I got. We got. Jenny made a note. To her, this sounded like one of the stages of a sexually sadistic relationship that she had learned about at Quantico. The sadist, in this case Terry Payne, starts to isolate his partner from her family. Pat Mitchell had also suggested the same sort of progressive separation from her friends. They just kept to themselves, said Clive. What did you think of Terry? There was something strange about him, but I couldn't put my finger on it. What sort of person is Lucy? Jenny went on. Is she generally trusting, naive, dependent? I wouldn't really describe her in uh, any of those terms, would you, Hilary? No, said Hilary. She's very independent for a start, headstrong too, always makes her own decisions and acts on them. Like about not going to university and getting a job instead. Once she'd made her mind up, she was off. It was the same with marrying Terry. Love at first sight, she said. You weren't at the wedding, though. Hilary can't travel any more, said Clive, going over and patting his wife's inert form. Can you, love? We sent a telegram and a present, Hilary said. A nice set of Royal Dalton. Do you think Lucy lacks confidence, self-esteem? It depends on what you're talking about. She's confident enough at work, but not so much around people. She often becomes very quiet around strangers, very wary and reserved. She doesn't like crowds, but she used to like going out with a small group of friends, you know, the girls from work, that sort of thing. Would you say she's a loner by nature? To some extent, yes. She's a very private person. Never told us much about what was going on or what was going through her mind. Jenny was wondering whether she should ask if Lucy tortured animals, wet her bed, and set fire to the local school, but she couldn't find an easy way to get around to doing it. Was she like that even as a child? she asked. Or did her need for solitude develop later in life? We wouldn't know the answer to that, said Clive, looking over at his wife. We didn't know her then. What do you mean? Well, Lucy wasn't our daughter, not our natural daughter. Hilary can't have children, you see. She's got a heart condition. Always has had. Doctor said childbirth could kill her. Hilary patted her heart and gave Jenny a rueful look. You adopted Lucy? No, no, we fostered her. 
Lucy was our foster child. The third and last, as it turned out. She was with us by far the longest, and we came to think of her as our own. I don't understand. Why didn't you tell the police this? They didn't ask, said Clive, as if that made it all perfectly reasonable. Jenny was stunned. Here was an essential piece of information in the puzzle that was Lucy Payne, and nobody else on the team knew it. How old was she when she came to you? Jenny asked. Twelve, said Clive. It was in March 1990. I remember the day as if it were yesterday. Didn't you know? Lucy was one of the older Thorpe Seven. Annie lounged back in her hard wooden chair, as if it had been moulded to fit her shape, and stretched out her legs. Banks had always envied the way she managed to seem so centred and comfortable in almost any environment, and she was doing it now. She took a sip of her Theakston's bitter and almost purred. Then she smiled at Banks. I've been cursing you all day, you know, she said, taking your name in vain. I thought my ears were burning. By right, they should have both burned off by now. Point taken. What did Superintendent Chambers have to say? Annie gave a dismissive wave. What you'd expect? That it's my career on the line if there's any fallout. Oh, and he warned me about you. About me. Yes. Said he thought you might try to pump me for information. To play my cards close to my chest. Which he examined rather too closely for my comfort, by the way. Anything else? Yes. He said you're a ladies' man. Is that true? Banks laughed. He did? He really said that? Annie nodded. The Queen's Arms was busy with the after-work crowd and tourists seeking shelter, and Banks and Annie had been lucky to get seats at the small, dimpled, copper-topped table in the corner by the window. Banks could see the ghostly images of people with umbrellas, drifting back and forth on Market Street beyond the red and yellow panes of glass. Rain spotted the windows, and he could hear it tapping in the pauses between words. Savage Garden were on the jukebox, claiming that they loved someone before they met her. The air was full of smoke and animated chatter. What do you think of Janet Taylor? Banks asked. I'm not trying to pry into your case, I'm just interested in your first impression. So you say. Anyway, I quite like her, and I feel sorry for her. She's a probationary PC with the limited experience put in an impossible position. She did what came naturally, but... I'll not let my feelings blink in my judgment. I haven't been able to put it all together yet, but it looks to me as if Janet Taylor lied on her statement. Deliberately lied, or just didn't remember. I suppose we could give her the benefit of the doubt on that. Look, I've never been in a situation like she was. I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for her. The fact remains that, according to Dr. Mugabe, she must have hit pain with her bat on at least seven or eight times after he was beyond any sort of retaliatory action. He was stronger than her. Maybe that's what was required to subdue him. The law allows us some latitude on reasonable force in making an arrest. Annie shook her head. She stretched out her legs sideways from the chair and crossed them. Banks noticed the thin gold chain around her ankle, one of the many things he found sexy about Annie. She lost it, Alan. It goes way beyond self-defence and reasonable force. There's another thing, too. What? I spoke to the paramedics and ambulance attendants who were first at the scene. They hadn't a clue what had happened, of course but it didn't take them long to work out it was something really nasty and bizarre. And one of them said, when he went over to P.C. Taylor, who was cradling P.C. Morris's body, she looked over at Payne and said, Is he dead? Did I kill the bastard? That could mean anything. My point exactly. In the hands of a good barrister, it could mean she had intended to kill him all along and was asking if she had succeeded in her aim. It could signify intent. It could also just be an innocent question. 
You know as well as I do, there's nothing innocent about this business at all. Especially with the Hadley case on the news every day. And don't forget that Payne was unarmed and down on the floor when she aimed the final few blows. How do we know that? P.C. Taylor had already broken his wrist, according to her statement, and kicked the machete into the corner, where it was found later. Also, the angles of the blows and the force behind them indicate she had the advantage of height, which we know she didn't have naturally. Payne's six foot one, and P.C. Taylor's only five foot six. Banks took a long drag on his cigarette as he digested what Annie had to say, thinking it wouldn't be a hell of a lot of fun to tell A.C. Hartnell about this. Not an immediate threat to her then, he said. Not from where I'm looking. Annie shifted a little in her chair. It's possible, she admitted. I'm not saying that wouldn't freak out even the best trained copper. But I've got to say that it looks to me as if she lost it. I still like to have a look at the scene. Sure. Though I doubt there's much left to see now the sockers have been in there for three days. Even so, I understand, said Banks. And he did. There was something ritualistic in visiting the scene. Whether you picked up vibrations from the walls or what, it didn't really matter. What mattered was that it connected you more closely with the crime. You had stood there in that place where evil had happened. When do you want to go? Tomorrow morning. I'll call on Janet Taylor after. I'll arrange it with the officers on duty, said Banks. We can go down there together if you like. I'm off to talk to Lucy Payne again before she disappears. They're releasing her from hospital? So I've heard. Her injuries aren't that serious. Besides, they need the beds. Annie paused, then she said, I'd rather make my own way. OK, if that's what you want. Oh, don't look so crestfallen, Alan. It's nothing personal. It just wouldn't look good. And people would see us, no matter what you think. You're right, Banks agreed. Look, if there's any chance of a bit of spare time Saturday night, how about dinner and... The corners of Annie's mouth turned up, and a gleam came to her dark eyes. Dinner and what? You know, I don't. Tell me. Banks glanced around to make sure no one was eavesdropping. Then he leaned forward. But before he could say anything, the doors opened and D.C. Winsome Jackman walked in. Heads turned, some because she was black, and some because she was a gorgeous statuesque young woman. Winsome was on duty, and Banks and Annie had told her where they would be. Sorry to disturb you, sir, she said, pulling up a chair and sitting down. That's all right, said Banks. What is it? A D.C. Karen Hodgkins from the task force just phoned. And? Winsome looked at Annie. It's Terence Payne, she said. He died an hour ago in the infirmary without recovering consciousness. Oh, shit, said Annie. Well, that should make life interesting, said Banks, reaching for another cigarette. Tell me about the older Thorpe Seven, said Banks into his phone at home later that evening. He had just settled down to Duke Ellington's black, brown and beige, the latest copy of Gramophone and Two Fingers of Lefroy when Jenny phoned. He turned down the music and reached for his cigarettes. I mean, he went on, I vaguely remember hearing about it at the time, but I can't remember many details. I don't have a lot yet myself, said Jenny, only what the liver said just told me. Go on. Banks heard a rustle of paper at the other end of the line. On the 11th of February 1990, Jenny began, police and social workers made a dawn raid on the village of Alderthorpe near Spurn Head on the East Yorkshire coast. They were acting on allegations of ritual satanic abuse of children and investigating a missing child. Who blew the whistle? Banks asked. I don't know, said Jenny. I didn't ask. Banks filed it away for later. OK, carry on. I'm not a policeman, Alan. I don't know what sort of questions to ask. I'm sure you did just fine. Please go on. They took six children from two separate households into care. 
what exactly was supposed to have been going on. At first it was all very vague, lewd and libidinous behaviour, ritualistic music, dance and costume. Sounds like police headquarters on a Saturday night. Anything else? Well, that's where it gets interesting and sick. It seems this was one of the few such cases in which prosecutions went forward and convictions were gained. All the liver sedges would tell me was that there were tales of torture, of kids being forced to drink urine and eat. Christ, I'm not squeamish, Alan, but this stuff turns my stomach. That's all right. Take it easy. They were humiliated, Jenny went on. Sometimes physically injured, kept in cages without food for days, used as objects of sexual gratification in satanic rituals. One child, a girl called Kathleen Murray, was found dead. Her remains showed evidence of torture and sexual abuse. How did she die? She was strangled. She'd also been beaten and half-starved, too. That was what sparked the whistleblower, her not turning up for school. And this was proven in court. Most of it, yes. The killing. The satanic stuff didn't come out in the trial. I suppose the CPS must have thought it would just sound like too much mumbo-jumbo. How did it come out? Some of the children gave descriptions later, after they'd been fostered. Lucy? No. According to the liver sedges, Lucy never spoke about what happened. She just put it all behind her. Was it followed up? No. There were similar allegations and raids in Cleveland, Rochdale, and the Orkneys, and pretty soon it was all over the papers. Caused a hell of a national outcry. Epidemic of child abuse, that sort of thing. Overzealous social workers. Questions in the house, the lot. I remember, said Banks. Most of the cases were thrown out and nobody wanted to talk about the one that was true. Well, Alderthorpe wasn't the only one. There was a similar case in Nottingham, 1989, that also resulted in convictions, but it wasn't widely publicised. Then we got the Butler Schloss report and revisions of the Children Act. What happened to Lucy's real parents? They went to jail. The liver sedges have no idea whether they're still there or what. They haven't kept track of things. Banks sipped some Lafroig and flicked his cigarette end into the empty grate. So Lucy stayed with the liver sedges. Yes. She changed her name, too, by the way. She used to be called Linda, Linda Godwin. Then, with all the publicity, she wanted to change it. The liver sedges assured me it's all legal and above board. From Linda Godwin to Lucy Liversedge to Lucy Payne, Banks thought. Interesting. Anyway, Jenny went on, after they'd told me all this, I pushed them a bit more, and at least got them to admit life with Lucy wasn't quite as ordinary and normal as they'd originally said it was. Oh? Problems adjusting? Surprise, surprise. The first two years, between the ages of twelve and fourteen, Lucy was as good as gold. A quiet, passive, considerate and sensitive kid. They were worried she was traumatised. And Lucy saw a child psychiatrist for a while. Then, from fourteen to sixteen, she started to act up, come out of her shell. She stopped seeing the psychiatrist. There were boys. Suspicions that she was having sex. And then there was the bullying. Bullying? Yes. At first they told me it was an isolated incident and came to nothing. But later they said it caused a few problems with the school. Lucy was bullying younger girls out of their dinner money and stuff like that. It's fairly common. But in Lucy's case? A phase. The liver sedges worked with the school authorities and the psychiatrist entered the picture again briefly. Then Lucy settled down to behave herself. The next two years, sixteen to eighteen, she quietened down, withdrew more into herself, became less active socially and sexually. She did her A-levels, got good results, and got a job with the NatWest Bank in Leeds. That was four years ago. 
It seemed almost as if she were planning her escape. She had very little contact with the liver sedges after she left, and I get the impression that they were relieved. Why? I don't know why. Call it intuition, but I got the feeling that they ended up being scared of Lucy, for the way she seemed able to manipulate them. As I say, it's just a vague feeling. Interesting. Go on. They saw even less of her after she hooked up with Terence Payne. I thought when they first told me that he might have been responsible for isolating her from her family and friends, you know, the way abusers often do, but now it seems just as likely that she was isolating herself. Her friend from work, Pat Mitchell, said the same thing. Meeting Terry really changed Lucy, cut her off almost entirely from her old life, her old ways. So she was either under his thrall, or she had found a new sort of life that she preferred? Yes. Jenny told him about the incident of Lucy's prostitution. Banks thought for a moment. It's interesting, he said. Really interesting. But it doesn't prove anything. I told you that would probably be the case. It makes her weird. But being weirds, no grounds for arrest, or half the population will be behind bars. More than half. But hang on a minute, Jenny. You've come up with a number of leads worth pursuing. Like what? Like what if Lucy was involved in the Alderthorpe abuse herself? I remember reading at the time that there were cases of some of the older victims abusing their own younger siblings. But what would it mean even if we could prove that after all this time? I don't know, Jenny. I'm just thinking out loud. What's your next step? I'm going to talk to someone from the social services tomorrow. See if I can get the names of any of the social workers involved. Good. I'll work it from the police angle when I get a spare moment. There are bound to be records, files. Then what? I want to go to Alderthorpe, nose around, talk to people who remember. Be careful, Jenny. It's bound to be a very raw nerve out there, even after all this time. I'll be careful. And don't forget, there might still be someone who escaped prosecution worried about new revelations. That makes me feel really safe and secure. The other kids? Yes? What do you know about them? Nothing, really, except they were aged between eight and twelve. Any idea where they are? No. The liver said just don't know. And I did ask them. Don't be defensive. We'll make a detective of you yet. No thanks. Let's see if we can find them, shall we? They might be able to tell us a lot more about Lucy Payne than anyone else. OK. I'll see how much the social workers are willing to tell me. Not much, I'll bet. Your best chance will be if one of them's retired or moved on to some other line of work. Then spilling the beans won't seem like such a betrayal. Hey, I'm supposed to be the psychologist. Leave that sort of thinking to me. Banks laughed over the phone. It's a blurred line sometimes, isn't it? Detective work and psychology. Try and tell some of your oafish colleagues that. Thanks, Jenny, you've done a great job. And I've only just begun. Keep in touch. Promise. When Banks put the phone down, Mahalia Jackson was singing Come Sunday. He turned up the volume and took his drink outside to his little balcony over Gratley Falls. The rain had stopped, but the downpour had been heavy enough to swell the sound of the falls. It was just after sunset, and the deep vermilions, purples and oranges were dying in the western sky, streaked with dark ribs of cloud, while the darkening east went from pale to inky blue. Just across the falls was a field of grazing sheep. In it stood a clump of huge old trees where rooks nested and often woke him early in the morning with their noisy squabbling. Such ill-tempered birds, they seemed. Beyond the field, the dale side sloped down to the river Swain, and Banks could see the opposite hillside a mile or more away, darkening in the evening, rising to the long, grinning skeleton's mouth of Crow Scar. The runic patterns of the dry stone walls seemed to stand out in relief as the light faded. Just a little to his right, he could see Helmthorpe Church Tower poking up from the valley bottom. Banks looked at his watch. 
still early enough to stroll down there and have a pint or two in the dog and gun. Maybe chat with one or two of the locals he had become friendly with since his move. But he decided he didn't fancy company. He had too much on his mind. What with Terence Payne's death, the mystery of Leanne Ray, and the revelations Jenny Fuller had just come through with as regards Lucy's past. Since taking on the chameleon investigation, he realised he had become more and more of a loner, less inclined to make small talk at the bar. Partly, he supposed, it was the burden of command. But it was also something more, the proximity to such evil, perhaps, that tainted him somehow, and made small talk seem like a completely inadequate response to what was happening. The news of Sandra's pregnancy was also still weighing on his mind, bringing back some memories he had hoped to forget. He knew he wouldn't be good company, but nor would he be able to get to sleep so early. He nipped inside and poured another shot of whiskey, then picked up his cigarettes and went back outside to lean against the damp wall and enjoy the last of the evening light. A curlew piped up on the distant moors, and Mahalia Jackson sang on, humming the tune long after she had run out of words. Chapter 10 Friday morning started badly for Maggie. She had spent a night disturbed by vague and frightening nightmares that scuttled away into the shadows the minute she awoke screaming and tried to grasp them. Getting back to sleep was difficult, not only because of the bad dreams, but also because of the eerie noises and voices she could hear from across the road. Didn't the police ever sleep? Once, getting up to go for a glass of water, she looked out of her bedroom window and saw some uniformed police officers carrying cardboard boxes into a van waiting with its engine running. Then some men carried what looked like electronic equipment through the front door. And a short while later, Maggie fancied she could see a strange ghostly light sweeping the living room of number 35 behind the drawn curtains. The digging continued in the front garden, surrounded by a canvas screen and lit on the inside so that all Maggie could see was enlarged and deformed shadows of men silhouetted against the canvas. These figures carried over into her next nightmare, and in the end she didn't know whether she was asleep or awake. She got up a little after seven o'clock and headed for the kitchen, where a cup of tea helped soothe her frayed nerves. This was one English habit that she had slipped into easily. She planned to spend the day working on Grimm again, perhaps Hansel and Gretel, now that she had satisfactory sketches for Rapunzel, and trying to put the business of number 35 out of her head for a few hours at least. Then she heard the paperboy arrive, and the newspaper slip through her letterbox onto the hall mat. She hurried out and carried it back to the kitchen where she spread it on the table. Lorraine Temple's story was prominent on the front page beside the bigger headline story about Terence Payne's dying without recovering consciousness. There was even a photograph of Maggie, taken without her knowledge, standing just outside her front gate. It must have been taken when she was going down to the pub to talk with Lorraine, she realised, as she was wearing the same jeans and light cotton jacket as she had worn on Tuesday. House of Payne, Neighbour Speaks Out, ran the headline. 
and the article went on to detail how Maggie had heard suspicious sounds coming from across the hill and called the police. Afterwards, calling Maggie Lucy's friend, Lorraine Temple reported that Maggie had said about Lucy's being a victim of domestic abuse and how she was scared of her husband. All of which was fine and accurate enough as far as it went. But then came the sting in the tail. According to sources in Toronto, Lorraine Temple went on to report, Maggie Forrest herself was on the run from an abusive husband, Toronto lawyer William Burke. The article detailed the time Maggie had spent in hospital and all the fruitless court orders issued to stop Bill going near her. Describing Maggie as a nervous, mousy sort of woman, Lorraine Temple also mentioned that she was seeing a local psychiatrist called Dr. Sims, who declined to comment. Lorraine ended by suggesting that, perhaps because of Maggie's own psychological problems, Maggie had been gullible, and that her identification with Lucy's plight may have blinded her to the truth. Lorraine couldn't come out and say that she thought Lucy was guilty of anything. The laws of libel forbade that. But she did have a very good stab at making her readers think Lucy might just be the sort of manipulative and deceitful person who could twist a weak woman like Maggie around her little finger. It was rubbish, of course, but effective rubbish nonetheless. How could she do that? Now everybody would know. Every time Maggie walked down the street to go to the shops or catch the bus into town, the neighbours and shopkeepers would look at her differently, with pity, and perhaps just the merest hint of blame in their eyes. Some people would avoid looking her in the eye, and perhaps even stop talking to her, associating her too closely for comfort with the events at number 35. Even strangers who recognised her from the photograph would wonder about her. Perhaps Claire would stop coming to see her altogether, though she hadn't been since the time the policeman turned up, and Maggie was already worried about her. Perhaps even Bill would find out. It was her own fault, of course. She had put herself in harm's way. She had been trying to do a favour for poor Lucy, trying to garner her some public sympathy, and the whole thing had backfired. How stupid she had been to trust Lorraine Temple. One lousy article like this and a whole new fragile protected world would change. Just like that. It wasn't fair. Maggie told herself as she cried over the breakfast table. It just wasn't fair. After a short but satisfying night's sleep, perhaps due to the generous doses of Lefroig and Duke Ellington, Banks was back in his Millgarth cubbyhole by 8.30 on Friday morning, and the first news to cross his desk was a note from Stefan Novak, informing him that the skeletal remains dug up in the Payne's garden were not Leanne Ray's. Had Banks been harbouring the slightest hope that Leanne might still be alive and well after all this time, he would have jumped for joy. But as it was, he rubbed his forehead in frustration. It looked as if it was going to be another one of those days. He punched in Stefan's mobile number and got an answer after three rings. It sounded as if Stefan was in the middle of another conversation, but he muttered a few asides and gave his attention to Banks. Sorry about that, he said. Problems? Typical breakfast chaos. I'm just trying to get out of the house. I know what you mean. Look, about this identification. It's solid, sir. Dental records. DNA will take a bit longer. There's no way it's Leanne Ray. I'm just about to set off back to the house. The lads are still digging. Who the hell can it be? Don't know. All I've been able to find out so far is that it's a young woman, late teens to early twenties. Been there a few months, and there's a lot of stainless steel in her dental work, including a crown. Meaning? Banks asked, a faint memory beckoning. Possible Eastern European origin. They still use a lot of stainless steel over there. Right. Banks had come across something like that before. A forensic dentist had once told him that Russians used stainless steel. Eastern European. Just a possibility, sir. All right. 
Any chance of that DNA comparison between Payne and the Seacroft rapist turning up before the weekend? I'll get on to them this morning. See if I can give them a prod. Okay, thanks. Keep at it, Stefan. Will do. Banks hung up, more puzzled than ever. One of the first things A.C. Hartnell had instituted when the team was first put together was a special squad to keep tabs on all missing persons cases throughout the entire country. Mispers, as they were called, particularly if they involved blonde teenagers with no apparent reasons for running away, disappearing on their way home from clubs, pubs, cinemas and dances. The team had monitored scores of cases every day, but none had met the criteria of the chameleon investigation, except one girl in Cheshire, who had turned up alive and contrite two days later after a brief shack-up with her boyfriend, about which she just happened to forget to tell her parents, and the sadder case of a young girl in Lincoln who, it turned out, had been run over and had not been carrying any identification. Now here was Stefan saying they'd probably got a dead Eastern European girl in the garden. Banks didn't get very far with his chain of thought before his office door opened and D.C. Filey dropped a copy of that morning's post on his desk. Annie parked her purple Astra up the street and walked towards number 35, the hill, shielding her eyes from the morning sunlight. Crime scene tape and trestles blocked off that section of pavement in front of the garden wall, so that pedestrians had to make a detour onto the tarmac road to get by. One or two people paused to glance over the garden gate as they passed, Annie noticed, but most walked to the other side of the road and averted their eyes. She even saw one elderly woman cross herself. Annie showed her warrant card to the officer on duty, signed in at the gate and walked down the garden path. She wasn't afraid of seeing gruesome sights, if indeed there were any left inside the house. But she had never before visited a scene so completely overrun with soco activity, and just walking into it made her edgy. The men in the front garden ignored her and went on with their digging. The door was ajar, and when Annie pushed gently, it opened into the hall. The hallway was deserted, and at first the house seemed so quiet inside that Annie thought she was alone. Then someone shouted, and the sound of a pneumatic drill ripped through the air, coming up from the cellar, shattering her illusion. The house was hot, stuffy and full of dust, and Annie sneezed three times before exploring further. Her nerves gradually gave way to professional curiosity, and she noted with interest that the carpets had been taken up, leaving only the bare concrete floors and wooden stairs, and that the living room had been stripped of furniture too, even down to the light fixtures. Several holes had been punched in the walls, no doubt to ensure that no bodies had been entombed there. Annie gave a little shudder. Poe's The Cask of Amontillado was one of the more frightening stories she had read at school. Everywhere she went, she was conscious of the narrow, roped-off pathway she knew she was supposed to follow. In an odd way, it was like visiting the Bronte Parsonage or Wordsworth's Cottage, where you could only stand and look beyond the rope at the antique furniture. The kitchen, where three sockers were working on the sink and drains, was in the same sorry state. Tiles wrenched up, oven and fridge gone, cupboards bare, fingerprint dust everywhere. Annie hadn't thought anyone could do so much damage to a place in three days. One of the Sockos looked over at her and asked her rather testily what she thought she was doing there. She flashed him her warrant card and he went back to ripping out the sink. The pneumatic drill stopped and Annie heard the sound of a vacuum cleaner from upstairs, an eerily domestic sound amid all the crime scene chaos, though she knew its purpose was far more sinister than getting rid of the dust. She took the silence from the cellar as her cue to go down there, noting as she did so the door opened to the garage, which had been stripped as bare as the rest of the house. The car was gone, no doubt in the police garage being taken apart piece by piece, and the oil-stained floor had been dug up. She sensed herself becoming hypersensitive as she approached the cellar door 
her breath coming in short gasps. There was an obscene poster of a naked woman, with her legs spread wide apart on the door, which Annie hoped the Sockos hadn't left there, because they enjoyed seeing it. That must have unnerved Janet Taylor to start with, she thought, advancing slowly, as she imagined Janet and Dennis had done. Christ, she felt apprehensive enough herself, even though she knew the only people in there were Sockos. But Janet and Dennis hadn't known what to expect, Annie told herself. Whatever it was, they hadn't expected what they got. She knew far more than they had, and no doubt her imagination was working overtime on that. Through the door, much cooler down here, trying to feel the way it was, despite the two Socco officers and the bright lighting, Janet went in first, Dennis just behind her. The cellar was smaller than she had expected. It must have happened so quickly, candlelight, the figure leaping out of the shadows, wielding a machete, hacking into Dennis Morris's throat and arm because he was the closest. Dennis goes down. Janet already has her side-handled baton out, extended, ready to ward off the first blow. So close she can smell Payne's breath. Perhaps he can't believe that a woman, weaker and smaller than him, can thwart him so easily. Before he can recover from his shock, Janet lashes out and hits him on the left temple. Blinded by pain and perhaps by blood, he falls back against the wall. Next, he feels a sharp pain on his wrist, and he can't hold onto the machete. He hears it skitter away across the floor, but doesn't know where. He rears up and goes at her. Angry now because she knows her partner is bleeding to death on the floor, Janet hits him again and again, wanting it to be over so she can tend to Dennis. He scrabbles after her where he thought the machete went. Blood dripping down his face, she hits him again and again. How much strength does he have left by now? Annie wondered. Surely not enough to overpower Janet. And how many more times does she hit him now he's down? handcuffed to the pipe, not moving at all. Annie sighed, and watched the Sockos shifting their drill to dig into another spot. Are you going to start that thing up again? she asked. One of the men grinned. Want some earmuffs? Annie smiled back at him. No, I'd rather just get out of here before you start. Can you give me another minute or so? Can do. Annie glanced around at the crude stick figures and occult symbols on the walls and wondered how integral a part of Payne's fantasy they were. Banks had also told her that the place was lit by dozens of candles, but they were all gone now, as was the mattress they had found the body on. One of the Sockers was on his knees looking at something on the concrete floor over by the door. What is it? Annie asked him. Found something? Dunno, he said, some sort of little scuff marked in the concrete. It hardly shows at all, but there seems to be some sort of pattern. Annie knelt to look. She couldn't see anything until the Socko pointed to what looked like small circles in the concrete. There were three of them in all, pretty much equidistant. I'll try a few different lighting angles, he said almost to himself. Maybe some infrared film to highlight the contrast. Could be a tripod, Annie said. What? Bugger me, sorry, love, but you, you could be right. Luke Selkirk and that funny little assistant of his were down here a day or two ago. Maybe they left the marks. I think they'd have been more professional, don't you? I'd better ask them, hadn't I? Annie left him to it and walked through the far door. The ground had been sectioned into grids and the soil had been dug up. Annie knew that three bodies had been found there. She followed the narrow marked path across to the door, opened it, and walked up the steps into the back garden. Crime scene tape barred her entrance at the top of the steps, but she didn't need to go any further. Like the anteroom in the cellar, the overgrown garden had been divided into grids and marked out with rope. Most of them had already been cleared of grass and weeds and topsoil, but some, further back, remained overgrown. At the far wall, 
A large waterproof sheet used to protect the garden from yesterday's rain lay rolled up like a carpet. This was a delicate job. Annie knew from watching the excavation of a skeleton at the village of Hobbs End. It was far too easy to disturb old bones. She could see the hole, about three feet deep where one body had been dug up. And now there were two men gathered around another hole, taking off the soil with trowels and passing it to a third man, who ran it through a sieve as if he were panning for gold. What is it? Annie asked from the top of the cellar steps. One of the men looked up at her. She hadn't recognised Stefan Novak at first. She didn't know him well, as he hadn't been at Eastvale's Western Divisional Headquarters for long, but Banks had introduced them once. Stefan was the man, ACC Ron McLaughlin had said, who would drag North Yorkshire kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Annie had found him rather reserved, a bit mysterious even, as if he were carrying around a grave secret or a great weight of past pain. He affected a cheery enough demeanour on the surface, but she could tell it didn't run very deep. He was tall, over six foot, and handsome in a clean-cut, elegant sort of way. She knew his background was Polish, and had often wondered if he were a prince or a count or something. Most of the Poles she had ever met said they were descended from counts or princes at one time or another, and there was something regal and stately in Stefan's bearing. It's Annie, isn't it? he said. Dias Annie Cabot. D.I. now, Stefan. How's it going? Didn't know you were on this case. One of them, Annie explained. Terence Payne. I'm with complaints and discipline. I can't believe the CPS will even let that one see the light of day, said Stefan. Justifiable homicide, surely. I hope that's how they'll see it, but you never know with them. Anyway, I just wanted to look at the place. I'm afraid we've made rather a mess, said Stefan. It looks as if we've just found another body. Want to look? Annie ducked under the tape. Yes. Be careful, said Stefan. Follow the marked path. Annie did as he said, and soon found herself standing beside the partially excavated grave. This one was a skeleton. Not quite as stained and filthy as the one she had seen at Hobbs End, but a skeleton nonetheless. She could see part of the skull, one shoulder, and part of the left arm. How long? she asked. Hard to say, Stefan answered. More than a few months? He introduced the two men who had been poring over the grave with him, one a botanist and the other an entomologist. These lads should be able to help with that. And we're getting Dr. Ewan Williams to come over from the university and give us a hand. Annie remembered the young doctor with the long hair and the prominent Adam's apple from the Hobbs End case, the way he had caressed Gloria Shackleton's pelvic bone and leered over it at Annie. I know this isn't my case, Annie said, but isn't this one body too many? Stefan looked up at her and shielded his eyes from the sun. Yes, he said, it is. Rather throws a spanner in the works, doesn't it? Indeed it does. Annie walked back towards her car. There was nothing more to be gained from hanging around the hill. Besides, she realised, glancing at her watch, she had a post-mortem to attend. What the hell do you mean, talking to the press like that? said Banks. Didn't I warn you about it? This is the first time I've heard we're living in a police state, said Maggie Forrest arms folded over her chest, eyes angry and tearful. They stood in her kitchen, Banks brandishing the post, and Maggie in the midst of clearing away her breakfast dishes. After seeing the article at Milgarth, he had headed straight for the hill. Don't give me that adolescent crap about police states. Who do you think you are, a student protesting against some distant war? You've no right to talk to me like this. I haven't done anything wrong. Anything wrong? Have you any idea of the wasp's nest you could be helping to stir up? I don't know what you mean. All I wanted to do was tell Lucy's side of the story. But that woman twisted it all. Are you so naive that you didn't expect that? There's a difference between being naive and caring. But a cynic like you probably wouldn't understand that. 
Banks could see that Maggie was shaking, either with anger or fear, and he was worried that he had given too free a rein to his anger. He knew she had been abused by her husband, that she was a bruised soul, so she was probably scared stiff of this man raising his voice in her kitchen. It was insensitive of him, but damn it, the woman irritated him. He sat at the kitchen table and tried to cool things down a bit. Maggie, he said softly, I'm sorry, but you could cause us a lot of problems. Maggie seemed to relax a little. I don't see how. Public sympathy is a very fickle thing, and when you mess with it, it's like dancing with the devil. It's just as likely to reach out and eat you up as anyone else. But how would people find out what Lucy went through with her husband's hands? She won't talk about it. I can guarantee you that. None of us know what went on in Lucy's house. All you're doing is jeopardizing her chance of a fair trial, if... Trial? Trial for what? I was going to say, if it comes to that. I'm sorry, but I don't agree. Maggie put the electric kettle on and sat opposite Banks. People need to know about domestic abuse. It's not something that should be swept under the carpet for any reason, especially not just because the police say so. I agree. Look, I understand you're prejudiced against us, but... Prejudiced? Right. With your help, I ended up in hospital. But you have to understand that in many of these matters, our hands are tied. We're only as good as the information we have and the laws of the land allow. All the more reason for me to speak out about Lucy. After all, you're not exactly here to help her, are you? I'm here to find out the truth. Well, that's all very high and mighty of you. Now who's the cynic? We all know the police only want convictions, that they're not overly concerned with the truth, or with justice. Convictions help, if they keep the bad guys off the street. Too often they don't. And justice we leave to the courts. But you're wrong about the rest. I can't speak for anyone else. But I'm very much concerned with the truth. I've worked day and night on this case, since the beginning of April. And every case I work on, I want to know what happened, who did it, and why. I don't always find out. But you'd be surprised how much I do learn. Sometimes it gets me into trouble. And I have to live with the knowledge. Take it into my life, take it home with me. I'm that snowball rolling down the hill. Only the pure snows run out, and I'm picking up layer after layer of dirt and gravel, just so that you can sit safe and warm at home and accuse me of being some sort of Gestapo officer. I didn't mean it like that. And I wasn't always safe and warm. Do you know that what you've done actually stands a good chance of warping the truth, whatever it may be? I didn't do that. It was her. That journalist, Lorraine Temple. Banks slapped the table and immediately regretted it when Maggie jumped. Wrong, he said. She was only doing her job. Like it or not, that's what it is. Her job's to sell newspapers. You've got this all backwards, Maggie. You think the media's here to tell the truth and the police to lie. You're confusing me now. The kettle boiled and Maggie got up to make tea. She didn't offer Banks a cup but when it was ready, she poured him one automatically. He thanked her. All I'm saying, Maggie, is that you might be doing Lucy more harm than good by talking to the press. Look at what happened this time. You say it came out all wrong and that they practically said Lucy is as guilty as her husband. That's hardly helping her, is it? But I told you, she twisted my words. And I'm saying, you should have expected that. It made a better story. Then where am I supposed to go to tell the truth, or to find it? Christ, Maggie, if I knew the answer to that, I'd... But before Banks could finish, his mobile rang. This time it was the PC on duty at the infirmary. Lucy Payne had just been cleared for release, and she had a solicitor with her. Do you know anything about this solicitor? Banks asked Maggie when he'd finished on the phone. She smiled sheepishly. As a matter of fact, yes, I do. Banks said nothing, not trusting himself to respond in a civilized manner. 
Leaving his tea untouched, he bid Maggie Forrest a hurried farewell and dashed out to his car. He didn't even stop to talk to Annie Cabot when he saw her walking out of number 35, but managed only a quick wave before jumping in his Renault and roaring off. Lucy Payne was sitting on the bed painting her toenails black when Banks walked in. She gave him a look and demurely pulled her skirt down over her thighs. The bandages were gone from her head and the bruises seemed to be healing well. She had rearranged her long black hair so it covered the patch the doctor had shaved for his stitches. Another woman stood in the room, over by the window, the solicitor. Slight in stature, with chocolate brown hair, cropped almost as closely as Banks's, and watchful, serious hazel eyes. She was dressed in a charcoal pinstripe jacket, matching skirt and a white blouse, with some sort of ruffled front. She wore dark tights and shiny black pumps. She walked over and held out her hand. Julia Ford, I am Lucy's solicitor. I don't believe we've met. A pleasure, said Banks. This isn't the first time you've talked to my client, is it, Superintendent? No, said Banks. And the last time you were accompanied by a psychologist named Dr. Fuller? Dr. Fuller's our consultant psychologist on the Chameleon Task Force, said Banks. Just be careful, Superintendent, that's all. I'd have very good grounds to argue that anything Dr. Fuller might have got from my client is inadmissible as evidence. We weren't gathering evidence, said Banks. Lucy was questioned as a witness and as a victim, not as a suspect. A fine line, Superintendent. Should matters change? And now? Banks glanced at Lucy, who had resumed painting her toenails seeming indifferent to the banter between her solicitor and Banks. "'I wasn't aware you thought you needed a solicitor, Lucy,' he said. Lucy looked up. "'It's in my best interests. They're discharging me this morning. Soon as the paperwork's done, I can go home.' Banks looked at Julia Ford in exasperation. "'I hope you haven't encouraged her in this fantasy.' Julia raised her eyebrows. I don't know what you're talking about. Banks turned back to Lucy. You can't go home, Lucy, he explained. Your house has been taken apart brick by brick by forensic experts. Have you any concept of what happened there? Of course I have, said Lucy. Terry hit me. He knocked me out and put me in hospital. But Terry's dead now, isn't he? Yes, so. That changes things, doesn't it? Look, said Lucy, I've been abused and I've just lost my husband. Now you're telling me I've lost my home, too, for the time being. Well, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? How about your foster parent, Linda? Lucy's look let Banks know that she hadn't missed the emphasis. I don't seem to have much choice, do I? Anyway, it won't be a problem for a while yet, Banks went on. We found traces of Kimberly Myers' blood on the sleeves of your dressing gown, along with some yellow fibres under your fingernails. You've got a lot of explaining to do before you go anywhere. Lucy looked alarmed. What do you mean? Julia Ford narrowed her eyes and looked at Banks. What he means, Lucy, is that he's going to take you in to the police station for questioning. Can he do that? I'm afraid so, Lucy. And he can keep me there? Under the PACE regulations, he can, yes. If he's not satisfied with the answers you give him. For twenty-four hours. But there are very strict guidelines. You've got nothing to worry about. You mean I could be in prison for a whole day, in a cell? Don't be alarmed, Lucy, said Julia, stepping over and touching her client's arm. Nothing bad will happen to you. Those days are gone now. You'll be well looked after. But I'll be in prison. Possibly. It all depends. But I haven't done anything. She gave Banks an angry look, black eyes burning like coals. I'm the victim here. Why are you picking on me? Nobody's picking on you, Lucy, said Banks. There's a lot of questions need answering, and we think you can help us. 
I'll answer your questions. I'm not refusing to cooperate. You don't have to take me to the police station for that. Besides, I've already answered them. Hardly. There's a lot more we need to know. And there are certain formalities, procedures to be followed. Anyway, it's all changed now that Terry's died, hasn't it? Lucy looked away. I don't know what you mean. You can speak freely now. You don't have to be afraid of him. Oh, I see. What did you think I meant, Lucy? Nothing. That you could change your story, just deny everything. I told you nothing. But there's the blood to explain now, and the yellow fibres. We know you were in the cellar, we can prove it. I don't know anything about that, I don't remember. Very convenient. Aren't you sorry Terry's dead, Lucy? Lucy packed her nail polish away in her handbag. Of course I am. But he beat me up. It was him who put me here. Him who got me into all this trouble with the police. It's not my fault. None of it's my fault. I haven't done anything wrong. Why should I have to be the one who suffers? Banks shook his head and stood up. Maybe we'd better just go. Lucy looked over to Julia Ford. I'll come with you, said Julia. I'll be present when you're questioned, and nearby in case you need me. Lucy managed a weak smile. But you won't stay in the cell with me. Julia smiled back, then looked at Banks. I'm afraid they don't make doubles, Lucy. That's right, said Banks. Like girls, do you, Lucy? There's no need for that, Superintendent, Julia Ford said. And I'll thank you to keep any more questions you might have until we're in the interview room. Lucy just glared at Banks. Anyway, Julia Ford went on, turning back to Lucy. Let's not be pessimistic. It might not come to that. She turned to Banks. Might I suggest, Superintendent, that we leave by a discreet exit? You can't have failed to notice the media presence. It's a big story for them, Banks said, but yes, that's a good idea. I've got another one, too. Oh? That we take Lucy to Eastvale for questioning. You and I know damn well that Milgarth will be a zoo once the press find out she's there. This way we've got a chance of avoiding all that chaos, at least for a while. Julia Ford thought for a moment, then looked at Lucy. It's a good idea, she said. Will you come to Eastvale with me? I'm scared. Of course. Julia looked at Banks. I'm sure the superintendent here can recommend a decent hotel. And how could she possibly know I'm seeing you? Maggie asked Dr. Susan Sims at the start of her session that afternoon. I've no idea, but you can be certain I didn't tell anyone, and I told her nothing. I know, said Maggie. Thank you. Think nothing of it, dear. It's a matter of professional ethics. This implied support of yours for Lucy Payne, is it true? Maggie felt her anger bristle again as she remembered her argument with Banks that morning. She still felt upset by it. I think Lucy's been a victim of abuse, yes. Dr. Sims remained silent for a while, gazing out of the window. Then she shifted in her chair and said, Just be careful, Margaret, just be careful. You seem to be under a lot of stress. Now, shall we begin? I believe last time we were talking about your family. Maggie remembered. It was their fourth session, and the first time they'd touched on Maggie's own family background, which surprised her. She had been expecting Freudian questions about her relationship with her father right from the start, even though Dr. Sims had insisted she wasn't a Freudian analyst. They were sitting in a small office, overlooking Park Square, a peaceful, elegant bit of eighteenth-century Leeds. Birds sang in the trees amid the pink and white blossoms, and students sat on the grass reading or simply enjoying the sun again after yesterday's rain. Most of the humidity seemed to have cleared away, and the air was crisp and warm. Dr. Sims had her window open, and Maggie could smell flowers from the window box. She didn't know what kind, but they were flowers all right, red and white and purple. She could just see the top of the town hall dome over the trees 
and the elegant facades of the houses on the opposite side of the square. The place was just like a doctor's office, Maggie thought, or at least an old-style doctor's office, with solid desk, diplomas on the wall, fluorescent lights, filing cabinets and bookcases full of psychological journals and textbooks. There was no couch. Maggie and Dr. Sims sat in armchairs, not facing each other, but at a slight angle so that eye contact was easy but not mandatory, cooperative rather than confrontational. Dr. Sims had been recommended by Ruth, and so far she was turning out to be a real find. In her mid-fifties, solidly built, matronly even, and with a severe look about her, she always wore old-fashioned Laura Ashley-style clothes, and her blue-gray hair was lacquered into whirls and waves that looked razor-sharp. Appearances to the contrary. Dr. Sims had the kindest, most compassionate manner Maggie could wish for, without being soft, for she certainly wasn't soft. Sometimes she was downright prickly, especially if Maggie, whom she always called Margaret for some reason, got her defences up or started whimpering. There was never any violence in the home when we were growing up. My father was strict, but he never used his fists or his bell to discipline us. Neither my sister Fiona nor me. So what did he do for discipline? All the usual things. Grounded us, stopped our pocket money, lectured us, that sort of thing. Did he raise his voice? No, I never heard him yell at anyone. Did your mother have a violent temper? Good Lord, no. I mean, she might get mad and shout if Fiona or I did something annoying, like not tidying up our rooms, but it'd be all over and forgotten in no time. Dr. Sims put her fist under her chin and rested on it. I see. Let's get back to Bill, shall we? If you like. No, Margaret, it's not for me to like. It's for you to want. Maggie shifted in her chair. Yes, all right. You told me in our previous session that you had seen signs of his aggressiveness before you were married. Can you tell me more about that? Yes, but it wasn't directed towards me. Towards whom was it directed? The world in general, perhaps? No, just some people, people who screwed up, like waiters or delivery men. Did he beat them up? He got mad, lost his temper, yelled at them, called them idiots, morons. What I meant was that he channeled a lot of aggression into his work. Ah, yes. He's a lawyer, right? Yes, for a big firm. And he wanted to make partner very badly. He's competitive by nature? Very. He was a high school sports star and he might have ended up playing professional football if he hadn't ripped his knee apart in a championship game. He still walks with a slight limp, but he hates it if anyone notices it and mentions it. It doesn't stop him playing with the firm's softball team. But I don't see what this has to do with anything. Dr. Sims leaned forward and lowered her voice. Margaret, I want you to see, to understand where your husband's anger and violence come from. They didn't come from you. They came from him. They didn't come out of your family background in any way either. They came from his. Only when you see that, when you see that it was his problem and not yours, will you start to believe that it wasn't your fault, and you will find the strength and courage to go on and live your life as fully as you can rather than continue in this shadow existence you have at the moment. But I already see that, Maggie protested. I mean, I know it was his aggression, not mine. But you don't feel it. Maggie felt disappointed. Dr. Sims was right. Don't I? she said. I suppose not. Do you know anything about poetry, Margaret? Not much, no. Only what we did at school— and one of my boyfriends at art college used to write me stuff. Terrible drivel, really. He just wanted to get in my pants. Dr. Sims laughed. Another surprise, for it came out as a loud, horsey guffaw. Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote a poem called Dejection, an Ode. 
It was partly about his inability to feel anything. And one of the quotes that has always stuck in my mind was when he wrote about looking at the clouds, the moon and the stars, and ended up saying, I see, not feel, how beautiful they are. I think that applies to you, Margaret, and I think you know it. Intellectual awareness of something through reason does not guarantee emotional acceptance. And you are a very intellectual person, despite your obvious creative inclinations. If I were a Jungian, which I am not, I would probably classify you as the introverted thinking type. Now, tell me more about this courtship. There's not much to tell. A door opened and closed out in the corridor. Two male voices rose and fell. Then only the bird songs and the sound of distant traffic on the hedgerow and park lane remained. I suppose he swept me off my feet, she went on. It was about seven years ago, and I was just a young art school graduate without a career, still wet behind the ears, hanging out with the artsy crowd in bars and arguing philosophy in Queen Street West pubs and coffee houses, thinking one day some rich patron would appear and discover my genius. I'd had a few affairs in college, slept with a few boys, nothing satisfactory. Then along came this tall, dark, intelligent, handsome man in an Armani suit who wanted to take me to concerts and expensive restaurants. It wasn't the money. That wasn't it at all. Not even the restaurants. I wasn't even eating much then. It was his style, his panache, I suppose. He dazzled me. And did he prove to be the patron of the arts you had been dreaming of? Maggie looked down at the scuffed knees of her jeans. Not really. Bill was never very much interested in the arts. Oh, we had all the requisite subscriptions, in symphony, ballet, opera. Somehow I... Somehow you what? I don't know. Perhaps I'm being unfair. But I think maybe it was just some sort of a business thing, being seen. Like going to a client's box at the Sky Dome. I mean, he'd be excited about going to the opera, for example. Take ages getting dressed up in his tux and fuss about what he wanted me to wear. Then we'd have drinks in the members' bar beforehand. Rub shoulders with colleagues and clients, all the local bigwigs but I just got the impression that the music itself bored him. Did any problems manifest themselves early on in your relationship? Maggie twisted her sapphire ring around her finger, the freedom ring she had bought after she had thrown Bill's wedding and engagement rings into Lake Ontario. Well, she said, it's easy to identify things as problems in retrospect, isn't it? Claim that you saw it coming or should have after you found out where things were leading. They might not have seemed strange at the time, might they? Try. Maggie continued twisting at her ring. Well, I suppose the main problem was Bill's jealousy. About what? Most things, really. He was very possessive. He didn't like me talking to other men for too long at parties. That sort of thing. But mostly he was jealous of my friends. The artists. Yes, you see... He never had much time for them. He thought them all a bunch of deadbeats, losers, and he felt he'd somehow rescued me from them. She laughed. And they, on their part, didn't want to mix with corporate lawyers in Armani suits. But you continue to see your friends. Oh, yes, sort of. And how did Bill react to this? He used to make fun of them to me, put them down, criticize them. He called them pseudo-intellectuals, no-brainers and layabouts. If we ever met any of them when we were together, he'd just stand there, looking up at the sky, shifting from foot to foot, glancing at his Rolex, whistling. I can see him now. Did you defend them? Yes, for a while. Then there seemed no point. Maggie remained silent for a moment, then she went on. You have to remember that I was head over heels in love with Bill. He took me to movie premieres. We'd go for weekends in New York, stay at the plaza, 
take horse and buggy rides in Central Park, go to cocktail parties full of stockbrokers and CEOs, you name it. There was a romantic side to it all. Once, we even flew down to L.A. for a movie premiere the firm's entertainment lawyers had been involved with. We went to the party, too. Sean Connery was there. Can you believe it? I actually met Sean Connery. How did you handle all this high living? I fithered in well enough. I was good at mixing with them, businessmen, lawyers, entrepreneurs, the movers and shakers. Believe it or not, many of them are far more cultured than the artsy crowd thinks. A lot of them sponsored corporate art collections. My friends believed that everyone in a suit was dull and conservative, a philistine to boot. But you can't always go by appearances. I knew that. I think they were being very immature about it all. I think Bill saw me as a positive enhancement to his career. But he saw my friends as deadweights that would drag me down with them if they could. Maybe him, too, if we weren't careful. And I didn't feel anywhere near as uncomfortable in his world as he did in mine. I began to feel I'd only been playing the starving artist role, anyway. What do you mean by that? Well, my dad's a pretty important architect, and we always moved in elevated circles. Traveled around the continent a fair bit on commissions, too, when I was younger, just after we emigrated from England. Sometimes, if it was school holidays, he'd take me with him. So I didn't come from a blue-collar background or a bohemian one. Dad appreciates the arts, but he's very conservative, and we weren't poor. Anyway, as time went on, I suppose I began to agree with Bill. He wore down my defenses like he did in a lot of other ways. I mean, all my friends seemed to do was drift from one social security check to the next without making any attempt to do anything because it would compromise their precious art. The greatest sin in our crowd was to sell out which you did. Maggie stared out of the window for a moment. The blossoms were falling from the trees in slow motion. She suddenly felt cold and hugged herself. Yes, she said. I suppose I did. As far as my friends were concerned, I was lost to them. I'd been seduced by the almighty dollar, and all because of Bill. At one of his firm's parties, I met a small publisher who was looking for an illustrator for a children's book. I showed him my work, and he loved it. I got the job. Then that led to another, and so on. How did Bill react to your success? He was pleased, at first, thrilled. Proud that the publisher liked my work. Proud when the book was published. He bought copies for all his nephews and nieces, his clients' kids, his boss. Dozens of copies. And he was pleased that it was because of him all this had happened. As he never ceased to tell me. It would never have happened if I'd chosen to stay with my deadbeat friends. This was at first. What about later? Maggie felt herself shrinking in the chair, her voice becoming smaller. That was different. Later, after we were married and Bill still hadn't made partner, I think he started to resent my success. He started referring to art as my little hobby and suggested that I might have to give it up at any time and start having babies. But you chose not to have babies. No, I had no choice. I can't have babies. Maggie felt herself slipping down the rabbit hole, just like Alice, darkness closing around her. Margaret, Margaret! She could hear Dr. Sim's voice only as if from a great distance, echoing. With a huge effort, she struggled up towards it, towards the light, and felt herself burst out like a drowning person from the water, gasping for air. Margaret, are you all right? Yes, I'm... I... But it wasn't me, she said, aware of the tears flowing down her cheeks. It isn't me who can't have babies. Bill can't. It's Bill. It's something to do with his sperm count. Dr. Sims gave Maggie a little time to dry her eyes, 
calm down and compose herself. When she had done so, Maggie laughed at herself. He used to have to masturbate into a Tupperware container and take it in for testing. Somehow that seemed so, well, Tupperware. I mean, it all seemed so leave it to the beaver. Pardon? An old American TV program. Mom at home, Pop at the office, apple pie, happy families, perfect children. I see. Couldn't you have adopted a child? Maggie was back out in the light now. Only it felt too bright. No, she said. That wouldn't do for Bill. The child wouldn't be his then, you see. No more than if I'd had someone else's sperm in artificial insemination. Did the two of you discuss what to do? At first, yes. But not after he found out it was his physical problem and not mine. After that, if I ever mentioned children again, he hit me. And around this time he came to resent your success. Yes, even to the point of committing little acts of sabotage. So I'd be behind on a deadline, you know, throwing away some of my colors or brushes, misplacing an illustration or a package for the courier, accidentally wiping images from the computer, from my computer, forgetting to tell me about an important phone call, that sort of thing. So at this time, he wanted to have children, but discovered that he couldn't father any, and he also wanted to be a partner in his law firm, but he didn't get to be? That's right, but that's no excuse for what he did to me. Dr. Sims smiled. True, Margaret, very true. But it's a pretty volatile combination, don't you think? I'm not making excuses. But can you imagine the stress he must have been under? How it might have triggered his violent feelings? I couldn't see it coming at the time. How could I? No, you couldn't. No one could expect you to. It's as you said. Hindsight. Retrospect. She leaned back in her chair, crossed her legs and looked at the clock. Now I think that's enough for today, don't you? Now is the time. I've got a question, Maggie blurted out. Not about me. Dr. Sims raised her eyebrows and looked at her watch. It won't take a minute, honest it won't. All right, said Dr. Sims, ask away. Well, it's this friend of mine. Not really a friend, I suppose, because she's too young, just a schoolgirl. But she drops by, you know, on her way home from school. Yes. Claire's her name. Claire Toth. Claire was a friend of Kimberly Myers. I know who Kimberly Myers was. I read the newspapers. Go on. They were friends. They went to the same school. Both of them knew Terence Payne. He was their biology teacher. Yes, go on. And she felt responsible, you know, for Kimberly. They were supposed to walk home together that night, but a Boy asked Claire to dance, a boy she liked, and and her friend walked home alone to her death. Yes, said Maggie. You said you had a question to ask me. I haven't seen Claire since she told me this on Monday afternoon. I'm worried about her. Psychologically, I mean. What would something like this do to someone like her? Not knowing the girl in question, I can't possibly say said Dr. Sims. It depends on her inner resources, on her self-image, on family support, on many things. Besides, it seems to me that there are two separate issues here. Yes. First, the girl's proximity to the criminal, and to one victim in particular, and second, her feeling of responsibility, of guilt. As far as the first is concerned, I can offer a few general considerations. Please do. First of all, tell me how you feel about it all. Me? Yes. I... I don't know yet. Afraid, I suppose. Not so trusting. He was my neighbor, after all. I don't know. I haven't been able to work it all out yet. Dr. Sims nodded. Your friend probably feels the same way. Mostly confused for the moment. Only she's younger than you, and she'll probably have fewer defences. 
she'll certainly be more mistrustful of people. After all, this man was her teacher, a figure of respect and authority, handsome, well-dressed, with a nice house and a pretty young wife. He didn't look at all like the sort of monster we usually associate in our minds with crimes such as these. And she'll experience a heightened sense of paranoia. She may not feel comfortable going out alone, for example, may feel she's been stalked or watched, or her parents might not let her go out. Sometimes parents take control in these situations, especially if they feel they've been guilty of any sort of neglect. So her parents might be keeping her at home, keeping her from visiting me. It's possible. What else? From what I can gather so far, these are sex crimes, and as such they are bound to have some effect on a vulnerable young schoolgirl's burgeoning sexuality. Exactly what effect is hard to say. It takes different people different ways. Some girls might become more childlike, suppress their sexuality, because they think that will afford them some kind of protection. Others may even become more promiscuous, because being good girls didn't help the victims. I can't tell you which way she'll go. I'm sure Claire wouldn't become promiscuous. She may become withdrawn and preoccupied with the case. I think it's most important that she doesn't keep these feelings bottled up, that she struggles to understand what happened. I know that's difficult, even for us adults, but we can help her. How? By accepting its effect on her, but also reassuring her that it was some sort of aberration, not the natural course of things. There's little doubt the effects will be deep and long-lasting, but she will have to learn how to readjust to the way her world view has altered. What do you mean? We're always saying that teenagers feel immortal, that any immortality your friend felt she had will have been stripped away by what's happened. That's a hard adjustment to make that what happened to someone close to you could happen to you too, and the full horror of it hasn't even come out yet. What can I do? Probably nothing, said Dr. Sims. You can't make her come to you, but if she does, you should encourage her to talk. Be a good listener, but don't push her, and don't try to tell her how to feel. Should she be seeing a psychologist? Probably. But that's her decision. Or her parents. Could you recommend someone? I mean, if they're interested. Dr. Sims wrote a name on a slip of paper. She's good, she said. Now off you go. I've got my next patient waiting. They arranged another appointment and Maggie walked out into Park Square, thinking about Claire and Kimberly and human monsters. That numb sensation had come back the feeling that the world was at a distance, through mirrors and filters, cotton wool, through the wrong end of the telescope. She felt like an alien in human form. She wanted to go back to where she came from, but she didn't know where it was any more. She walked down to City Square, past the statue of the Black Prince and the nymphs bearing their torches. Then she leaned against the wall near the bus stop on Boer Lane and lit a cigarette. The elderly woman beside her gave her a curious look. Why was it, Maggie wondered, that she always felt worse after these sessions with Dr. Sims than she did before she went? The bus arrived. Maggie trod out her cigarette and got on.